like to call to order this June 23rd, 2020 Board of County Commissioners meeting. Will the clerk please call the roll? Commissioner Berger? Here. Commissioner Bernard? Here. Mayor Kerner? Here. Commissioner McKinley? Here. Commissioner Valache? Here. Vice Mayor Weinroth? Here. Commissioner Weiss? Here. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We'll move now to agenda item 1B, invocation, which will be led by Commissioner Weiss, along with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. Dear God, we seek your help with our affairs today. Bless us this meeting with your divine intelligence and help us to make the best use of our own. We are of diverse opinion here, yet we wish, wish to reach agreement satisfactory for all. Please share a little of your wisdom with us to help us do right by all concerned. Thank you for your heavenly blessing. Amen. Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Very good. Thank you. I'm glad we have a lot of robust participation in our local government today. I'd like to remind the members of the audience and of the public that the county has an order about wearing face masks unless you need an accommodation. Also, we ask that you please do not sit in seats that have the red sign on them so that we can, we can appropriately social distance. Uh, further, as we get into public comment on some of the decisions the board is going to make, I ask that you abide by the time restriction so that everybody has an opportunity to be heard. We'll move now to agenda item two, agenda approval to A, additions, deletions, and substitutions. Madam County Administrator, are there any additions, deletions, or substitutions? Mayor, we are adding on uh, 3A2 uh, for discussion, and that's regarding the mandatory facial uh, coverings. Your direction came uh, last Tuesday after we had already printed the agenda, so that's the only reason it's an add-on. Very good. Is there any way, based upon the substance of that matter, that it can be combined with 3A1? Yes. Very good. Is there a motion to combine 3A2? No. So moved. No. No. We, we have need to, to amend be two it. different Ma agenda items. I'm going to give this one warning, and then we're going to unfortunately have to um, go into recess or remove people from the chamber. We have important public business. We didn't do business. that last week. Ma'am, I don't know who's speaking because there's a lot of people in this room, but please do not interrupt these proceedings. Very good. Mr. There, Mayor, I move approval of the, adopt, or the revised agenda. Motion by Commissioner McKinley. Second by Commissioner Berger to combine 3A2 and 3A1. They just combined both of the topics together. Are you kidding me? Yeah, that's ridiculous. Item passes 7 0. Yeah, that's what they just did. Item 3, which is the regular agenda. We'll start with 3A1, Administration. Dr. Alonzo, if you're available, please come forward. I'd like to remind you that if you'd like to speak in public comment on 3-1, please submit a comment card to a member of the county staff prior to Dr. Alonzo starting her presentation. I am so sorry I was talking to the delegation. They wouldn't stop asking questions. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mayor, Commissioners. Good morning. Hi. Ms. Baker, good morning. How are you? All right. I'm going to start with my presentation. I'm giving some high level um, slides just to uh, get this going and um, then be able to have questions. And I know you have a lot of. Uh, information you want to cover today. So I just want to uh, show the difference since our last update on 616 when we came. There's been an additional 100 and 117,981 cases and 3,971 more deaths since we had our last conversation. Um, I just want to mention that these are people, not just numbers. 
That's 393,971 family members, fathers, mothers, grandmothers. So we've got to keep that in mind when we're talking about these numbers. Remember, we're talking about people, not just statistics. Um, this is our graph. Uh, this is from John Hopkins that does the epi curve for all the states in the United States. And we see that Florida has experienced a large, sharp incre increase in the number of cases from 67 um, to 612. Um, we've had a peak of 4,700 new cases. And on, um, that was the highest peak, that one that you see up on the top was on 620. Um, we're down now on 621, it came down to 2.8,000. So we don't want to keep this peak going up. We need to start taking action in order to bring this curve back down. Um, and all our indicators indicate a rising in the numbers. So let's take a look at those. Um, we have, of course, the uh, total cases in Florida that have now reached over 100,000. Um, so who's becoming positive and why? So we're seeing this burden of positive cases on the younger population. So in other words, the seniors and those at, at higher risk are remaining indoors and not getting exposed. However, the younger um, and the more active and less cautious are going out and getting infected at these alarming numbers. Um, unlike um, many who believe that the young do not suffer anything or any consequences, we have had individuals in those categories being hospitalized, filling ICU beds, and even dying. So we got to keep that in mind that this disease, is, we're still um, having to learn about it. We still have to um, keep in mind that we don't know everything there is, and even people who are very healthy have ended up in the ICU and succumbed to death. Um, our numbers here in Palm Beach County, we hit the 10,000 number. Um, we have now 10,943 cases with 468 deaths. Broward, who was testing and has a lot more population than us, is only at 11,327. So because our numbers are going up much rapidly, um, we're likely to suppress them in the, uh, in the near future. Um, we see our age distribution. I put the numbers there so you could actually see the numbers that we have in each one of those. Um, and so that's where we see that the move in the age positivity is the physical distancing being observed by those who are in the elderly numbers and the, to the right of the curve. And uh, those that are getting more infected now are on the left of the curve um, and having the problems that we're going to have to look into. Um, this is our positivity for Palm Beach County. Um, I'm comparing that with that of Florida. So you can see that we reached our peak. Um, we started going down, we opened, and then it has risen very, very rapidly. I am hopeful by showing our cases this way that we are at the point now where we can intervene. Um, we can put enforcement in in order to follow the governor's orders that have been given and making sure businesses are doing what they're supposed to be doing uh, along with the governor's orders so that we don't see this peak continue to rise and more lives lost. Um, I think that we are at a point here in Palm Beach County that people have taken our orders seriously um, and that includes the use of the facial covers as well as the distancing and our businesses need to comply by those rules if they're going to keep us safe. Um, our positivity rate for um, Palm Beach County, uh, where our numbers are going in the wrong direction. That's the positivity there that you see um, for F Florida. Let me go over to Palm Beach County, um, where you see that our rate, our positivity for the total be people being tested now is 8.8. .8. It continues to go up. And the one to, all the way to the right, uh, upper right-hand corner is now above the threshold. We were at one point, we were at 4.9, we're now at 10.75%, which means that we are above where we're supposed to be in terms of the recommendation. So we have got to get these numbers down and everybody has to work together in this. Uh, no one can do this together by themselves. 
Uh, Broward also has a higher positivity in terms of 6.8%. It's also increasing, as well as their lab positivity, which is at 8.57. Dade is even worse. They're at 10% for their total positivity and 115 for their labs. All those numbers were in the um, right areas. This comparison is just to see where we were before the opening and after the opening. Um, I know you can't see that too well, but obviously the, the curves are going up instead of down, and we need to act now in order to have that come down again. Um, these are some of our um, hospitalizations that we're continuing to follow. As you see, the number of positive COVID cases in the ICU have gone up, and so have the total um, COVID admissions in the hospital have gone up. The death rate continues to go down. That's a very, very good sign, but we have to be cautious because this may be a lag factor. Um, <laughs> this is probably the most important point of all, and this has to do with the governor's orders. In the plan for the reopening and for continuing, the most important pieces are that these three metrics. And what you're seeing here is that we are definitely not downward in the uh, influenza-like illnesses. We're not down in the COVID-like illnesses. We're not down in the trajectory for um, new cases of COVID. And we're not down in the trajectory of the positivity. Um, what we are good is in the last one, is the capability uh, to treat all patients um, without the surge capacity at the hospital. We're, we're good there right now. Um, I think we need to be cautious because that can occur quickly if the, um, con these numbers continue to go up. And we are good in terms of testing. We've done a phenomenal job here in Palm Beach County of testing. Um, we have over 66 uh, areas where people can get tested, both private and government. Um, so I'm not going to read through these. Uh, these are obvious. These are the same things I said before. I think enforcement and education is the most important thing. Um, and of course, uh, the wearing of our masks is going to be very important as we go forward. That's it. Thank you very much. Very good. <clears throat> Do I have any inquiries from members of the board? Commissioner Weiss, you recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Dr. Alonzo. What is the, um, typically what's been the lag time between the, the uh, with the deaths? I mean, I, I recall uh, a few weeks ago that we were talking about four to six weeks. Is, is that still the case before you start to? For the actual death rate, I'd say it's more like um, six to eight weeks. Um, so we do look like we're hanging on. I know that the amount of the antiviral that's been used in the ICU for the COVID patients that uh, has worked on some of these patients has gone up dramatically. We're, we're giving that out to the hospitals um, um, in quite large amounts. So I know they're treating the people in there with the uh, antiviral. So um, hopefully that will keep those deaths down. And that will be a very good thing. And then um, I was watching the news this morning, and they had a physician, I guess, who runs the. And I don't want they they have a COVID ward at Jackson Memorial, and he was saying that they had they were down to about eight cases in their in that facility, and now they've gotten four, they're now up to forty. Sure. And are we able to get that same kind of information here? The, the number of cases that we have in the ICU, yes. Right, and I, I guess, and they, they have a separate, a, a separate ward for them um, at, at Jackson. I don't know if right. what the rest No, we, we don't have a separate. We put them in the ICU. Okay. And if we need to make room, then we put the less severe ones outside of the ICU in isolation, and then the ones that need the one-on-one -on -one are in the ICU. And then I think uh, there had been discussion last week, we were talking about some of the hot spots and, and concern, you know, that this was very localized. Is, is that still the case in the county? 
I don't see it localized at all. I see it this spreading rapidly throughout southeast Florida, the west south part of Florida, and then up through Tampa, the um, I-4 corridor going all the way across over to the beach. And um, places that were not having cases are now having cases. This has spread nationally. This isn't just here in Palm Beach County. All right. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Commissioner Weiss. Vice Mayor Weinroth, you recognized. Thank you. Um, first, I wanted to say there was a charming picture of me and you last week, and I'd like to thank my friends at the Palm Beach Post for it, <laughs> Hannah. And uh, I hope that's not what I look like when you and I are having our conversations. Take a picture now. Go ahead. I, yeah, I was, I was both smiling. Um, last week when we were talking about this, um, we had spoken about masks. and. My impression was that you were less than enthusiastic about the idea of mandatory masks after looking at the, the situation in Miami-Dade, in Broward, where they had implemented masks ahead of us, and with some concern about whether it was really going to be effective. Is that still your thoughts? Or, you know, a lot has happened since last time we met. These numbers obviously have really gone through the roof. So wh what's your thought about well, that? Well, let me clear that. Um, I am a big advocate of the facial coverings for maintaining and containing the spread of COVID. We understand that in the beginning there was an issue between not wearing masks, we're wearing masks. But the information now is that the facial coverings in public help stop the spread of the virus. Please, please do not interrupt these proceedings. My next option is, is to recess and then clear the chamber, and then we'll have to allow only people in that are going to comply with the law that allows these proceedings to, to move forward so that public decisions can be made on behalf of this county. So that is definitely my position. So I highly recommend that we go forward with the wearing of the mask as mandatory. People, when we tell people that something is mandatory, it sends two messages. One, that we believe it's important, and two, that then they have more incentive to wear it. I believe people have felt now that we're actually in phase two in Florida and that everything is opened up and everything is fine. For some reason, we've given that impression to folks who are confused and don't realize we're still in phase one. And the governor recognized that Palm Beach County, Broward, and Dade were much more at higher risk and our numbers were not in line with reopening to level to the phase two. And the governor's, um, that's why I put that up there, that the governor's plan for going forward, you have to see all the numbers going down before you go forward. So I think that the minimal that we can do now is uh, implement enforcement and making sure that those rules are being followed by all and that the facial coverings are utilized by as many people as possible. Obviously, people who have conditions or um, any, um, inability to wear the mask for medical reasons, of course, are excused from that. But that is definitely my position. Let me ask you another question. My, my own fear is that we tell people to wear a mask and they're going to give up on social distancing. They're going to feel that they now have protection, that they can now, you know, abandon this issue of staying six feet apart and, and worrying that and saying, well, I have the mask or they have the mask and we can abandon that. Are, are we looking at abandoning the six feet separation if we mask? Is masking a, a counterbalance to the fact that people don't seem to be social distancing? I mean, you and I need to teach them to do both. So um, we especially need the facial coverings if a person cannot. For example, when you're sitting in your office, in your chair in the office, you can certainly take your mask off. Obviously, we can't talk very well with these things on. Um, and so 
when you're sitting by yourself isolated from other people, not wearing the mask is perfectly fine. When you get up and you're going to go down the hallways and you're going to cross people, that's the important part. So I wear my mask to protect you, you wear your mask to protect me. That's how it works. We're all in this together and we need to protect one another from the virus, not from each other. We're not the enemy. The people are not the problem. It's the virus. Just to reconfirm, are, are we in danger of being over capacity as far as our ICUs and hospitals at this point? Today, no. Are but we, we need to be careful because those numbers are going up. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. You're welcome. Very good. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Commissioner McKinley, you're recognized. Yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Alonzo, I was on, I'm on the Board of Trustees for Palms West Hospital and was on our trustees call last week. And uh, interesting, Palms West and JFK South, out of the entire HCA healthcare system in the United States have the highest COVID patient counts. Uh, and I think a, a lot of what's going on in Palms West is overflow as well. Um, commit, uh, Councilman Michael Napleone in Wellington asked me to ask you this morning about reinfection. And the possibility, just because you've tested positive or you've had this virus, um, it is, it, what's the story behind being able to get reinfected? Do we know, do we, do we have any information about that? Um, there's lots of studies trying to uh, determine that for sure. The one thing that I'm very sure is that nothing is sure about this virus. It's still new, it's still being studied. Um, it's not acting like other viruses in some ways. For example, the multi-system um, inflammatory ocean that it has. Um, and so at this time, that is not for sure. So even if you are positive you sh and you've been positive, you shouldn't go around thinking, oh, I'm Superman now, nothing can happen to me. I think we still need to be very cautious, even if you've been positive. And then the uh, ICU data, the way that the governor's office has decided to reclassify that data, um, I don't want to ask you how you feel about that since you work for the governor and the state agency, but do you, do you see that having an impact on how we treat this virus? I don't think it's going to change how we treat it. I think what he was trying to do was to get a better picture of the, the severity or the intensity of the cases in the ICU. It's very different to have six beds full of um, post-surgical patients that are going to be only there for one day and then go back to the floor the next day versus having COVID patients that need a one-to-one -one ratio. So I think the attempt is to trying to get a better glimpse, uh, uh, another measurement, not take away from the measure, but another measurement of what is the severity in the ICUs across our state in turn, and, and therefore be able to plan ahead, which the hospitals do anyway. The hospitals, and especially here in Palm Beach County, they're fantastic. We all stay in touch with one another. They report into the uh, Emergency Operations Center every single day, and they know that we're there to help them. So they're, they're keeping very good track and giving us very good information. We look at that every single day to see how they're doing. Um, some hospitals are already dusted, of, uh, dusted off their surge capacity plans. They have to be ready. They understand that it looks like it's coming this way. And so just like everything that we do in emergency, we always plan for the worst and hope for the best. Let's hope that the death rates stay down and that these patients will be able to leave the ICU on their own um, two feet and that we don't see a surge in deaths. Sure, and hospitals have also had to dust off their triage plan, uh, which means those triage plans are having to decide who gets an ICU bed and who gets the, a ventilator in the uh, chance that we do see that kind of a surge, which is frightening. The question on the, um, I sadly uh, welcome Commissioner Weiss and Mayor Kerner to the Red Hotspot Club uh, that we've been seeing out in the glades, but I was looking at the numbers last night on the Florida Department of Health website and, and the numbers in that part of the county and that Lake Worth corridor have absolutely skyrocketed. Your, your explanation for that? Yes, uh, again, it's, uh, it's not the people that's the problem. <laughs> I, I, I don't like 
hearing talking about certain people are the problem, the, the virus is the problem. Um, the, it's pretty simple. It's the fact that in that corridor, we have very high density living quarters. So the folks living there along that whole corridor are living in very close proximity to each other and with each other. So one person gets infected and the entire household gets infected, their neighbors get infected. Um, it spreads very quickly. Uh, their activities are um, you know, between birthday parties and barbecues and everything else. They're spreading it to a lot of people all at one time. So there's where we have to, well, we have to do education everywhere, but we have to really go in and do a deep community advocacy so that these, um, everyone in that community can understand, multiple communities need to understand how to stay safe and stop the spread of the virus. Can you remind us again how we do that? Um, very easy, actually. <laughs> uh, at least six feet apart. Uh, wearing facial coverings when you're out in public or you're out anywhere where you can't maintain that physical distancing particularly. Washing your hands frequently, using your hand sanitizer when you cannot wash your hands. And of course, um, making sure that you take care of yourself, stay healthy, um, do things that are good for you, don't stress yourself, and um, just staying aware of your surrounding and where you're at so that you can maintain that at all times. Okay, one last question for you, Dr. Alonzo. You know, I saw newspaper articles yesterday about uh, Representative Sabatini filing lawsuits against local governments. Final warning, please do not interrupt these proceedings, otherwise we will recess and we will not be able to watch in live. You'll have to watch outside the, the proceedings. Um, I will promise you that your uh, input on this important public issue is very important to the Board of County Commissioners and part of being a democracy is the lawful and order that we have here in the Commission Chambers so that we can make these proper decisions on your behalf. I would hate for you not to be able to give public comment at this time on this important public issue, so please, in the interest of democracy and maturity, please limit your comments to when public comment is opened. Thank you. I noticed um, standing along uh, up there with him at the podium at some of his press conferences, there are people holding signs, my body, my choice, which the un irony is not lost on me based on some of the votes that Representative Sabatini has taken in the legislature. Um, your thought on that whole, my body, my choice, I mean, can you give me examples of laws that we have existing in Florida already that dictate the wearing of certain devices or other Certainly. health care mandates and your opinion on that? Yeah. Um, public health laws are to protect the public, so when emergencies like this occur, um, public health laws are definitely on the table and have been for a very, very long time. So um, no one's trying to hurt anybody and everybody has their individual rights. Nobody believes in individual rights more than I. However, this is about the public. This is, this is what you're doing to other people and what you're not doing to other people. So like I said, I wear my mask to protect you, you wear your mask to protect me. So that's um, the whole intent behind this. Um, and I believe that there's no room here for politics. There's only room to fight. The only enemy that we have here is the virus, not each other. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner McKinley. Commissioner Valachie, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I know it's um, not wise to put too much import into one day's data, but I just did want the public and the members of the public who are here today to share, um, I wanted to be able to share some statistics that we got that I think are important. Um, yesterday, as of the end of the day, our ICU bed utilization was 74.1%, which is comfortable, I think. I think we've got significant capacity available. We tested, the test results that came back were from a test of 2,781 people, which is a fairly robust number of people to be tested. And the positivity rate among those 2,781 people was 6.1%. So it's not a trend, but on the other hand, it's not running away, you know, um, 
in in the other direction either. I mean, there's noise and it goes up and it goes down. But I, I think if we were facing a real crisis, I think we would see the numbers continually increasing. And I think that 6.1, I follow these numbers pretty clo closely every day that we see them. I have not seen a positivity rate that low throughout this whole episode. So, um, you know, I think we need to remain vigilant, as you said, but um, I think the situation's under control. I don't want the public to get the impression that we are in a crisis uh, right now. Very good. Thank you, Commissioner Valachay. We'll return now to Commissioner Weiss. Thank you. A um, couple things. One is, I understand there's a, a plan to be moving COVID patients out of Palm Beach County. Is that is there such a plan to do that? Um, when nursing homes or long-term facilities um, reach capacity or the conditions of the patients are such that they can no longer take care of them, they're being removed and taken to other facilities that can handle that type of um, severity that they have at that time. Um, there is a place in Fort Lauderdale that has accepted um, to be the location where patients would be transferred. Also for people who are in the um, hospital awaiting transfer back to a facility, a long-term facility, um, and the hospital is ready to discharge them, but they're waiting for their test results to come back negative before they can go back. Um, the thought is that they can also be um, taken to this facility in Fort Lauderdale to alleviate the hospitals because of the importance of the capacity right now at the hospital. So that would alleviate the capacity at a specific hospital and allow them to send those people. There's about 200 people right now uh, waiting to go back to facilities. So, so I just want to make sure I understand so that we're going to create, we're going to, we're, this is to create additional capacity within our hospitals. We're going to be sending our elderly COVID patients to a facility in Fort Lauderdale so that we have additional capacity available. That, that Correct, because the hospitals are concerned that they're tying up beds with those people. Okay. Um, I was, I received a couple of videos over the weekend of uh, some of the, some businesses here in West Palm Beach. I'd like, I think they're, can you show them? Um, I'd like you to look at them and see and get your impression of how well we're doing uh, with our social distancing and our uh, understanding of, of our requirements. There's one more here tonight. That's, that's in Orange County. Up in Orlando. And then I think there's one other video from West Palm Beach. How well are our businesses responding? Is that not racist? Yes. Um, That's the minority the, groups that you just showed. The, it's the obvious, right? I mean, people are right next to each other. Wearing a mask below your nose is kind of like putting the condom in the wrong place. Um, so it's, it's obvious that people want to have a good time and those are the individuals that are going to get the virus. So our businesses need to help the community to avoid that. One of the reasons that um, nightclubs and um, bars have not been open is because that is what happens at a bar. That's what I do at a bar. Uh, the music's not bad. Lighting is good. Um, so, of course, and it, it's very hard, especially after you have a few drinks to 
you come in with the mask and you end up lowering it because you're, you know, you're, you're feeling good. So those are all situations that are not good for the community at this time. Okay. And, and just to note, our bars are not, bars are not supposed to be open yet in Palm Beach County. Correct. So, okay. Thank Very you. good. We'll go back now to Commissioner McKinley. You recognize me. Yes, thank you. I had one more question, but uh, Commissioner Weiss, showing those videos, those are right near the University of Central Florida campus and, and not far from my daughter's dorm, so seeing those videos makes me very grateful that she's home with me this summer. Uh, Dr. Alonzo, and I don't know if you're the correct person to answer this question, somebody else on the staff might be. Um, I understand that the drive-through component of the testing site in Belle Glade has been closed. Um, can you explain the somebody explain to me the reason behind doing that when we're still seeing spikes the volume actually the the numbers in Belle Glade have gone down quite a bit um, so and, and those numbers are those seeking testing or the positivity numbers both the number of tests that are coming out positive each day has gone down and the volume that there's been almost no volume um, through the drive-through uh, there are many, many people that are testing out uh, in Pahokee, um, the FQHC there, uh, Florida Community um, Health Center is testing. Um, we're sending testing out to specific areas. Um, we've sent fire rescue over to the loading dock where we got a lot of people being tested there that had not been tested. So we're going to continue doing testing and the, the walk up is still available um, at Lakeside. So, we want to keep testing folks that need to be tested or want to be tested, but the drive-through itself is just, you know, not, it's the volume would just go way down to keep all those National Guards and everybody else there in place didn't make sense. So the optimistic way of looking at that is you're bringing the testing to the neighborhoods. Exactly, which is more convenient for the neighborhoods and uh, more effective because we can do more one-on-one -on -one education with those folks. So I think that's a good thing all the way around. Okay, and I'd like to thank um, and my partner in that, uh, Bell Glade Mayor Steve Wilson, who's quietly sitting in the audience today. Uh, but want to thank him for all of his efforts that they're doing out there to get the word out about testing and following the, the guidelines. Thanks. Sure. Very good. I don't see any other inquiries from members of the board. I had one question, Doctor. Has the uh, Surgeon General of the State of Florida opined on the efficacy of mask wearing or otherwise given direction through a public health notice? Yes, he recommended the use of the fast, um, mask co um, facial coverings for everyone. He made the exception for those people who have um, respiratory diseases uh, under two years old and several other things that were in there. So. Um, that was a very good recommendation to see that we're all on board with this and that we all agree that the facial coverings do save lives. And what about the Florida Medical Association? Are you aware of any opinion that they've put forward on wearing masks? I'm sorry, I haven't kept up with them. <laughs> what about from the CDC or federal government uh, guidelines? Definitely, they have recommended them all along. Very good. We're here today as um, added to this agenda is consideration by this board to give direction to our county administrator on a mandatory mask policy. County administrator, are there any other presentations or nuances or discussions of potential direction that you'd like to give prior to getting a public comment? Just direction from this board on moving forward with mandatory mask. We do and will follow the executive orders along with CDC guidelines specifically addressing uh, people with medical needs, uh, kids that are two years and younger, they will be exempt. Uh, we are looking at especially indoor facilities such as restaurants, uh, retail stores, grocery stores, gyms, pharmacies, indoor recreational uh, vehicle for hires. Those are specific places that we're going to be addressing. But we'll also address some public places where CDC guidelines cannot be adhered to that facial coverings should be utilized in those particular areas. Um, we are not only talking public places uh, and public owned, you know, parks, et cetera, but it'll also be common areas uh, and parks within the private 
uh, uh, communities as well. We'll remain, Palm Tran uh, mandatory facial coverings will still be in effect. Uh, we're talking county as well as municipal governmental facilities. So if you're going into any of those facilities, you will be required to uh, wear a mask, uh, facial coverings. We'll also uh, talk to you a little bit about exemptions. There are a number of exemptions that are either required by the state for whatever reasons. We'll make those accommodations uh, in, in laying out uh, a, an order for you. And we'll also focus on businesses and making sure that they're informing the public of what's required of them so that anybody going into a restaurant would know what's being required of that business. So we will be attaching all of that. I will share uh, that executive order uh, with the board. Very good. With regard to the last public meeting that we held, there was direction from this board to evaluate both Broward and Miami-Dade County's order on mandatory masks. Uh, the parameters that you just discussed um, for a potential ordinance here or executive order in this county, do, does it mirror those in Broward and Miami-Dade? It does take not only Miami-Dade, Broward, we looked at Monroe County as well, uh, and we looked at a number of others. So we took parts of them and put into what's unique about Palm Beach County because Everything that works in Miami-Dade does not necessarily work in Palm Beach County, but we took the, the most of uh, their order and definitely applied it here, Very along good. with Broward. Just for the benefit of the public and the board, if the board were to give direction after public comment on a mandatory mask policy in this county, and we were directed you to bring that order back, would that order be self-executing and you would just bring back the final version? In other words, when would be the effective date? If you give me direction today, I believe I will have an order ready no later than tomorrow. Uh, we can make that effective. I will make sure that you have a copy. We normally do not bring executive orders back to this board in many. We normally, you give me direction, I write it up, we get it executed, we put it on our website, uh, and we also share it with our municipal folks. We will also share it with the business community. It will be on our website. And those powers are delegated to you through the Comprehensive Emergency Management Plan? That is correct. And finally, um, should this board move forward on giving direction for mandatory mask policy, since you said that it would not come back to us, today would be the day to give the direction on the nuances and boundaries of that order? That is correct. I, I do want to point out that this board did direct me to speak with um, the sheriff along with Miami-Dade and Broward regarding uh, in the enforcement of facial coverings. The sheriff stated that if it became law, he would enforce the law. Our goal is not to uh, arrest citizens. It's not to necessarily find citizens. It is to encourage citizens and help them uh, help us, protect all of us, and to keep our county moving forward, uh, to keep our businesses open, to keep our recreational activities going forward. So it is just a matter of educating, putting the information out, and knowing that we're protecting each other. And so if it's absolutely necessary, then enforcement will be done. But our overall goal is to, to educate and bring people and businesses especially into compliance. Very good. Uh, finally, uh, uh, to the best of your knowledge, what has been the perspective or actions taken by Broward and Miami-Dade on enforcement of their policy? Most recently, uh, Miami-Dade on the 19th passed an ordinance where if they found a business out of compliance, they closed that business for 24 hours. And then they also have to attest that they've read the EO regarding how they are to operate under the executive orders and attest to it and submit that attestation. Once they do that, the business can open up again. If it continues to occur, then more severe actions are being taken. And Broward is anticipated to pass such an EO in the next couple of days. The substance of that EO is not being deliberated by this board today, though, with regard to shutting businesses down for 24 hours. Not unless this board gives me the direction okay. uh, to do so, but I have to say to the board, our goal is to educate the businesses, but if they're not listening, such as the bars that are open at this time, we are in full phase one, we are not in phase two, bars are not allowed to be open. Um, inter uh, adult entertainment is not allowed to be open, but they are open. 
and we've got to take some actions. One of their assistant managers in one of the adult entertainment, he died of COVID just recently. And then their employees tested positive. So they're intermingling with others. And so we've got to take the appropriate steps in order to protect the public and to continue to allow our residents to work and to continue to move forward by flattening the curve, reducing the number of people uh, coming up on positive on a daily rate so that we can open more businesses. But we cannot, in good conscience, continue to open businesses if we're not flattening the curve, if we're not reducing the impact. Very good. Um, also, we're, we're now aware that the COVID Education and Compliance team um, will begin taking action in this county starting today. I believe they met on Friday prior to the press conference, and they'll be there to assist the businesses of this community in complying with the governor's order and any county orders that come down. All right, without any further inquiries from members of the board, Commissioner Weiss, I apologize. Your light is on. Uh, for purposes of, of this proceeding, would it, be a, would it be more appropriate to have a motion on the, on the floor? Or no, we should wait. Um, I'm, I'm open to, I think a motion's in order. Certainly it gives the, the public an opportunity to comment on the specific motion itself. Um, but it's at, at your discretion or any member of this board's discretion to put a motion forward now. Okay, so I, I'd like to go ahead and, and move forward. Uh, motion to uh, implement uh, the emergency order as described by um, our administrator for mandatory masking and enforcement in this county. Very second. Good. Motion's, second. Motion's been made by Commissioner Weiss, seconded by second. Commissioner Bernard. Um, we will have further opportunity to comment on the nuances. Uh, should that uh, motion pass, we can comment on the boundaries of that order further after public comment. Uh, Commissioner Valachet, you recognize, then we'll go back to Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Mayor. Um, just in terms of this order, I'd like to see this be different from a lot of the other orders, which were uh, not sunsetting. Um, I, I think, in my view, um, we want to see if this moves the needle, and I think giving it a 30-day term would uh, be sufficient for those purposes so that we could come back after 30 days, see what the results of this have been and either renew it or not. But, um, you know, the open-endedness of some of our executive orders, especially, you know, we had, I think, some difficulty in modifying some of those orders uh, because we weren't in session. So um, I, I would support this with the um, provision that it sunsetted after 30 days. Mr. Weiss, do you have any objection to restating your motion to adopt that um, boundary? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer that till after I have public comment. Okay. If you don't mind. Um, well, we'll have an opportunity to make any um, amended uh, motions or substitute motions after public comment. With that said, we would like to hear what the public has to say on this important uh, public policy issue. I want to remind the members of the public that we truly are um, interested in what you have to say, but under section 5D, I'll remind that there is a civility clause within our code that allows the chair of the county commission to um, eject any person and then thereby trespass them from this property on a second warning if, uh, if there's a deliberate intent to disrupt the proceedings of the board of county commissioners. Further under section, subsection G allotted time, the chair has the discretion uh, when there is when there are over 20 people wishing to indicate there's to speak in public comment, um, we can cur cur curtail the amount of time. How many people do we have presently, Commissioner Bernard? We have over 55 comment cards, Mr. Mayor. I'll be using my, my discretion, unless overruled by the board, to limit public comment to two minutes, and each person that, that has submitted a card thus far will be permitted to speak. With that said, I'll ask the Vice Mayor to put two minutes on the clock. Commissioner McKinley, you recognize. Yes, thank you. Um, Ms. Baker, before we get to deep into this debate here. Uh, I have one request and one question. My request would be the next time that we have an update to the board on the virus, that we hear an update from our fire chief on the operations of our first responders and, and what they're seeing and how they're handling it. And my question, um, if there's no objection to that, uh, my question would be in, in the proposed language that you're looking at, 
uh, a violation of this order should it pass. Are we looking at a criminal infraction or are we looking at a civil citation? We will write it where and work with law enforcement, but it can be a civil citation and or up to, uh, depending upon the egregiousness of it. Uh, I've learned throughout this process that we also need to leave the sheriff some flexibility in case there, there's some other things going on. And so I will work with law enforcement on the actual language, but our intent is not to even give out civil fines but it is to ensure that people understand this is a serious virus that we're dealing with. It's impacting health and the economy. And so we want to do the least um, um, enforcement as possible, but we also don't want to tie law enforcement hands in case there is some other issue that they need to address. So I will work with the law enforcement on, on that particular language. Thank you. So long as a civil citation is an option, I would Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Very good. For the efficiency of the meeting, we're going to ask that as the speakers are called that we utilize both microphones and I can assure members of the public that the microphones are sanitized after each use. Commissioner Bernard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We do have a lot of comment cards. So I, we did receive, uh, these are four wearing of mask and these are the the comment cards for or against. So, and then we've received two non speaking cards. So, we'd like, if you don't mind, if we can receive and file those. Please, without objection. And were those uh, communications from the public distributed to the board or sent to one particular email address? Do you know? They were sent to the public comment. Okay, very good. So, has every commissioner had an opportunity to review the correspondence from the public? We'll receive and file without objection. And then, if you want to. Um, recognize the two non-speaking. If there were any comments on that card, feel free to read them now. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have um, Tiffany Roberto, and she says, herd immunity, exposure, vaccination, my body, my decision, my right. This is being promoted with abortion, which kills 100 of thousands of babies per year. So she opposes okay. that. And then um, Gisela Garnian, which do not wish to speak, she says, no, stup no to stupid mask. Understood. Very good. We'll receive and follow those without objection, and we'll now get into public comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, the first person that we're going to call will be Angelique Contreras. Next person will be Irv Slosberg, Representative Irv Slosberg. I think he. Oh. After Representative Irv Slosberg, it's gonna we're gonna have Rick Rose. Rick Rose, we'll have uh, Mr. Rose to this microphone if you don't mind, and then Representative Slosberg to this microphone, sir. You recognize for two minutes. Uh, thank you, Mayor Kerner, and uh, thank you, uh, Commissioners and staff for doing such a fine job for our community. I could take down my mask here. Thank you. Um, I'm chairman of uh, Dory Saves Lives. Um, we at Dory Saves Lives are committed to public safety, uh, specifically safety in our car. We have uh, on our website, we have a video on how to wear a mask and the importance of wearing a mask in the car uh, when there's more than uh, one person in the car. You know, requiring masks in the public is a common sense evidence-based solution to the problem at hand. To turn a blind eye to such a practical public policy solution in the face of an overwhelming problem like COVID-19 is not just misguided, it's dangerous. Uh, community spread of the virus is still rampant. However, we could take steps to control it by requiring masks. And I'm asking uh, the uh, commissioners, mayor, uh, to 
get behind what you're, what you're doing here. This is a great public policy item. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Mr. Rose, you're recognized for two minutes, and we'll have Ms. Contreras to this microphone. Good morning. My name is Rick Rose, and I'm the president of Palm Beach Vacation Rentals and the proprietor at Grandview Gardens Bed and Breakfast. And I'm here to expressly sub express my support for a mandate to require masks inside public buildings. And it's, you know, I was in Fort Lauderdale this last weekend. I went to dinner, and I just wanted to share that with you. I was so impressed with the way the restaurant handled that. To enter the restaurant, you had to have a mask on. To go to your table, you had to have a mask on. When you sat down, you were allowed to take it off to eat. If you wanted to go to the bathroom, I actually forgot to put the mask on. I had to go to the bathroom. The waiter stopped me, said, please go back to your table and put on your mask before you go to the bathroom. I thought that was so great. So it, it is possible to do that. It's good for the businesses. The businesses need this. They really need that because this is how we can stay open and be safe and build confidence with our customers. I also wanted to express to the commission that I wish you would reconsider the reopening of vacation rentals. It's the safest way for people who are visiting the area to, to self-isolate. And uh, a lot of families who are coming to Florida are expressively looking for vacation rentals to stay at because they don't want to stay in hotels. And there's a huge demand right now. Palm Beach County is the only county in the state with vacation rentals which has not reopened them. And I just want to remind you that thousands of people are moving to Florida in the summertime during school break. <clears throat> and they often need vacation rentals for short-term stays while they're looking. Um, you know, so we also have lots of people from all over the world who are still stranded in South Florida. Do we want to force them into hotels before they return back? No, they want to stay in vacation rentals. So I just wanted to ask, really, um, I don't think it was a good public safety and health decision to not reopen vacation rentals. I'd like you to reconsider that, please. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We have Angelique Contreras, followed by Dwight Mattingly, and followed by A.D. Moser. As you all can tell, I'm a little um, heated today. So, good morning. I'd like to start out my comment by quoting you, Mayor Kerner. We as county commissioners should be open to advice and critique from our constituents. Those are who we work for. So today, I stand before you to do just that. I sat in this exact room for over a month, and I have listened as we have been verbally discriminated on by Melissa McKinley, by Weiss, and the local media. Palm Beach Post shared May 7th, it was dismaying to see Commissioner Melissa McKinley worried that the maskless rebels would sicken herself and her children. This board, excluding Valachay and Weinroth, have repeatedly denounced members of the public for not wearing masks when they had no idea if those individuals had medical conditions which prevent them from wearing one. You're setting a poor example for the public. Even Lois Frankel bashed us on Friday and said that it was 30% of the store. I don't know what store that is. I'm gonna also call out Miss Megan Bell who presented the mask mandate for this board. She has labeled those who can't wear a mask as anti-maskers and has gone as far to say that those individuals claimed that they have medical exemptions. So she's assuming we're lying I see your Facebook page. You're calling us anti-maskers while we're in this room. You, the board, need to control the people that are hating on individuals that cannot wear masks. By approving this mask mandate today, you are purposely taking food off of my children's plate. My options are already limited, and I'll quote you, Ms. McKinley. You said, if you don't like the rules, shop somewhere else. Well. After today, I won't have that option anymore because I am discriminated on every single time I tell somebody that I have a medical condition that does not allow me to wear a mask. So I ask you today, Mr. Kerner, I have to ask, are you want this enforcement squad of police officers to go out and arrest citizens for living life, running a business, trying to put food on their table because they're shopping without a mask? I feel like we're being punished, like we're criminals, and we're not even guilty of a crime. Please do not ma pass this mask mandate today. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much for your articulate and mature comments. Dwight, you are recognized for two minutes. So we have Dwight Mattingly, followed by A.D. Moser, followed by Dr. Schaefer. 
Thank you, Mayor Kerner, Board of County Commissioners. I'm Dwight Mattingly. I'm the president business agent for Amalgamated Transit Union Local 1577, which represents the operators for Palm Tran and the Palm Tran Connection operators. I stand before you in support of the motion that is on the floor because as we are operating these buses, we have a mandatory mass requirement now on our buses that is not being enforced. And I would urge you to consider how you're going to enforce this throughout the county, as well as making it mandatory. The issue that we're facing is we are continually having to ask the customers to put on a mask. However, we are also providing them masks if they do not have one and giving it to them. We have been very fortunate, Palm Tran, not to have a lot of operators come down ill as a result of the precautionary measures that we have taken. We believe 100% of that is due to the requirement of operators coming into the building wearing masks and the social distancing that we put in place, as well as not letting people board at the front of the bus, but at the rear door, and that is helping us to be able to do that. I would also very briefly like to say I'm against the sunset of 30 days because I don't believe that's enough time to be able to put into place and understand what the policy and outcome of this would be. I would rather it see, be at least six months or until the end of this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Dwight. We have A.D. Moser followed by Dr. Schaefer and followed by Sylvia Ball. Hey, good morning. Uh, let me ask you all, do you believe you're God? Do you believe you can override God's divine plan for our lives? Do you believe God gave us life and God can take away our lives? Well, if you answer yes to all these questions, who gives you the right to choose how we live our lives? I choose faith over fear every day. You are not God, and since masks are harmful, where there is risk, there should be choice. You're removing our freedoms and stomping on our con constitutional rights by these communist dictatorship orders or laws you want to mandate. Today, you have the ability to show your residents that you truly care. Because if you do vote to mandate masks in a workplace, in public, in schools, or stores, the death of many will be on your hands. The overwhelming evidence that is being presented to you today in no way, shape, or form can con consciously allow you to put your citizens at health at risk. Voting yes to mass mandates makes no scientific sense. Do you want to be called known for a communist dictators? Is this the legacy you want to be known for? You want to be responsible for fear mongering and misinformation fed to your citizens? The problem with humanity today is ignorance, arrogance, and apathy. Keep taking the road of least resistance. Keep listening to the TV brainwashing you from birth. Keep listening to conditioning messages messages in your local stores while shopping, just like Fidel Castro did over the loudspeakers in Cuba. Don't you see the problem? The truth is out there. Just go seek the truth. If you believe in God, you know he gave us life and he can take away our lives. Where there is risk, there should be choice. My concern, since I do have a medical condition that I cannot wear a mask, you are taking food away from my table. Will businesses set a special hour for those unable to wear a mask? Remember, God is watching you. Now. Understand that OSHA has gone against everything that you all are saying, including Dr. Um, Alonzo, that, you, that there is no way that wearing a facial mask do these masks keep us from spreading or getting COVID. So stop spreading the lies. Face coverings will not protect the wearer. It's over and over again in the New England Board of Journal, in every, every single medical establishment, they're all saying that masks do not work because guess what? If it did, Miami and Dade County would not have spikes. They would Thank not you, have rises. Your time and has so expired. You're wasting all our time by mandating this. Thank you, ma'am, for your comments. Matter. I have a question, Mr. Mayor. I have a question. Yep, you recognize Commissioner Bernard. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Ms. Baker, I have a, a quick question. Um, what, what phase are we at right now uh, in terms of you know, opening, what phase are we at? We're in full phase one. And um, w can you explain to us, did we request to be in phase two? We did request to be in phase two, but that request was very narrowly tailored. Uh, it is up with the governor's office at this point. And has long, how long has it been with the governor's office? About two weeks. Yeah. 
About two weeks? About a week and a half to two weeks, yes. And sir. what do you think is the reason why we're not at phase two? I don't want to speak for the governor, but I think that our numbers, the fact that our numbers are significantly increasing, uh, they're not steadily declining, uh, and so that's a concern. And so when he did phase two, uh, he moved the rest of the counties, all 64 four counties, uh, into phase two, and he specifically carved out Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach County. And so the businesses are not open because of what's going on right now, is that correct? The businesses that are in full phase one, those we are wrapping up mm -hmm. and allowing to open, but we have not moved to phase two and we are not opening those businesses because that is contrary to the executive order. So in order for us to move to a phase two, do we need to have a better control of you know, the increase. That would be my recommendation to anyone, and I think Dr. Alonzo agrees, and I think the governor's office is cautious on us moving forward as these numbers continue to climb. Okay, and I, I, I believe that the unemployment rate, I believe it was like over 14% mm -hmm. in, in, in the county. So in order for us to decrease our employment rate, we have to do a better job, is that? That is correct. Thank you, in my humble opinion. Thank, Thank you, Commissioner Bernard. I wanted to alert the board that I did speak with Governor DeSantis uh, last night. We did discuss the letter that was sent on behalf of the county to his office regarding the limited phase two. Uh, he, we did discuss that there are concerns that he has about the numbers in this county. Uh, he has an effort going on with the Department of Business and Professional Regulation in the Tri-County area, which I'll let him and his staff speak to more directly. And he wanted to see how um, how we could drill down into this, the hospital census and see where the, you know, the real issues are in this county and where the admissions to the hospitals are really going. I thought it was a very, um, very helpful discussion to have with the governor, and uh, certainly he was interested to see what board actions were taken today as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. We have Dr. Schaefer followed by Sivia Ball and followed by Saeed Hussein. Good morning. So, um, actually, Dr. Alonzo, I'd love to have a conversation with you, uh, doctor to doctor. Um, I saw the statistics, and we all know that statistics can be skewed regardless of whatever you want to pick out, cherry pick them. Um, we know that over Saturday to Sunday, the rate dropped from 13.9% to 6.1%. That wasn't reported because that's just one day. We also know that on Saturday there was one death total out of our entire population. That's, you know, that's one death. But think about the fact that we have 21.48 million in Florida and we have one and a half million people alone in this county. So I was gonna talk to Dr. Alonzo. I wanted to ask about something she said at the last meeting. She said there is no scientific proof that masks are effective. And that is true. There is no scientific proof. So if any of you have a study, I would love to review it. It should be a controlled double blind study um, people are looking on the internet or CNN or Palm Beach Post articles for their information. I'm a medical scientist. I went to school for a very long time. If any of you would like to go to medical school and get your degree, I encourage you to do so because the decision you're making today is a medical one. I'm very concerned that you're overstepping your authority. I'm very concerned that at the end of the day, you're making decisions for all patients. As a doctor, I can't think of a single remedy or treatment that I would give to all my patients. It's not one size fits all, folks. It's just not. We have to do the right thing. I know you're my, uh, you're my commissioner, uh, Ms. Berger. I know, Hal, you've made some great decisions. Bob, you've been a great voice. I encourage you all to think about what's right. The other thing I was curious about is if you employ this mask argument and you make it mandatory, are you now going to open the entire county all the businesses, because you're basically saying that this is your remedy, this is your cure. I sure hope you're right, because you're putting people's lives at risk. And the people that are really sick that should be home in quarantine, they're gonna come out thinking, our commissioners told us this is a free pass. So please be aware you're providing a false sense of security, and it's not, it's not at all proven by science that your point is valid. Thank you. Thank you, doctor, for your comments today. We have Sylvia Ball, followed by Saeed Hussein, followed by Jean Marie Naser. Hello, first I want to mention that Craig has a more detailed report that he's going to put in the commissioner's mailbox. 
I have one ready for all of you, and I hope you will read it and try to be concerned about the citizens out here. I was born and raised in this country, and it's, I'm very sad to see the authorities stomping on our constitutional rights and trying to decide something when they have no scientific proof that mask will protect a person and they want to throw God's wonderful breathing system out the door. You're all turning your backs on it. Can you prove that it's good for people to breathe carbon dioxide over and over and over again? God made it so that we would breathe in fresh oxygen to go to our body, to every cell in the body. It has to have that to make energy. When you wear a mask, the nose is cut off, the mouth is cut off, and you're breathing carbon dioxide over and over and over again. You're not getting the fresh oxygen that God intended. You're sending carbon dioxide to every cell in the body, polluting it, especially the brain. You can't do that. I can't understand why you at all decide something like this and want to hurt the people. You're going to harm the health of all of the people. That the virus is going to keep on going because people's bodies are being polluted and the virus is attracted to polluted bodies. You're going against God's wonderful gift he gave us. Please make sure you read the detailed report that Craig is going to put in the in your mailboxes so you can think about this. You're not qualified to decide. Ma'am, your time has expired and we okay. do deeply appreciate your comments today. Thank, Thank you. you. We have Mr. Saeed Hussein followed by Jean Marie Naser, followed by Bethany Ann. I think we have some, he had questions. Uh, Commissioner Weiss, you're recognized. Sorry. Thank you. Um, Dr. Alonzo, we, we've had some people talk to us about, about the facial coverings, and can you explain the, the purpose of the facial coverings? Who, who does it protect and who does it, what does it protect them from? The facial coverings protects a person who could have the COVID virus from spreading it. In other words, if, if I am positive, and I have this mask on, then my virus cannot go to you. So I am protecting you, and you protect me. So that's how it works. It's it's not it's not uh, wearing wearing this face covering doesn't protect me. Correct. It protects it protects you. And then we talk some. We've heard comments about the lack of oxygen and and so forth. I assume surgeons, there's some surgeries that can go on for quite lengthy period of time. How does that work for them? The surgeon probably wears a mask at least eight to 12 hours a day, every day of their working time. Um, I disagree with that comment about the dangers of the carbon dioxide. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Weiss. We'll return now to public comment. Mr. Hussain, you're recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Commissioner and Mayors. Hi, my name is Saeed Hussain. Um, I'm a Florida Atlantic University student studying environmental engineering, minor in political science. I've called Palm Beach County my home for the past four years. Um, I'm just entering politics as a candidate myself, and you know I wanted to come out for public comment. Um, in, in regards to Max, um, unfortunately, with the with recent evidence, there's not much data to support that. And this is from the WHO. It does not recommend at the present time, the widespread use of masks everywhere is not supported by high quality scientific evidence. And that's from the World Health Organization on June 7. And I could send it to you just for your reference. What this means is that if the World Health Organization is not recommending a widespread use of masks, then, you know, is that we have to recognize is are we going to listen to the World Health Organization or are we going to listen to what we think is the right way to proceed? Um, you know, everybody in the Florida Constitution, we have a right to privacy, and we have the right to live the life that we do without government intervention, especially in the private matter and the public matter. 
You know, it's unfair to start penalizing people and folks of any color and any race for deciding what they would do with their bodies, especially. Um, I know it could be hypocritical, but that's just a fact in, in this matter specifically. Um, looking at, you know, just the overall architecture of having an executive order on this matter, is this legally constitutionally binded by the Florida Constitution? And I do not agree with this. Um, you know, looking at Weaver versus Myers, they had to prove in that court case that the executive orders have to be within a reasonable burden of proof. And if the World Health Organization is not claiming that this is a widespread burden of proof, then it, the, this executive order is going to face extreme lawsuits. The minute you guys start voting on it, expect a lawsuit very quickly from many different organizations. And I would hate for the city to be wrapped up in such matters. I firmly believe that the city should not be liable for the 1.4 million residents living here and in favor of not having a mandatory mask, let the private businesses take care of themselves. I think that we all want to be better and get rid of this virus, but starting government mandates can lead Sir, to- Sir, your time has expired. Thank, Thank you guys you so much, much for your, your comments. Time. Thank you. Uh, we have Jane. Recognize, sorry, Commissioner oh, sorry. Bernard, and then we'll get to Commissioner Valachay. Um, after Commissioner McKinley. Dr. Alonzo, I have a question for you. Um, on, that, on the surgeon wearing a mask for eight to 12 hours, can you maybe explain to me why does a surgeon wear a mask during surgery? To stop from contaminating his surgical field, specifically to protect his patient. Thank you very much. Commissioner Valachay, you recognize. Thank you. I just wanted to point out uh, to Mr. Hussein that the World Health Organization has not covered itself in glory uh, during this whole thing. Back in the beginning of January, they stated definitively that the virus was not transmissible among human beings. They've gone on to be an apologist for the Communist Chinese government, um, you know, absolving them of the blame that they rightly deserve for, for not disclosing how serious this was for a couple of months and putting us into this entire situation. So I would not cite uh, the World Health Organization as an authority on anything until there's some changes to their leadership. Thank you, Commissioner Valachain. Further to his point, um, Doctor, if you know, I'm just trying to reconcile the testimony of Mr. Hussein versus the most recent update from the World Health Organization where it states, if you need to leave your house, wear a mask to avoid infecting others. Is there some confusion with the World Health Organization on the advice and guidelines that they're giving to the world? That's the advice they're giving to the world. To leave, <laughs> if you leave the house, wear a mask. Were they ever against wearing a mask? Or I may be asking you something outside of your normal review. I really don't want to comment on the World Health Organization any more than Dr. Val than Commissioner Valachay wants to comment on the World Health Organization. We're living in the United States and we're following the CDC that are the uh, U.S. experts. Fair enough. Thank you. Returning to public comment, ma'am, you recognize for two minutes. Hold on one second. Oh, let, me, let me call the next group. So it's Jean Marie Nacer followed by Bethany and followed by Christina Gomez. So perfect timing because I'm going to talk about the FDA regulations. But first I want to say that we're missing key data for decision making, and this is the data we're missing. Percentage and number of asymptomatic cases who tested positive, percentage and number of these people who are already cured, ages of positive tests, locations of positive tests, positive tests being admitted to the hospital, and positive tests being admitted to the ICU. Correlation does not equal causation. Tell me what data you have found in our county that controls for all other variables that can also contribute to the spread and proves that the lack of wearing masks is the causative factor. There have been no studies, nor assessments, nor observations which can control for all these data variables that contribute to the spread. Therefore, you cannot single out one variable, masks, and say that is the cause. Again, correlation does not equal causation. In regards um, to positive tests, the Journal of Medical American Medical Association says the presence of RNA doesn't mean there is an actual viable virus. Another study shows no spread of the virus to 455 contest, contacts when exposed to asymptomatic positive person. Each meeting, the commission has identified hotspots in McKinley's district. This has not yet been resolved. 
The FDA regulates the use of face masks, including cloth masks and cloth face coverings to the public. The FDA has issued an emergency use authorization pertaining to the use of face masks for COVID and say, you cannot claim that these masks can be used for antimicrobial, antiviral protection, or uses for infection prevention and reduction. According to the FDA, face masks, which includes cloth masks for the public, are considered medical devices when they are intended for a medical purpose, such as source control, including uses related to COVID. According for the, F the FDA, intended for medical purpose means the device is intended for the diagnosis of disease or other conditions in the cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease. Therefore, it meets the definition of a medical device. As such, this board has no authority for medical treatment or prevention of the disease because you have no license to practice medicine. That is under statute 381, and that is up to the Surgeon General. And under Ma that statute, he can only do that on an individual basis your time on has expired. risk assessment. And Thank now, you. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Alonzo, very quickly, with regards to the CDC uh, recommendation, it says that the CDC recommends that members of the public use simple cloth face coverings when in the public setting to slow the spread of the virus. Is there a conflict between the FDA's, rec this is on the FDA's website, is it the FDA or the CDC that issues these guidelines? The, the FDA issues guidelines on the um, testing and on the things that they regulate. The CDC is giving recommendations for the public. Got it. They're two separate things. Very good, thank you. Mr. Mayor, we have Bethany Ann, followed by Christina Gomez, followed by Beige McNabb. Hi, good afternoon, or good morning, whichever. I'm fully opposed to mandatory masks, and there are many studies that prove masks are detrimental to our health, so detrimental it's frightening that any of you want to mandate them. A 2008 study of surgical masks worn by surgeons found that the mask did reduce oxygen levels significantly, creating hypoxia, a lack of oxygen in the blood. Hypoxia inhibits T lymphocytes, the main immune cells, so wearing a mask suppresses our immune system. Hypoxia promotes inflammation, which can promote the growth, invasion, and spread of cancers, and can also lead to stroke and heart attack. Our Amazon Prime driver a few weeks ago was so weak from wearing his mask, he begged my husband for Advil and water. He said, this mask is killing me. This commission shouldn't be threatening the constituents. We voted for you to serve and protect us, not serve and protect an agenda that appears to take aim at innocent, healthy citizens and small businesses. Small businesses that have already been hurt economically due to the unnecessary shutdown created by using faulty models, along with government agencies that still can't keep their stories straight. This mandate would further hurt businesses that would be under threat of shutdown unless they force their patrons to cover their nose and mouth. What happens if a patron passes out due to mask wearing, falls, hits their head, breaks their nose, etc. When you pass out due to lack of oxygen, you are rendered incapacitated with no way to break your fall. Who's liable then? This commission? The business? The Department of Health? In Orange County, California, after the first few days of mask mandates, several residents in the area passed out. A few were injured as a result. The OC went back to masks are recommended. Why are not one of you mentioning from this commission or health department about boosting our immune system using zinc, vitamin D, magnesium, vitamin C, which are all proven to reduce ICU visits by 80%? We only hear about masks, vaccines, and testing. If we have a second wave, I feel it will be due to masking healthy citizens and therefore harming their immune systems, making them more susceptible to COVID, other viruses, and other ailments. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. So we have Christina Gomez, followed by Beige McNabb, followed by Cindy Falco DiConardo. I may have it wrong. All right. Good morning, family, all of you, because that's what we all are here. Um, what I want to say is we, the people, will work day and night to clean every single seat if need be. We will get together and do a citizen's arrest on every single human being that goes against the freedom of choice, okay? You cannot mandate, you literally cannot mandate somebody to wear a mask knowing that that mask is killing people. It literally is killing people. And my, the people, we the people, are waking up and we know what citizen's arrest is because citizen's arrests are already happening. Okay, and every single one of you that are obeying the devil's laws are going to be arrested. And you, 
doctor are going to be arrested for crimes against humanity. Every single one of you have a smirk behind that little mask, but every single one of you are going to get punished by God. You cannot, you cannot escape God. You cannot escape God. I'm going to say that again. You cannot escape God, not even with the mask or six feet. Okay, six feet, like I said before, is military protocol. You're trying to get the people to train them. So when the, the cameras, the 5G comes out, what? They're, they're going to they're gonna scan everybody. We got to get scanned. We got to get temperatured. The kids have to go to school with masks. Are you insane? Are you crazy? I think all of you should be in a psych ward right the heck now. Because none of you. None of you know what the hell you are all talking about. This is insane. And then you want to open this meeting with a prayer to God. Are you praying to the devil? Because God is not listening to that prayer. Because all of you are practicing the devil's laws. What happened to Bill Gates? Why is he not in jail? Why is Hillary Clinton not in jail? Why are all of, all of these pedophiles that are demanding you all to, to listen to their rules, why are they not in jail? Oh, is it because you're part of them? Thank are you, you part of the deep your state? Time has expired. The deep state is going Ma down. And if any of you are morning. in the deep state, you're going I'm down finding, with it. I'm finding that you are disrupting this meeting. Thank you. We'll move on further into public comment. We have Paige McNabb followed by Cindy Falco de, Con de Corado. I'm not sure. But Paige McNabb, you're next. Followed by Elizabeth Felton. Um, okay, so I have some things um, cited that I just wanted to share. Um, now, someone, I can actually tell you their name instead of saying someone. George Looper is an OSHA specialist, um, 10 and 30 certified. And I wanna just cite some things I know that uh, Commissioner McKinley was asking specifically about how can surgical masks uh, be had for eight to 10 hours? Well, because they're not made of cloth or your t-shirt. They're made of a surgical mask. So I want to just break down what this um, OSHA certified um, specialist has to say about the different types of masks. And the, they are not the same as the ones that the people are wearing out in the public. So you don't want to necessarily say, oh, wear a mask. They're all the same. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. Well, first of all, in the box of these disposable ones that everybody's wearing, it specifically says on it, there's no protection, zero against COVID. So specifically, this is not an armor. It's not going to give any kind of prevention of getting COVID specifically. It says it on the mask. So anyways, um, an N N95 masks are designed for contaminated environments. This means when you exhale through an N95 mask, this is when that you are exhausting into contamination. The exhale from N95 masks are vented to breathe straight out without filtration. They don't filter the air on the way out. They don't need to. Surgical masks, these masks are designed and approved for sterile environments. The amount of particles and contaminants in the outside and indoor environments where people are clogged, C-L-O-G-G, -G, I don't know if that means something. These masks are very quickly, um, very, very quickly. The moisture from your breath combined with the clogged mask with render it useless if you come in it's useless if you come into contact with COVID and your mask traps. You become a walking virus dispenser. Every time you put on your mask, you are breathing the germs from everywhere you went. They should be changed or thrown out every 20 to 30 minutes in a non-sterile environment. Now, do you think that the public is doing that? Clock ma masks. Ma'am, your time has expired. Oh, okay. Thank you very much for your comments okay. today. So Cindy, followed by Elizabeth Felton and Anastasia Leon. I'd like to say, in the beginning, God formed man out of the earth and breathed his breath in him, and he became a living soul. Where do you derive the authority to regulate human breathing? I ask you this because this is very important. You all are playing doctors, and you're not. And God gave us the very breath that we are to breathe. I would also like to know where do you get the authority to reduce my oxygen? 
Who made you perpetrators over my life? I would like to also say in Congress is where laws are made. They have to write a bill. That bill has to also go through the Senate. You cannot just make laws. That is unconstitutional. That is not how we run this country as a republic. You have taken and overreached authorities that you do not have. And ma'am, as a doctor, I really have many question marks about your degrees and what you really know, because what you say is the political dogma that they're trying to shove down our throats on every commercial, in every store, and it's disgusting. And I'm sorry, ma'am, but I don't think that you are worthy of your credentials. And I would ask suggestively that you go back to school and get educated. Ma'am, ma there is a difference between commenting on her Okay, then I will go back to my comments to each you. and one, every one of you as representatives of the human race, where you're supposed to represent people. And Mrs. Baker, okay, I'm not allowed to say your name, but still, it is appalling that each and every one of you sitting up there as human beings, part of the human race, the only race that we have, would suggest to muffle people, to put masks on our face, to keep us from breathing oxygen, to get us to become sickly. Now there's so much evidence. The CDC itself said they made a mistake. There's not enough to make this a pandemic. This is a planned demic. This is totally political and you know it. And I'm asking you to cease and desist from the political agendas that you're being propagandized to stand with and try to hold us hostage Thank as you, American citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. We have Elizabeth Felton followed by Anastasia Leon followed by Aaron Getty. Mayor, commissioners, staff, thank you. Thank you for your service to our community. I don't envy your position today. We have a heated debate going on here um, and both sides passionately feel they've brought science uh, behind their beliefs. I am, uh, because I, I, I take a medication that makes me immunocompromised, I also have breathing problems. Mask is not an option for me. But I did some reading, uh, the National Institute of Health and Yale University has done studies on a ketogenic diet and how it actually inhibits uh, virus growth. Now it's specifically the flu, but we don't really know much about COVID. So I've kind of done that for myself for the past few months. And I've been exposed to a lot of people. So by the mask, you know, must wear mask theory, I should be the outbreak monkey. Everybody I know who I hang out with should be sick and they are not. And if we're going to push for health, it starts in here. And I don't believe it starts by uh, inhibiting your ability to breathe and you can say it doesn't doctor but I have to disagree because I know what I feel when I have the mask on my face I ordered one of those little meters it didn't come in time I will be making a, a video about it but I urge you all to it's it's hard once you dig your feet in and you take a position to please critically think this out you have a lot of constituents who don't believe your opinion is the best way to move forward with their health thank you thank you ma'am for your comments Thank you. We have Anastasia Leon, followed by Aaron Getty, followed by Reba Sherrill. How can you make a one-size-fits-all mandate? Are you considering the following? I've been a music teacher for 23 years. I need you to tell me how do I play a saxophone and sing with a mask on? I'll let you think about that. How about people that can't breathe with the myriad of conditions that there are? Not just one, not just two, maybe four, maybe five. What about PTSD from child abuse situations? I was left in a hot car. You wanna cover my face? I'm gonna hyperventilate because I remember being stuck in that hot car. What about people like me? We don't matter because of the greater good, right? What about religious objections? I happen to be clergy. Nobody's talked to me about me and my religion and our levels of autonomy and about how we do not allow masks or medical treatments to be given by people that are not doctors, which is everybody up here except one. All right. Speaking of the greater good, that's a nice phrase that they used to use back in Cuba where my family came from. They had a lot of the same things that you guys are proposing now. Snitch lines, we call them el comité de barrio. They would snitch on each other and call people, hey, he's not doing this, he's not doing that. Snitch, 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 snitch. Yeah, that, Cuba likes that. They're proud of you guys right now. The enforcers, police officers, are you ready to turn into tools of the government and drag people to jail for wearing a mask? Is that what you want to do? Because that just happened to my uncle's uh, neighbors in Cuba. They decided they wanted to see each other because they live next door to each other. The cops came, took them away. We haven't heard from them since. They're probably dead. 
and the educators, the loudspeakers, the announcements, six feet apart, six feet apart, six feet apart, follow comunismo, follow comunismo. Same loudspeaker, same thing. Did you guys call Castro and ask him about that? I'm letting you know, we know this is unconstitutional. I haven't worn a mask yet. I'm not wearing it today. Besides, despite what you guys do up here today, I'm not wearing one tomorrow. I was born free. I will stay free. My rights come from God, not from you. I'm not wearing it. You're going to have to hold me down and put it on me. Yes. Thank you, ma'am, for your comments. We have Aaron Getty, followed by Reba Sherrill, followed by Mary Pinsky, please. Mr. Getty, you're recognized for two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Kern. Thank you, Board of Commissioners. This is a very heated topic. Uh, as he said, my name is Aaron Getty. I'm the vice president of a restoration company, um, and this is something that I've been practicing for over 10 years. The reason I bring that up is because part of what we do is clean biohazard losses and we clean mold. PPE is a very important part of what we do. I wish I had the time to talk about the science behind PPE. Unfortunately, I don't. Um, so the one thing that I would like to present to the board is part of wearing personal protective equipment is protecting me, it's not protecting others. That's very important to keep in mind because OSHA regulates PPE. One of the things that they talk about is wearing it properly. Unfortunately, for those that are wearing it, I see the majority of uh, citizens wearing it improperly. Facial hair automatically uh, says that you're not wearing it properly. So what I would ask of the board is how are you going to police those that are wearing face coverings but not, are not wearing them properly? That's number one. Number two is I would like to point out that Dr. Alonzo quite adequately has uh, pointed out that increased face touching is a huge problem. And this is one of the main ways that the virus spreads. Studies have shown that by wearing a face mask, you inc uh, significantly increase the amount of times that you touch your face. Um, additionally, we pointed out those are respiratory deficiencies. OSHA, the CDC, and the face mask manufacturers have come out and, and said very clearly that you should not wear them. The other thing that I would like to point out is the surgical masks that you see people wearing are single-use masks. The reason they're single-use masks is because bacteria builds up in these masks and it becomes very uh, uncleanly and unsanitary for the wearer. Lastly, I would like to point out that the Center for Disease and Infectious Research and Policy has said, quote, we do not recommend requiring the general public who do not have symptoms of COVID-19 illnesses to wear the masks. Um, what I would also like to point out is that when you wear these masks, it's, it's to protect the wearer. The reality is masks are rated for the hazards that we, are, uh, that we are addressing. And Dr. Alonzo, I'm sure that you would agree with that. The reason that they're rated is because of the particulate size that you're going to inhale. Very quickly, I, I would like to end with this. Uh, sun shields are not adequate face protection. They will filter microns between 50 and 500 microns in size. They filter Sorry, your time has expired. Absolutely. The virus is 0.125 microns in size. So if you have something that's meant to filter out 500 microns in size and the virus is 0.125 microns in size, scientifically the masks do not work. Thank you for your comments. You're welcome. Sir. Thank you guys for hearing me. We have Reba Shero followed by Mary Pinsky, followed by Anne Margot Cannon. Do we have a, a microphone that's wireless, perhaps? Yeah, okay. Testing. Hi, my name is Reba Sherrill, and I'm a U.S. Congressional candidate in Florida District 21. My specialty is oncology hematology. Persons with compromised immune systems, such as someone who's had a transplant, would be advised to wear a mask in public. Healthy persons would not. If masks work, or you think they do, wear one. Don't impose your opinion on those who disagree. Each one can choose whether they will wear one or not. Each one lives with the consequence. Discriminating against certain groups of people while exempting others is a violation of our civil rights. Following World War II, we Jews said, never again. Jewish ghettos were forced in Germany, Poland, and across Europe. We were forced to wear a gold star, told to get on a boxcar to be taken to a safe place. In reality, what happened? If we forget history, we are doomed to repeat it. We the people refuse to comply. 
The videos in the nightclubs shown appear eerily similar to the protesters, rioters, and looters, yet the CDC directly and emphatically refused to denounce that behavior. In fact, the CDC encouraged this behavior while instructing all others to stay at home. Stop testing, go back to normal, not a new normal. Increased testing means increased positives, not necessarily increased severity. Governor Ron DeSantis signed an executive order numbered 20-80, and in there states, there's a penalty of a 60 days imprisonment and up to $500 fine to refuse to consent to a vaccine. Not only should the governor rescind this executive order, he should replace the state surgeon general with someone more in line with the will of we the people. Military and airline personnel are exempt. The RNC will be in Jacksonville in August. Are they to quarantine and isolate thousands of delegates and media for two weeks before the convention? We the people are afforded protection under ADA and HIPAA. Ma this your is time not has about expired. health. This we is about submission. Your comments. Um, but I your have time, one your... last thing I'd like to say from President George Washington. Yes, ma'am. The power under the Constitution will always be in the people. It is entrusted for certain defined purposes and for a certain limited time to representatives of their own choosing. And whenever it is executed your, your contrary to their interests or not agreeable to their wishes, their servants can and undoubtedly will be recalled. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much for your participation today. Hi, Just my one, name is... One minute, ma'am. We have to call another speaker. Oh. So we have Mary Pinsky, followed by Anne Margot Cannon, followed by... Teresa Roberts. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, my name is Mary Ellen Pinsker. I'm a board certified behavior analyst. I'm expressing my opinion today that the board analyst certification board may not necessarily agree with. My first question as a former teacher of 16 years, if you're going to propose a mandate, you need to show example of the mandate. And throughout the meeting, I've noticed five to six people are not wearing their facial coverings and they haven't talked in over 20 minutes. So I'll leave the names of those to be, you know, I'm not gonna say that, but I just noticed that if you're gonna mandate something, you need to like do it yourself. Um, also to Dr. Alonzo, I do have the study of the preliminary report on surgical mask induced deoxygenation during major surgeries and it does address that the PaO2 levels, which measures how well oxygen is able to move from the lungs to the blood, is severely compromised. So I'll leave that for you to peruse at your leisure. Um, as other speakers have noted, uh, mandating a medical mask is actually a medical treatment that requires consent. It requires the oversight of a doctor that does a physical examination to explain, to explain the risk and or benefit of the treatment. I also work with special needs children. Even though they may not have to wear the mask, they will be treated differently in society by those who do wear the mask due to mask shaming. How does the uh, Board of County Commissioners plan to address that? And that's for people that may not necessarily look like they have a developmental disability or condition. And the statistics on that are one in 54 children and over five million US adults, according to the CDC. That's actually the real pandemic. Why do one in 54 children have autism? And we just didn't, we, we didn't even recognize that in April. That's supposed to be the national autistic time to look that was just totally forgotten. Ma'am, your time is And I expired. happen to have two children that suffer from that condition. Thank you, ma'am, for your comments here today. Thank you. And I'll leave the study. Thank you. We'll, we'll receive and follow without objection and distribute to the members of the board. We have Anne Margot Cannon, followed by Teresa Roberts, followed by Josie Makovic. Ma'am, you recognize for two minutes. Good morning. I'm turning in 888 signatures of confirmed Palm Beach County residents who emphatically oppose government mandated face coverings. These petitions were collected in just five days. We are local citizens. We do not have funding of any kind. We do not have an agenda. We are trying to protect ourselves and our children. 
This order grossly misjudges the current threat and oversteps government's role of protecting our residents. We have inalienable rights given to us by our creator, rights which our government was created to protect. We need proof. Residents do not take it lightly when arbitrary and capricious rules are forced down their throats for the greater good, and then we are given no logical scientific basis for those rules. The data, I'm sorry, to date, not one official has demonstrated how the data and science justify this mandate. The data available to the public does not justify such an action. Less than 1% of the Palm Beach County population has confirmed positive with COVID-19. Quoting the CDC guidelines is not proof that any particular intervention is needed in Palm Beach County. Intolerance and arrest. The members of law enforcement too deserve special consideration in this national time of tension. Do we want police and sheriff's deputies cracking down on law-abiding citizens for not wearing masks? It has already happened and it is working its way through the courts now. Is this truly the best use of our legal and law enforcement resources? There have also been recently many reported instances of intolerance from retail and other business establishments, especially medical offices. Those with health conditions need more protection under the rules, not less. Ma'am, your time has expired. Uh, we appreciate the. Uh, the and three weeks ago, Mayor policy. Kerner also directed uh, County Administrator Baker to meet with citizens, and you did not. Ma'am, your time Why? has expired. We will take your petitions and receive and file without objection and distribute to members of the board. Thank you very much. Second, ma'am. We have Teresa Roberts, followed by Josie Makovic, followed by Michael, wow, this is hard. Michael Dyer, okay. Very good, ma'am, you recognize for two minutes. Good morning, thank you so much for hearing me. My name is Teresa Roberts. Uh, first and foremost, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, and I am a nurse. Um, I have an expertise in immunity my daughter was born with heart defects, partial pulmonary veins anomalous. Are you familiar with that, doctor? Okay. Atrial septal defect, multi-lobe spleen. Okay. I also am immune compromised. I don't have a thyroid. Are you familiar with that? So I've done a lot of research, and um, because of that, I'm 54, and we keep ourselves very healthy. I uh, also work in an area where we give uh, immunity uh, preventative means. Uh, vitamin C, D3, are you familiar with that and how that helps immunity? Okay, so my concern as a nurse and a mother and a grandmother is that I am, I am hearing that the county is going to be prescribing a medical means that's unsolicited by the people on a whole. And I see a lot of problems with that. I also see that a mask is not preventative for COVID, and that's exactly what you're doing without saying it. There is research that says that it does cause hypoxia. There's actual research online, and I will send it to all of you if you wanna see this, where people are doing oximeter readings from wearing these masks. Doctor, you know that the environment in the OR is much different than the environment out here. You know that. So you can't compare the two when wearing a mask, okay? What I'm concerned about is our police officers who are gonna be wearing masks. What happens if they become hypoxic? They carry guns. This is serious and it needs to be taken seriously. I'm also the daughter of somebody who lived through Germany. I know a lot of stories and this is sounding very familiar to me. Thank you, you ma'am. You're forcing people to wear masks. They were forced to wear a star. Thank you, ma'am, for your comments today. We have Josie Makovic, followed by Michael, and followed by Rachel Ede. Good morning. Good to see you all here today. Here we are again. So fun. It's become my favorite part of my week, I must admit. 
Um, okay, so first of all, we live in a republic, a democratic republic, not a democracy. Um, Commissioner Valache, I appreciate, appreciate what you said about the WHO, um, but if that is true, then why is the county citing the WHO on their website as a source to be listened to? So you need to decide who you want us to listen to. You can't keep telling us all these different things and expect us to, to really understand what you're talking about. So education, Mayor Kerner, you emphasize it multiple times. You and Dr. Alonzo and the rest of this board um, discuss about how we need to educate, educate, educate. I myself have stood here at least twice before and through several separate emails of which I don't get responses from requesting these studies that are showing why that, that it is safe for us to not only wear the mask, but that it is effective. We're not getting them. So as many other people have said, how can you mandate a medical intervention on people without the scientific backup? An opinion is not science. It's not science. As much as you, you can't just keep saying things and expect them to be true. It's not, an opinion is not science. And until we see those scientific studies, I've said I would be willing to consider wearing a mask if I can see those studies. I still haven't received them. Therefore, I can only assume that they don't exist or for some reason you don't want to share them with us. A mask mandate will not have the effect that you want it to. We are three months into this. The people who are not wearing masks have medical conditions that prohibit them from wearing them or they have a deep-seated conviction and belief in their constitutionally protected rights and they will not wear them. They are willing to risk jail time. They are willing to risk the citation. People like me who have the medical condition are not going to suddenly start wearing them because you mandate them. I'm actually going to get discriminated against everywhere I go even more than I already am and have to tell everybody everywhere I go all about my personal medical information. So you are putting that out there. You, as many people have said, you are the leaders in this. The last thing that I want to say is that the Florida Constitution states life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. A mask mandate is the antithesis of this. Life is snuffed with the deprivation of oxygen. Liberty is snuffed when personal freedom of choice is removed, and our pursuit of happiness is snuffed when we have to fight you constantly not to remove our freedoms. Please do your job to uphold the Constitution and our protected rights by voting, by voting no on this mandate. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, very much for your comments today. One second, sir. We have Michael followed by Rachel Eid, followed by Sarah Taryn Tiff. I, I probably haven't butchered it. Okay, my name is Michael Dim, and I'm a veterinary medical physician with 30 years' experience um, dealing with infectious diseases in our animals, including. Um, can, can, sir, can you stand a little bit closer or sure. raise the mic? Thank you. Is it? All right. Um, I, I have an interest in infectious diseases in our animals, including several um, species that have coronavirus in them, especially the cat. And Dr. Alonzo brings up the idea of enforcement and education. The problem is, is that you're not allowing the minority viewpoint to be heard, whether it's at the national level or here at the local level. There's plenty of credible physicians and MDs and veterinarians that you know, have a different viewpoint, have different science on this, and they're not getting their fair share. They're not being allowed to sit on, you know, discussion panels and to have their viewpoints heard because there's a lot of science that says the opposite to what's being presented here. And as a minority viewpoint in my profession, where I, why I became a holistic veterinarian was because a lot of the mainstream veterinary medical care was wrong and animals were being hurt by it. And so with these policies that you guys are implementing and not allowing other viewpoints to be heard, people are going to be hurt by this. I sent everybody on this board, uh, you know, Dr. Meehan's website, okay, MeehanMD.com. He collect, he has all these information right on there. The other thing I want to say is one of the commissioners, one of the uh, uh, brought up about, you know, being in an operating room and uh, having, having uh, why surgeons wear masks. Well, I'll tell you that in veterinary medicine, most general veterinary medical practices throughout this country, most general surgeons don't wear masks. And they've got an open abdominal cavity in front of them, a chest cavity, an open wound, and animals aren't being infected. There's no virus transmission, there's no bacterial transmission. So you look at that and you see what you guys are mandating here in the public, there's just little science on it, guys. Thank or there's you, another side to here. Thank you, Doctor, for your comments today. Just one second, sir. We have Rachel Ede, followed by Sarah Turntief, and followed by Angela, wow, Kakonich. Sir, you're recognized for two minutes. I uh, just wanted to say, my name is Michael Moshe. When you couldn't pronounce the last name on the Michael, I, th I thought that I was being called. Um, if, if I may proceed. Please. Okay. 
Wanted to comment first on uh, some of the slides that Dr. Alonzo had, had put up. One about, um, you know, one of the slides showed a graph where the deaths were down pretty significantly. And I get that there is, is a lag time, um, but you know, we're, we're not really at the point here where this is an emergency. Um, the deaths are going down. And then the other piece of uh, data that I think I sh we should bring to light is that the median age of these infections are trending way downward. And when you get the way downward trend in the age of these infections, these cases are going to be much less likely to require hospitalization. Um, so based on, on those two data points, I would urge the county commission to rethink this mass policy. Uh, I wanted to move on to a few things that I had prepared uh, before coming in. And the first thing is, is the mass situation itself. There is no evidence supporting a cloth face covering doing anything. Um, when a surgeon wears a mask, it's a very specific type, type of mask. It's a single-use mask. They wear it once and they throw it away. And the reason for that is because a mask is essentially like a filter. It's like the AC filter in your house. And if you don't change it, it just builds up with gunk and gunk and gunk. It builds up with viruses. It builds up with bacteria. And eventually, it becomes more dangerous than not wearing the mask at all. The next thing is that there is no guarantee at all that there's going to be an effective vaccine produced for this virus. We need to operate under the assumption that there is going to be no effective vaccine for this virus. And are we going to be required to wear masks forever because a vaccine doesn't come out? I, you know, where does this end? That's my next point. Um, the original idea was, was to flatten the curve. We've done that. Um, seems like there's a moving goalpost here. Um, a lot of the increase in the confirmed cases has come from increased testing. And the last thing I want to say, because I'm running low on time here, is that young children, they learn a lot from facial expressions. They, they learn a lot about social cues, and we are removing this very important developmental learning uh, phase in a lot of these young children, because they aren't able to see these, these facial expressions. Sir, your time has expired. I, I appreciate understand. your comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Just one moment, ma'am. Sure. Thank you. Were you, were you Michael Mokia? Yeah. Perfect, thank you very much. Rachel Ede followed by Sarah, followed by Angela K. Ms. Ede, you recognize for two minutes. Good morning. Informed consent, bodily autonomy, risks and choice, burden of proof. Today, you'll hear again an unapologetic message that you have ignored for weeks. You do not have the authority to govern my body. You don't have the science or the proof to support a mandated medical intervention because if you did, you would respond to our emails with that information. In Florida, informed consent requires a doctor, not a board of commissioners, to provide the nature of the procedure, what it intends to correct, and explain fully the risks. Other alternatives, outcomes, and even a do-nothing approach. You have never explained the risks. For the record, we've been harassed, defamed, humiliated, discriminated, called anti-maskers, maskless bandits, grandma killers. Does that sound like public health to you? You can't hide this stuff. We're not buying your bored who cried wolf ever again. Never once has anyone addressed the idea of education of informed consent. The risks of wearing a face covering have been repeatedly mentioned by all U.S. governing boards and insufficient science to, prov to provide level of protection. If a mask did its job, it would require biohazard disposal, not reckless rear view mirror decor. <laughs> Mayor Kerner, at your presser, I counted 15 times that your hands went to your face, put on the mask, took it off, fondled, flip-flopped, and no one sanitized your mic. The board has never attempted to educate people. You aren't asking about the positive cases percentage of mask wearing. Your friend or whomever who lost his life at the strip club, he was 400 pounds. At Palms West Hospital, seven deaths, you're doing a great job, 18 comorbidities. Gunshot wound to the head, but COVID death. These are from the Palm Beach Medical Examiner. We have the proof, you don't. Thank you, ma'am. Did you want to turn those into the board? Yes. Sure. It's public record. Is that a no? All right, we'll move That's on to the next speaker. Well, just give it to him. Give it to Craig. Thank you, ma'am. And we'll receive and file without objection. In just one moment. 
So we have Sarah followed by Angela C, followed by Venus Flores. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning. Um, I would, I'm certainly not a medical professional, but I would just like to appeal to common sense. I mean, this whole concept of your mask protects me and mine protects you. I mean, the gentleman earlier said nobody's wearing these things right. It's just nonsense. It doesn't make sense. From the OSHA website, plainly states that cloth masks will not protect the wearer against airborne transmissible infectious agents due to loose fit and lack of seal or inadequate filtration. And I would also just like to say there are a lot of opposing views that you're never going to hear on the mainstream media. For instance, Dr. Brosu and Dr. Sietsema, both national experts on respiratory protection and infectious diseases at University of Illinois at Chicago said, we do not recommend requiring the general public who do not have symptoms of COVID-19 like symptoms to routinely wear cloth or surgical masks because there is no scientific evidence they are effective. Please do not pass this mask mandate. Thank you, ma'am. So we have Angela C. followed by Venus Flores, followed by Christine, uh, Mayor Christine de Hesseth. Yeah. Hi. Um, first of all, I wanted to address the statement made by Dr. Alonzo that we need to respect and follow the governor's orders. I'm going to quote Governor DeSantis at his Friday press conference that masks have to be voluntarily because the Constitution is not suspended just because there is a virus. Also stated by Dr. Alonzo that wearing your mask is wearing it wrong is just like putting a condom in the wrong place. I have yet to see anybody up here wearing their mask as stated on your website. It says, do not wear them loosely. Do not wear them under your nose. Avoid touching them. Stay at least a meter from each other. And when you're removing them, you should be using sanitary gloves to place them in a sterile container, throw the gloves away, then use new gloves to put them back on. None of you are doing that. You're touching, moving, poking, prodding. How do you expect a three-year-old, a four-year-old, or a five-year-old to do any of this successfully? When it's worn properly, it's decreasing your oxygen, increasing your blood pressure, suppressing your immune system. Has anybody done the studies on the COVID positives of people that have been wearing the masks regularly? I really, really hope that you take all these things into consideration. Look at OSHA, look at who, look at CDC. We can argue this all day long, who we're gonna believe today, who we're gonna believe tomorrow. But the fact of the matter is, it's our bodies, it's our choice, whether we're gonna wear them, not wear them. You guys are overstepping your boundaries 100%. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your comments. We have Venus Flores followed by Mayor Christine de Hesseth, followed by Alana Molnath. Good morning, my name is Venus. Um, I'm not a, a very a professional speaker, but I do know I have rights. I do know that I was born in the United States and I'm a free citizen. Not only that, I'm a citizen of heaven. And I will not tolerate putting a muzzle on my mouth to keep me from speaking to people, to keep me from, from them seeing my smile, to brighten up someone's day who's been sick, who has a child that's sick, who's suffering through cancer. We can't do this, and the distancing, God made us to communicate with people, to hug people, to love on people. This social distancing stinks, it stinks, okay? I can't hug my child, I can't hug someone who I love, I can't go see my grandmother or my mother. No, no, this is unacceptable. You guys, we are the, you work for us. You, we don't work for you, you work for us. We vote you in, we vote you in, we vote you out. Okay, this is our right to not wear anything to cover our faces or hold our breath and get sick. Because I, I work in the healthcare for professional. I don't wear a mask and none of my clients are sick and I'm not sick. I just took the test and I'm negative. So this nonsense has to stop. We need to start learning what people want. We the people, not the board. We the people. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your comments. We have Mayor Christine de Hesseth, followed by Alana Molnath, followed by uh, Justice Ira Rabb. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners, staff. Can you hear me through my mask? 
I'm Christine DeHassett. I'm a mayor of a very small town called Ocean Ridge. I'm here on behalf of my fellow commissioners and my town. We have had a mask mandate in our town hall the entire time and it has served us well. I am here in support of the mandate for the mask in the county. Although we have no retail or restaurants, we have some of the finest beaches in the county. We have over three public beaches enjoyed by our neighboring towns on a daily basis. Why we welcome them with their surfboards and their beach towels, we do not welcome them with COVID. All of us are in this together and I thank you for your consideration and I appreciate your leadership during these difficult and trying times. Thank you, Mayor, for your comments today. We have Alana Monath, followed by Judge Ira Rab, followed by Karen Holm. Okay. Hello, good morning. Uh, I'm going to speak Please on behalf. Please take any conversations outside the chambers. It's getting difficult to hear the public speakers, and they have a right to be heard at this proceeding. Ma'am, you have two minutes. Okay, thank you. I'm going to be speaking on behalf of children. Children, especially babies, are continually learning and using the <clears throat> constructs of their native languages, which is senses and nonverbal communication. Much of our communication is nonverbal, which includes facial expressions, gestures displayed, and the physical distance between the communicators. These nonverbal signals can give cl clues and additional information and meaning over and over, over and above verbal communication. Nonverbal clues, cues create a world of safety for children as well as can be taught for emergency and dangerous situations. Some estimates suggest that around 70 to 80% of communication is nonverbal. Now we have the olfactory sense, which is our nose, it is said to be the strongest sense we possess, a sense many of us take for granted, but infants depend on it to recognize their mothers and mothers to recognize their children. Life mates are most often attracted based on a complex set of pheromones and other factors that help bond people to one another. Forcing people to wear masks will affect bonds between one another. When a person uses a face mask, all of the above gets suppressed because it is hidden behind the mask. Sometimes I can't tell if a person's happy, sad, angry, or even recognizable. So if I can't able to distinguish, how, how are children going to be able to distinguish that? Are you prepared to allow this mandate to harm babies and children's ability to meet even exceed their potential to develop and communicate. We are social beings. How will children learn bonding if they are continuously see only people's eyes and the six feet physical distance? What kind of guarantee can any of you provide that no baby, child, teenager, and anyone with a disability who is subjected to an intervention like this will not be physically, emotionally, and psychologically harmed? How will young children be able to know who the dangerous deviants are, like pedophiles and people in the human sex trafficking? Can you provide any significant evidence that the benefits of such intervention outweigh the risk? Where there's risk, there must be choice. Thank you very much for your comments, ma'am. We have Justice Ira Rabb, followed by Karen Holm, followed by Tara Higgins-Hill. Justice, you're recognized for two minutes. Good morning. My name is Ira Rabb. I'm the parliamentarian of the Palm Beach County Democratic Party. I fully support the proposal that the county mandate the wearing of masks <clears throat> in indoor places within the county that are open to the public. I note that yesterday, Congresspersons Frankel, Deutsch, and Hastings have issued a statement in support of the proposal. Contrary to what some of the speakers have said this morning, health experts, Dr. Fauci in Washington, Dr. Alonzo here this morning, have stated that social distancing and the wearing of masks do reduce the spread of COVID-19, especially in indoor places open to the public. Some people may claim that they have a constitutional right a personal choice of free speech or symbolic speech not to wear a mask, but they do not have a constitutional right to endanger others, just like they do not have the constitutional right in a crowded theater to yell fire when there is no fire and thereby endanger others in the theater. Mandating the wear of masks in such places may still not get some people to wear masks, but at least the mandate will allow business owners to demand that people comply and for the protection of their employees, the patrons, and even themselves. 
Therefore, I strongly recommend that you follow the science, stand up, take the necessary leadership, and make the wearing of masks mandatory in out indoor places open to the public. Make your, make your vote unanimous and send a proper message to the public. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir, for your comments. We have Karen Holm, followed by Tara Higgins Hill, followed by Louis Leo IV. Hi, I'm Karen Holm. This isn't about a virus. You've all been talking in circles. Your staff has said that this pandemic is the worst the world has seen, yet your Department of Health hasn't issued a single quarantine order ever. Your staff told us last week that the deaths from this virus was an average of 1.9 people per day. 1.9 people out of 1.5 million people in Palm Beach County. We have a minuscule chance of dying from this virus, yet at the same time you're telling us all to be scared. It's a circle. But this isn't about a virus, this is about government overstepping their authority. You've come here today to discuss making an executive order to tell me to wear a mask, yet I have the highest law, the Florida constitutional right, to be let alone. I get to do with what I want with my body and my face. Under the Florida Constitution, I have the right to a hearing. Your proposed executive order that contains a civil and criminal penalty doesn't provide for that. Your proposed order is unconstitutional. If you think your power is derived from the Florida statutes, it isn't. If you think your power is in the, in the comprehensive emergency management plan to make a countywide mask mandate, think again, because you don't. To make me wear a mask, you'd have to prove that I'm infectious. In short, this isn't about a virus. It's about your attempt to take authority that you don't have. Some of you might be squirming, and it's like a high school drama queen who hasn't got voted for the homecoming court. But I'm sorry about your discomfort, but you don't have the authority to make mandatory masks. In closing, I'd like to point out that your current executive order states that all persons accessing Palm Beach County government buildings shall wear facial coverings at all times while present in the building. You're not following your own EO. <clears throat> I think that makes you probably subject to fine or jail right now. Thank you, ma'am, for your comments today. We have Tara Higgins Hill, followed by Louis, Louis Leo IV, followed by Melissa March. Good morning. Once again, I'm here speaking in solidarity with fellow activists and residents of Palm Beach County on behalf of Reopen Florida. Since you're using CDC guidelines and misleading statistics to justify an unconstitutional mask mandate, I had a whole speech prepared about how wrong the CDC had, has gotten this whole pandemic response. I could talk about their contaminated tests, their retracted recommendations, their inconsistent stance on masks, their conflating of antibody and viral tests resulting in crucial metrics errors, or how the FDA confirmed that the CDC violated their own manufacturing standards. This whole meeting is a bit of a farce though, right? As every one of you, except Vice Mayor Weinroth and maybe Commissioner Valache, has indicated some publicly you're going to mandate masks here today. Does anyone care about the 888 petitions Palm Beach, resident, Palm Beach County residents collected in only five days? Or about the $5,000 I raised in 24 hours to file suit in Orange County yesterday? Or that four attorneys have co-signed a cease and desist letter on behalf of Palm Beach County residents and that we are intending on taking legal action against these unconstitutional mandates? Anyone care about actual data? or the governor's own words that masks should not be voluntary? You preach pseudoscience and safety. Does anyone care about preserving the liberty of the people who pay your salaries? Some of you are up there smirking and, and smiling at public comments to which you do not agree. I have the photos and they're shameful. So instead of citing my well-researched data lest I throw my pearls before swine, I'm choosing to use the remainder of my time to encourage Vice Mayor Weinroth, the only one up there who has had the guts to consistently speak freedom over fear. 
Vice Mayor, if you must stand alone, stand like the Navy Master Chief who stood alone in full dress blues on a North Carolina beach, resulting in the reopening of their beaches. If you must stand alone, stand like the salon owner in Texas whose unconstitutional arrest resulted- and your time has expired, and thank you for your comments here today. Thank you. We have Louis Louis Leo, Leo the fourth, followed by Melissa Martz, followed by Daniel. Good morning, Louis Leo the fourth, on behalf of the Florida Civil Rights Coalition. I'm not a medical professional, but I represent people who have been harmed by medical professionals, as well as government employees and officials. I've spent many years studying the harmful effects of CDC recommendations. You'll see signs around here that say vaccines are known to cause seizures, encephalitis, and autoimmunity. That's not my beliefs. Those are just facts, scientifically provable facts. So I encourage you to research, okay? By the looks of this chamber, it is clear that many have fallen for propaganda and pseudoscience. I think we need to learn about that. If we're gonna educate people, let's learn about pseudoscience. It's coming largely from unethical organizations who, have, who profit from sickness and eliminating not just civil rights, but human rights under the guise of disease prevention. If the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program has taught parents who are paying attention anything, it is that CDC recommendations can cause serious harm and even death. We have now seen reports of kids dying while exercising with facial coverings on. People have passed out while wearing masks driving and crashed their cars. If anyone, let alone a child, is injured or dies as a result of an unlawful countywide mask mandate, is the county, is the county attorney, are the officials in this room prepared for the legal consequences? That's a serious question. Are you prepared to face individual liability? Because you won't have qualified immunity, because you know what you're doing is wrong. Are you prepared to face that individual liability for the products you are mandating and deceptively marketing? Johns Hopkins University's recent study on medical errors has revealed that doctors and hospitals kill more than 250,000 Americans each year by mistake. Where's the chart on that? So while nobody in this room can prove scientifically that masks protect people from catching COVID and keeping in mind the fact that a goat and a fruit have tested positive for COVID, and many tests have been mysteriously contaminated by the CDC. The fact still remains that Americans are more likely to be killed by their doctor Sir, your or time struck has by expired. lightning than die from COVID-19. Counsel, your time has expired. Thank you. We have Melissa Martz, followed by Daniel, followed by Laurel Bennett. Hello, I would like to begin by sharing a childhood story that my mother would tell me over and over again. You may be familiar, it's called Pierre, written by Carol King. In that story, a young boy named Pierre would respond, I don't care, to everything his parents said. What would you like to eat, Pierre? He said, I don't care. Uh, where would you like to go, Pierre? I don't care. Finally, his parents left him alone, where a lion came by and said, may I eat you, Pierre? And Pierre said, I don't care. Uh, long and short of it is, Pierre decided to care after he was eaten by the lion. If you're not following the analogy here, the board members are the petulant boy named Pierre who refuses to care. Uh, Dr. Alonzo, we have requested many, many times to see the data that shows that masks are safe and that they will keep us protected from COVID. You have responded, I don't care. People have screamed, we are being discriminated against because it is unsafe for us to wear masks. And you have replied, I don't care. We have told you that you do not have the legal authority to implement a mandate like this. And you have said that you do not care. You stand to violate the constitutional rights of our officers, leaving them open to personal liability and the constitutional rights of our people, and you do not care. Mayor Kerner, you say that bad actors will be punished to the full extent of the law while never defining what a bad actor is. Sir, you are a bad actor and you do not care. Each of you elevates yourselves above the rest of us while you sit up there without your masks, communicating to us that you do not care. You have four law firms that have come together and are ready to, to defend against your tyranny, to, against your tyranny in a court of, court of law. The lion has come and he is asking, may I eat you? I am not surprised when you will respond that you do not care. Lastly, I want to declare and decree that the people will have the victory. We are insulated by our constitution. We are one nation under God and there will be justice for all. Thank you, ma'am, for your comments. We have Daniel followed by Laurel Bennett, followed by 
Talita. My name is Daniel Ruiz. I'm at your age, as you can see. I live around the world. I've faced many pandemics, many viruses my entire life. It's the first time I had to wear that because of you guys. Recently, I tried one, and it suffocated me. It doesn't allow me to breathe properly. It gave me headaches. I explained that when I was going through a particular store here, World Thrift, I said, I cannot wear that because it, it, it suffocates me. And they did not allow me to enter the store. So my question to you guys is, or to the police officer, if they call the police, are they going to arrest me for not wearing a mask? That's my question. Am I going to arrest, be arrested for not wearing a mask, even though I have a, a personal condition? What's your answer? Am I? Am I getting arrested? Finally, there is also a case I don't know if you guys are aware of. I got right here. This person passed away because of wearing a mask in New Jersey and committed a, um, a car accident. Right here, I give it to you guys. Okay, so who's responsible for this? You guys impose a mask on us. The question is, if somebody passes out in a Palm Beach store because of wearing a mask, are you the people to sue? Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your comments. Just one, one moment, ma'am. We have Laura Bennett, followed by Talita B, followed by Latressa A. Jones. I'm Laurel Bennett. I'm an engineer. I'm an M MBA with concentration in healthcare. I've worked as the OR analyst, and I've also worked a, as a project manager at the hospital. I run for Florida House of Representatives, District 18, or um, 86, and I'm in CD18. Surgeons do not wear their mask eight to 12 hours. I know this because I set up the OR scheduling. They do their surgeries based on what they do, what type of surgeries they're doing, and at what time they're allocated, and for what day. I know this because I set this up. So don't believe that they wear their mask for eight to 12 hours. The homeless people, stats show that it's only 0.04% that are infected, and they don't clean their hands daily like we do. It's long-term harm to people breathing their own CO2. And what is the stat showing for the wearing of the mask and how detrimental it is long-term? Well, we don't know that because no studies have been done. We've never come across this before. So I urge you to stop and think what you're doing as non-medical professionals mandating this mask. I expect you to jump actually onto things that are really matter. Never did I expect to go to the bank with, that, with the mask on and demand my money and then get away with it. <laughs> I never thought there would be a day that you could go to have your picture taken at the DMV with the mask on and it would be okay. It used to be a recommendation for sick people to wear the mask, not healthy people. If a mandating mask works, you know, sharing that six foot, then why do we need the mask? And if mask works, then why do we need to mandate the six feet difference? I'm just tired of this board and other boards, agencies, telling us and taking away our rights. It's okay to surf but not swim. That's on one post on a boat on a beach. It's okay to jog on the beach but you're not allowed to run. It's okay to riot and throw bricks and destroy buildings and churches, but you're not allowing us to go to church and peacefully attend mass. Ma'am, thank you for your comments, but your time has just expired. Think. We're just asking you to think and rethink yes, the stance. Thank you again for your thank comments you. here today. We have Talita B, followed by Latressa A. Jones, followed by Beth Bahor. I'm going to start with McKinley's post on social media on June 20th. You all can save a phone call. I support. We'll be voting yes on Tuesday. Thanks. On June 2nd, Mayor Kerner said, don't think that what you say here doesn't matter to us. There's some obvious disagreement on the public policy. Mayor Kerner, it's apparent that our voices do not matter to McKinley. My phone call doesn't matter to her. McKinley told Ms. Baker via Twitter, I see no need to delay a decision on mandating masks before public comment. She chose her side, the side of zero efficacy and of kindness. 
Mayor Kerner, you also said you don't, or, you don't encourage my neighbors to yell at me, be rude, or be mean to me as thought, as it was an opportunity to grow closer to, as a community. I personally have been yelled at, been refused to enter businesses, have had to file several ADA complaints. Masks do not bring people together. It's as divisive as race, education, class, religion, public, political identity, and masks were not even required. Mayor, you continue to say there's some obvious disagreement on the public policy. The disagreement is between the government having zero authority to manage my medical privacy, my medical and bodily autonomy, the signs of health risks from wearing masks, versus kindness. As Mayor Kerner said, the board has adopted the prevailing policy to stop the spread as an act of kindness. I'm strongly urging you all to put the stop to these new demands. As a medical professional with my master in health sciences, we cannot tell a patient what to do with their body. Yet this council is overreaching their public roles. It makes no sense that a government county council imposes what a living person does with their body. You have no right. Any state of emergency code of ordinance does not supersede our constitutional rights. As per the privacy clause of Florida Article 1, Section 23, this council has no right to manage my medical privacy or medical or bodily autonomy. This council is approving orders based on kindness rather than the health risks associated with wearing masks and our constitutional rights. Keep your kindness and keep the wording to strongly urge. And Ms. Baker, why don't you get a lesson from Dr. Alonzo on how to fix your mask? Thank you, ma'am, for your comments. Spray. We on. have Latressa A. Jones, followed by Beth Bahor, followed by, I, I believe it's, I, I, it's hard, COP may be the last name, K-O-P-P, -P -P. I'm not sure if it's Dale or, Dan. okay, perfect. I'm not Dale, I'm Latressa Jones. Um, and I'm here to speak on behalf of these masks. I am a fourth generation black American and my ancestors built this country. And Mr. Bernard, we built a country that allowed your ancestors to come over here and follow the rules as well. My concern is this, everybody talking about lives matter, guess what, when you start, the intent is always not to find people, but the black people go get, find more, stop by the police as well, more than anybody else. It always happened. You see, my grandmother died at 122, and the law was legal for us to be called slaves in America. This is a fact. I have a problem because guess what? Our kids are getting shot up just as much as these numbers you put up here. Chicago, shot, and ain't nobody doing nothing. I want to see y'all get up and start serving the people. And each and every one of you will not be re-elected to these seats if you think you're going to continue to take these young black kids and use them to your, as pawns on the table. And Mr. C Mr. Uh, what's your name again over there, Bernard? Weren't you out there protesting with all those children? All those kids down there in Miami did not have one mask on. Y'all put those kids down there. It's the difference between a protester and a rioter. So guess what? You take me as a mad ass black mama and a grandmama. Cause this day in this country, Guess what? And when I wear my mask, you better be able to defend them, because I got a Second Amendment right. I'm Latresa Jones. Facts. Thank you, ma'am, for your comments. We have Beth Bahor, followed by, I, I can't pronounce it, it's K-O-P-P, -P, maybe the last name followed by Dr. Allison Rampersad. Ma'am, you have two minutes. Okay, thanks. It's Bohan. Don't call me a whore. Please forgive me. <laughs> um, just a couple points. I had something kind of written out, but as I was taking notes. Um, the median range of testing positive has dropped to 35 in this community. That's fantastic. Herd immunity is what we need. This will go on forever. This is a virus. This isn't going to go away. Even if we get a vaccine, only 40% of people get the flu vaccine. You're not going to be able to do that. People are going to refuse the vaccine. The New England Journal of Medicine, the New England Journal of Medicine states this. 
We know the wearing a mask outside healthcare facilities offers little, if any, protection from infection. Public health authorities define a significant exposure to COVID-19 as face-to-face -face contact within six feet with a patient with symptomatic COVID-19 that is sustained for at least a few minutes and say more than 10 minutes or even 30 minutes. The chance of catching COVID-19 from passing interaction in a public space is therefore minimal. In many cases, the desire for widespread masking is a reflexive reaction to anxiety over the pandemic. That's the Journal of Medicine. Somebody was talking about not quoting who because they, oh, they've been kind of wishy-washy. You are, yourselves are quoting the CDC who has been just as wishy-washy, if not more so than the who. And you are still quoting them and saying that they, you should wear a mask. That is actually not what they're saying. Um, let me see. Uh, please remember, Dr. Alonzo stated that the deaths were real people. Please remember, we are real living people. We do not want to wear these masks. I have been working as an essential worker since this began. I have not worn a mask. This is the mask that I wore today to get in here. This is the, this is the mask that you say is okay to come in here. This is the mask I wore in here today. This is my homemade mask that your official said is okay to wear. This is insane. This is insane. Ma'am, thank you for your comments today. And I just, on, on, at the end, I don't wear a mask for the same reason I don't un wear underwear. Things gotta breathe. <laughs> thank you for your comments, ma'am. Sir, you're recognized for two minutes. Good morning, Can you I'm I'm Dr. Daniel Tapp. I'm a board certified surgeon. That's why you can't read my name. Sorry. Okay. I am the author of the federal regulations that created the Emergency Operations Center for Palm Beach County. I wrote them. That's what I did before I became a surgeon. Today, I wear a mask eight to 12 hours a day, five to seven days a week, depending upon what I do. And let me discuss some facts with you. Number one, masks do not inhibit carbon dioxide in the blood. In fact, our bodies, if we have normal, healthy kidneys and lungs, they regulate the carbon dioxide in our blood, not masks. We use carbon dioxide to treat COVID patients. It's called permissive hypercapnia, oxygen concentration. The oxygen concentration in Leadville, Colorado, which is at 10,000 feet, is a lower oxygen concentration than is caused by wearing a mask all day. The United States Supreme Court has already ruled on public health matters. Johnson versus Massachusetts, 115 years ago. You need to do the right thing. Regardless of what public opinion is, this is a public health issue. Based on the velocity of viral spread in three weeks, my wife, who's a critical care doctor, will not be at home. She will be at work 24 hours a day. And if we don't slow the spread, even a fraction, we are going to end up in a situation where there will be no room for you at the inn, the ICU. Let me explain this to you. 15% of the people in this community are going to need the hospital. 10% of those people in the community, or two thirds of the people in the hospital will go home. One third of the people who go to the hospital are getting a zippered bag. That's what they're going home in. That's the numbers from New York. That's the numbers from Wuhan, China. That's the numbers from Italy. We need to do what's right and in the best interest of the people. There are six doctors in Northern Palm Beach County who quit working. Did you know that? Quit. Two pulmonologists, two GI doctors, a nephrologist. You didn't know that. Why did they quit? Because they don't want to die. Act responsibly. Thank you, doctor, for your comments here today. We have Dr. Allison Rempersad, followed by Sandra Gaines, followed by David Shiner. Good morning, commissioners. Um, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm here today as a business owner. Um, I don't own a nightclub. I own a firearms business. Now, I think you might agree with me that it would be ludicrous for me to allow someone into my shop to purchase a firearm who's wearing a mask, whose face I cannot see. And I, don't, and I think that there's not a, 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 a law enforcement officer in this room who wouldn't agree with me. Um, in this day of lawlessness where really with everyone's wearing a, wearing a mask, you can't tell who are the good guys and who are the bad guys, there's no way in hell that I'm letting somebody into my shop wearing a mask that I cannot identify. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. 
We have Sandra Gaines followed by David Shiner followed by Megan Bell. Hi, um, my name is Sandra Gaines. Um, I had a lot of notes and I stayed up most of last night trying to make notes about what I wanted to say today. But having been in this room this morning, it's a disgrace and I wanna change all that I was going to say and just say one few things. The reason that I wanted to come is because I heard the mayor in a news conference the other day make a statement when he was asked by someone in the audience whether he felt it was time to take more caution or put more things in place to try to stop what's going on. And his answer, which is why I'm here and why a lot of my friends encouraged me to come, was you can't put milk back in a bottle. What the heck does that mean? Does that mean the horse is out of the barn and you can't put it back? Does that mean that you can't pull the reins in right now and stop what's going on? I've never been to a commission meeting before and I didn't realize that a whole entire group of people who don't care about wearing masks, so they didn't care about getting together, meeting with one another, hugging each other out in the lobby, maybe passing this disease around. They didn't care about that. So they were able to get all together. What should happen is at the door, when you're gonna take a vote like this, there's a whole lobby full of people out there that are what mask wearing supporters. They couldn't get in here because this was all filled up by this one contingency of people. Nobody's mentioned death. I've lost a son to this disease. I lost a grandmother and a grandfather to this disease. And I have three people on respirators right now. It's real. Thank you, ma'am, for your comments today. Thank you for hearing me. We have David Shiner, followed by Megan Bell, followed by Joanne Maltese. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Shiner. I'm running for County Commission District 5. I've actually never been to a commission meeting before, but I thought that this was important. I've got two young children. Uh, they go to public school, and I live over in uh, West Del Rey. I don't really want to go ahead and make any points here. I just want to ask some questions to the commission. I've noticed, and a lot of people have said the same thing, that a lot of the commissioners up here are wearing or not wearing their masks. How is that setting a good example in leadership if you're going to now pass something? What I've also noticed, and I can attest to this, I actually gave my blood in a uh, yearly physical. My carbon dioxide was high because the Quest Lab made me wear a mask for 30 minutes. I'll be more than happy to share my blood results with you. I feel that I'm an in-shape young man and I should not have had high carbon dioxide. How am I going to go to the gym and work out in a gym? What you're going to do by forcing gyms to require people to wear masks is not be able to keep their health up. What are the long-term implications? Specifically for my own children, who are seven and nine, the psychological impact that this has had. I don't think anyone's asking those questions for the children. And that is the future of what we are in this society. I can tell you I'm in my 40s and looks like most of the people up there in the commission are just as, my, as old as me, maybe even older. And I'll tell you, by the way, I've gotten a little insulted. They're not called elderly people, they're senior citizens. They've served this country well. We call them senior citizens. But at the end of the day, to force people to now have to wear masks, well, that's the decision that the commission will make. Seems like a lot of people have already made up their minds. But at the end of the day, I need them to understand what is the impact psychologically to the children. And if you're going to force people to do it, think about this, the impact of the police. If you're now gonna have police officers enforcing these rules, We've already seen that there's calls to defund the police. There's already a divide being driven between good citizens and the police. And now asking police officers to issue civil citations or potentially arrest people, how is that going to show well to the rest of the community? Again, David Shiner, thank you for your time. And I hope whatever your decision is, it's the right one. Thank you, Councilor, for your comments here today.
please uh, don't interrupt the proceedings. We have Megan Bell, followed by Joanne Maltese, followed by Butch Diaz. Ms. Bell, you're recognized for two minutes. Thank you so much. And I'm back here again. I was here last week speaking on behalf of the 900 people that had signed my petition. And this week, I'm speaking on behalf of the over 3,000 people that have signed it. So Palm Beach County overwhelmingly supports a mask mandate. Um, and I appreciate your bravery in taking on this very contentious issue. Um, and I'm speaking for all of those people. I encourage them not to come to the meeting with me because I wanted them to stay home and stay safe. So I'm here on behalf of them. We know that mandatory masking works. We've seen it work in other communities. We know that it stops the spread of COVID. We are at a crisis point. As Dr. Alonzo has pointed out, the numbers this week are much worse and they're going to continue to get worse unless we take action. So uh, in regards to the 30 days uh, to limit this mask wearing, I would ask that the council not do that because as uh, Dr. Alonzo pointed out, there's a significant lag between when uh, a, a policy gets mandated and when we can see the results in terms of hospitalizations and death rates. So I would ask that you do not put a 30 day limit on it because it would not give us enough time to see if the mask mandate was properly effective or if more measures were needed. And lastly, I'm gonna speak on behalf of a friend who's homesick with COVID. She said she did not wear her mask for one day at the beach and a friend who was asymptomatic infected her and 15 other people. And she said, please go there and tell them that I didn't wear a mask because I saw so many other people without a mask on, I forgot I was in the middle of a pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your comments here today. Um, let me remind the crowd that please, everyone has been very respectful during this process to allow people with opposing viewpoints to speak without interruption. I'd ask that we continue that courtesy. Ma'am, you're recognized for two minutes. We have Joanne, hold on one second. Joanne Maltese, followed by Butch Diaz, followed by Jane Justice. Okay, I understand that you're trying to keep us all safe, and I do appreciate that, but you know, there's overwhelming data right here, what everybody's saying. There is no data to support if you wear a mask, you're gonna slow the spread of the COVID-19. So if you had that data, then I would be more likely to want to wear a mask. Um, masks are meant to be worn for sick people. And they are also meant to be disposed of, not to keep wearing the same mask, which is what people are doing. And you're more likely, I know a lot of these have already been spoken about, but this is what I had in my notes. You're more likely to touch your face more often, which is spreading the germs. Um, also, we are a nation of shared values, of freedom, liberty, equality. We are home of the free, land of the brave. This is America, as someone else spoke. This is not Cuba. We are not in a communist nation. Okay, the Declaration of Independence, our rights as Americans, is we have the freedom to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, According to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, liberty is the power to do as one pleases, to live my life in the way I want to without interference from others or authorities. Also, it is the freedom from physical restraint. The masks are a physical restraint, which once again have not proven to spread or not spread the disease. Okay, also according to Merriam-Webster, it is the power of choice. That's what liberty is. We are a land of home of the brave, land of the free. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your comments. We One have second, Butch sir. Diaz, followed by Jane Justice, followed by Matt Milligan. Sir, you're recognized for two minutes. Okay. My name is Butch, and I'm an American patriot. See that flag? I would die for that flag. The Constitution that you are supposed to uphold I would die for that. None of you are holding that up. You don't care about we the people because you already made your decision before you listened to anybody. You already made a decision. Shameful. Okay, you did not listen to we the people. I would die for that country. I would die for the Constitution. And you know what? You disgrace me. You know why? You did not listen to we the people. You made your decision. Okay, what are you gonna do to have the police? I thank every officer that's here. Man, I applaud him. But what's gonna happen when you get the call to defund the police? Who's gonna do that? Who's gonna take and arrest these people for wearing a stupid mask? What are you gonna do? 
When you get that call, oh, we got to defund the police. We got to get rid of them. What are you going to do? How are you going to put the people down? You're not listening to we the people. No. You made your decision before. You probably already have your orders already taken care of. Who you don't really care. You could at least listen. At least faked it. But you know, you already made a decision. You do not care about we the people. Isn't that the truth? That's a, so okay. true. It's pathetic. Breaks my heart. Because I would die for that flag. I would die for this country, and I would die for the Constitution. And you guys are supposed to uphold the Constitution, and you know what? You didn't. You let we the people down. Thank you, sir, for your comments. We have Jane Justice, followed by Matt Milligan, followed by Steve Lyles. Ms. Justice, you recognize for two minutes. Yes. I so appreciate all the patriots that showed up and all the truth, all the truth that's come out, all the statistics, all the stuff about health. It is so true that you, you have made up your minds, and I want to know who is getting paid off and where is this higher mandate coming from? Our police officers who, who are putting their lives on the line every day, you want them to wear a mask? You want no oxygen going into their brain when they might have to get down and wrestle with somebody? What the hell is going on in this country? You, you, you think it's okay? Let everybody out of prison? And, and, when, and I was just going to say, when are you going to start with the de defund the police? Because we know whose side you're on. It is so true that you made up your minds. You made up your minds. Shame on you. That's right, we have rights, and this has just gone too far. I have to leave, I sat in here, this is the third day I'm here waiting all day. I have to leave a 91-year-old mother to come here and stand up for what's right. Shame on you, shame on you, the little children, all the testimony that we heard. Let me tell you one thing real quick before you cut me off. I heard somebody say, we're not sure about anything. That was you, doctor. We're not sure about the facts yet. You heard all the facts. You're not sure about the facts. Guess what? We're not sure about everything. I also heard you say here today that uh, th it's spreading. Well, guess what? The riots are spreading too. And what the hell are we going to do about that? We're going to arrest patriots. We're going to arrest people for not wearing a mask. That's what you want when you allow this stuff to go on in this country, we know which side you're on, okay? It's all coming from the top. This is all bullshit. And I say Trump 2020, and I hope every one of you gets voted out who votes for a mask here today. Shame on you for voting for a mask. Thank you, ma'am. Your time has expired. And I also heard you say this is a democracy, and I'm sick and tired of hearing you say that. It's a republic. And my name is Jane Justice, and I want to see you. some of it. Thank you, Ms. Justice, for your comments today. We have Matt Milligan, followed by Stephen Lyles, followed by Whitney Briggs. Yeah, sir. sir, you recognize for two minutes. Thanks. Uh, I'm Matt Milligan. I'm from Boca Raton. Uh, could, say, could you stand just a little bit closer? We're having a hard time here. Sorry. I'm Matt Milligan. I'm from Boca Raton. Uh, I stand firmly against this mask requirement. Uh, I feel it is my right over my body. You're not medical professionals. I didn't choose you to be medical professionals. I chose you to run in government to take care of the roads and the infrastructure, and that's purely it. I didn't ask for you to come into my life. I didn't ask for you to destroy my my friends and neighbors' businesses for the last three months with your mandatory shutdowns with no financial aid or no nothing going on to help these people out. I've watched businesses be shut and have nothing. My friends that live in parts of Lake Worth that a lot of you wouldn't dare, dare go into, losing their jobs, and then you're telling them they have to watch their kids. Well, who's going to watch their kids when they do go back to work because the schools aren't open? I feel it's appalling that you guys could sit here and say that you have a right over somebody else's voice, over their freedom, over their body, and I don't think it's right. I think what this country is built on is options of choice. If you want to wear a mask, go wear a mask. If you want to run a business with masks, wear masks. But do not put it on the business owners. Don't put it on the police. Don't put it on the individuals who still want a right to be able to use their choice and their voice to have a better change in their life. My grandma is 88 years old, lives on her own. Her sister's 90, lives on her own. You know what they do? They put on some gloves and a mask, 
but they ain't staying home. The last thing they want to do is stay home. You want to know why? Because the only thing they live for is to go volunteer and hang out and see their friends. You guys are scaring them into staying home, being depressed, having tons of problems. And if you want to talk about our elder, elderly community within Palm Beach who I care for, many people are my friends and people that I work with, you're telling them to give up on life. Well, life isn't about safety. It's about living, okay? We're not going to sit around and wait for you guys to decide when and how I can go about my life and feed my children. Thank you, sir, for your comments today. We have Stephen Lyles followed by Whitney Briggs, followed by Kirk Grantham. Okay, Whitney Briggs, followed by Kirk Grantham, followed by Christian Wolf. Hello there, my name is Whitney Briggs. Um, I'm about facts, I'm about research, I'm about getting down to kind of the nitty gritty and, and leaving opinions aside. So <clears throat> I wanna talk about the inflated numbers by the CDC. Right now we're looking at 0.26% death rate. So 99.74% of people are recovering from COVID. And that is also with the fact that um, many of these states are not allowing hydrochloroquine protocols to be used, so they're automatically being put on ventilators, which when you're getting put on a ventilator, you have about a 70, 70 to 90% chance of, of dying. Um, on top of that, we know that many are acquiring COVID in hospitals. We know that the testing is flawed, up to 50% inaccuracy. We know that there was a president in Tanzania who tested a papaya, and that came up positive. So we know that from a fact standpoint, we've got, we've got some things missing here and some things are not adding up as far as the numbers go. But even with the 0.26% with the inflated numbers, we also know some things about masks. And 95 respirators filter out most airborne particles, down to 0.3 microns in diameter. However, the coronavirus itself measures between 0.05 and 0.2 microns. Therefore, N95s do not protect against the coronavirus. I wanted to cite just a little bit of science as far as studies go. Um, I had multiple studies, but I know I only have a, a, a few minutes. So there was a study that was done where they found no significant difference between N95 uh, respirators and surgical masks in associated risk of laboratory confirmed respiratory infection, influenza like, -like illness, or reported workplace absenteeism. So it didn't, it didn't uh, support the narrative that a mask will, will support not getting sick. There was another study that was done and found respiratory infection was much higher among workers wearing cloth masks. The penetration of a cloth mask, uh, which in my opinion has been what's been projected into society to wear. I know Fauci and Burks has been saying that we need to leave the surgical masks and N95 masks for our medical care providers. So you see many people with the cotton masks. Um, and we know that 97% of the particles are not being filtered out through those cloth masks. It's something to consider. Um, there. I know you don't want us to cite the WHO based on what you had said, but as some other people had, had said um, in the past as they were speaking, where's the general public supposed to go for information when we're being told, well, CDC is not really right, the WHO is not really right. Your time has expired. Thank you for your comments here today. We have Kirk Grantham followed by Christian Wolf, followed by Kateria Robinson. Okay. No Kirk Grantham. Christian Wolf. Kateri Robinson. Sabrina George. Some of the people may be outside. There are speakers outside, so if anybody hears their name, uh, you, it is your time to come to public comment. We will recall your name. If you do show up, we'll allow you to speak. Kateri Robinson, Sabrina George, and Jack Lord. Does that complete uh, public comment cards, Mr. Commissioner Bernard? Those are all the comment cards, Mr. One for Dr. Robert Pinsker that was filled out and received as the entry. Dr. Robert Pinsker. Yeah. You're recognized for two minutes. I did do And it's possible that we, we don't have your card, doctors, so if you um, could assist us in. I'm a PhD, I'm not, a, not an MD. I'm sorry? I'm a PhD, not an MD. Either way, if you could help us fill out a comment card, we'd appreciate I did. it. Okay. Yeah, it was turned in. Yeah, my card was well, turned in. You're recognized for two minutes, sir. Uh, before I begin, I will say my poster boards were taken away from me, so I don't have the big statistics with me. Okay. Uh, there were no curse words, right? It was just statistics. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, I am a PhD with over 40 published articles. To be clear, the views expressed are my own and not of any employer. According to the May 22nd CDC report, see my big poster board, his best estimate model reveals symptomatic carriers have an overall fatality rate of 0.4 percent, that is 0.4 percent, with any symptoms. Those aged 0 to 49 have a case fatality rate equal to 5 one hundredths of a percent, that's most of us. Individuals aged 65 plus have a case fatality rate of 1.3 percent. This is available on the CDC's website, and note this is the data the CDC is using for planning strategies for all federal government agencies. I have reported. Sir, sir, can one. I pause you for just one second? I apologize, but I want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to, to hear your comments. And My clock has been running. Well, here. we're going to stop it in just a moment. We need to resolve the situation here, and then I need folks to take their seats because it's difficult to hear the, the testimony. I do have all the supporting research with me. Very good, sir. Can I get the. Uh, you have 10 an seconds additional five back? seconds, and your time starts now. Okay, in a randomized cl clinical trial, which as we know is the standard for research, not observation, the McIntyre et al. 2015 journal PubMed said cloths uh, unable to filter the 97% of particles and said that facial coverings uh, should not be used. Cloths face facial coverings should not be used. In the 2020 New England Journal of Medicine uh, by Klompas et al. said the authors argue for increased hand hygiene, which is sanitizer and washing hands, which we all do when we're sick, right? And conclude that facial coverings serve symbolic roles. Uh, two meta-analyses, 2017 and 2012, find very significant protective effect for hygiene hand washing and no significant p positive protective effect of using facial coverings, uh, i.e. N95s. Uh, moving on to the risks, uh, they date back to a 1966 U.S. Department of Interior. This is not a new thing uh, about CO2 rebreathing. There is a 2013 Smith et al. ergonomics study that says facial coverings result in symptoms of discomfort, fatigue, dizziness, headache, muscular weakness, and drowsing, uh, drowsiness. 2010, Roberge et al. Respira in Respirator Care magazine said uh, N95 usage found CO2 levels ranging from 2.5 to 3.5 percent, significantly above OSHA's ambient workplace standards. Keep in mind that CO2 in the environment is 0.3 percent. In a 2005 clinical trial, Kyle notes that wearing N95 results in abnormally low oxygen and blood and buildup in CO2 bloodstream, which reduces working efficiency and the ability to make correct decisions. Uh, two other studies, in 2014 and 2005, both suggest nasal cavity physiological changes wearing N95 and surgical face masks with statistically significant heart rate thermal stresses. N95 has a higher inside uh, facial covering rates in absolute humidity, heat, breath resistance, and discomfort. There's more than a minimal risk Doctor, of wearing any facial coverings. Uh, actually, uh, no, facial actually, your coverings time has here. expired, and, and we appreciate your comments here today. It hasn't today. even gone to the suicide rates and other mental in, mental illness that need to be considered. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Including my daughters being afraid to go to school from all this. All right. Thank you for your for your comments here today, ma'am. I'm I'm going to warn you one one more time. I, we've been very accommodating in public comment today, and we've had a very robust discussion. We have no more cards, and no one else is asked to. No one else has asked to speak in public comment. Ma'am, ma'am. Public comment has closed. The item before the board. Ma'am, you are disrupting this meeting. Now, that's the third warning I've given you personally. I would like for you to have the opportunity to see how this issue is adjudicated because you're very passionate about this issue. Absolutely. I appreciate your cooperation and your passion. The motion is pending before the board. We can receive and file those without objection. Please give it to the clerk. Do any of my colleagues on the board have any comments or questions prior to voting on the pending motion? The motion has been made by Commissioner Weiss and seconded by Commissioner Bernard. Vice Mayor Weinroth, you recognize. Then we will go to Commissioner Valachet. Thank you, Mayor. And I think that it is unfair for people to think that there's an element of arrogance up here or that there are bad actors. I think everybody has been very receptive and has listened. And notwithstanding where the vote goes eventually, I think you can be sure that we're hearing what's going on out there. We hear not only from you, we've been watching our emails. And this is certainly an issue that we all take very seriously. So I, again, you know, this is a decision that frankly could have been made by the EPG and we made the decision to bring this forward in a public hearing so that we would have the opportunity to hear your input today. So please understand that, again, your input has been a part of this discussion. 
One of the things that is of concern to me, and it's been pointed out many times today that I've been resisting the idea of mandatory masks. And when we were talking today, Dr. Alonzo, in your presentation when you talked about what's next, the things that we're talking about, I think that are most necessary are enforcing the str strong and steady social distancing strategy, continuing the testing, both viral and antibody testing, to include asymptomatic and vulnerable populations along with education and contact testing. More public messaging, and we talked about that last meeting, we have a real obligation to put out strong messaging as far as what needs to be done. The officials need to adjust the public activities based on viral load. What we saw today from the videos that Commissioner Weiss brought forward were inexcusable. And that, notwithstanding anything that we do here today, needs to be stopped. And we need to take strict enforcement actions. And we do need to begin preparing for November when the flu season is going to coincide with COVID-19. And as we've said here today, the goal has always been to encourage citizens to be responsible, to take the actions that are necessary to stem the spread of this virus, and to keep our businesses alive. What we've done here, we took a, a real gamble, and a lot of us were really torn about the idea of reopening businesses. And we made that decision consciously knowing that there was going to be some increase in the amount of the virus in our neighbors and in our neighborhood and in our community. We need to work on stemming this from turning into something of a wildfire and requiring that at some point we shut down the economy again. Nobody wants to be in that position. I know our businesses are in a situation right now where they can barely, barely stay open. At 50%, most of our restaurants are losing money. Most of our businesses are terribly financially impaired. And so everything we're gonna do here today is with the idea of keeping people healthy and keeping people so they can put food on the table and so that we can be a community again when this thing is over. And let's hope that this thing is over sooner not later. I hate the idea of talking about mandatory face coverings. And I really, it, it goes against my grain and, and I said the last meeting, and it, I was picked apart about it, that I think that it's, it's a mistake. But I'm, the, the numbers that we saw this week were just out of this world. And please, I'm going to make a motion to substitute for Commissioner Weiss's motion and put some caveats on this, and hopefully I can get the rest of the board here to embrace it. Number one, I do think we need to sunset this at 30 days, which doesn't mean it goes away at 30 days because right now emergency orders sunset every week. And our mayor has been executing that order on a weekly basis as necessary. So it doesn't mean it goes away, but I think that we need to be looking at this and make sure that there is a reason to be doing what we're doing here. I agree with Commissioner McKinley. This needs to be a civil citation. I do not want to put our law enforcement personnel in the position of having to drag someone to jail. This is not the way that we want our community to act. And I feel that a civil citation, just the same way as we treat a speeder, is the way to go. And I think that we need to keep this for the interiors of buildings open to the public. I have a great deal of difficulty 
and we can wordsmith this. Obviously, if you're queuing into a building, then there needs to be social distancing. But I don't think that we need to have face coverings on the beach or on the playgrounds or when we're outside. So I'm going to offer a substitute. And, and you know, obviously, you've read the papers. So you know that there is a majority on this dais here that feels very strongly that they, we need to mandate. And I'm hoping that I can get a buy-in to these, this motion to, this, to substitute with these so that I can embrace what this board wants to go forward with. A substitute motion has been put forth by the vice mayor. Is there a second? There's a second by Commissioner Valache. Uh, Commissioner Weiss's motion has been substituted with the amendments as sudden setting in 30 days limited to civil citation, limited to interior for buildings uh, open to the public. Commissioner Valache, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, I certainly support the term and the other provisions that uh, Vice Mayor Weinroth suggested. I would also add, and I think we have to be careful about exempting medical conditions, so that language should be, I think, an important part of this, because the last thing we want to do is people that genuinely can't wear a mask, we don't want to get them in a situation where they could be cited. Um, so there's going to be, have to be some care, almost like when we d decided between essential and non-essential businesses in terms of what medical conditions would exempt you from, um, you know, from wearing a mask. But as the vice mayor said, I just wanted to reemphasize, you know, this I, the reason I brought this up at first is because some of these EOs and various other things have a tendency to just run on unless we're forced to, and I mean forced, by you know having to reauthorize this, unless we're forced to look at this again. So Dr. Alonso last week when we were talking, I think suggested a 30-day period of slowing down. Remember we talked about that a bit. Um, you know, you wanted to see how, before we went into phase two, you wanted to perhaps take yes, 30 days. So I think that, that two. Yes. would apply equally to this as well as, you know, the phase two. Although I think, I think with masks, I think we should be able to go into phase two um, with a lot of confidence uh, should the governor decide that. But anyway, um, you know, I think 30 days, we can reauthorize this as many times as we want, but we'll be forced to look at the data, um, you know, in the run-up to that 30-day period before we have to vote on this again. And I, I strongly support that. Thank you, Commissioner Valachet, and I will represent to you having reviewed the orders from Miami, Dade, and Broward that we will be um, paralleling that there are accommodations for both ADA and religious exemptions. So that's contained within Vice Mayor Weinross pending motion. Commissioner Weiss, you recognize, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, first off, the folks that are here understand um, I read your emails, I listen to your voicemails, and I'm listening to you today. And we are, we're, we're coming up on a different side on this, but it's not because I don't care about you and I don't and I'm not listening to you, but I am concerned about the health of this community. And unfortunately, this virus chose to come now. It didn't, we didn't pick it, it picked us. And the most important thing is for government is the health and the welfare of our people, there's nothing more important than their safety. I was able to look at the data that came in from yesterday. Another 284 cases in Palm Beach County, a positivity rate of 10.7 percent. We are, we are continuing to move in the wrong direction and we have to take um, action. And I appreciate your comments, um, Vice Mayor Weinroth. I don't think 30 days, I think that's too soon. I don't want to, I think there's an opportunity. This, if, if, 
and I hope I'm wrong. I hope in 30 days everything is under control and the numbers have been tamped down. But I'd rather uh, set the expectation of what's happened. I think that's part of the problem we had when we got started. We set the expectation that you know, we were going we to close everything down, and I think people thought the virus was just going to go away, and that didn't happen. It wasn't going to happen, and we set that expectation incorrectly. The expectation is we have to learn to live with this virus, and the way we live with the virus is by physical distancing, and when we're not able to physical distance, we have to find some other barrier, and the barrier that's being recommended is by wearing a face covering so that we, when we breathe or we speak or we do anything, that, that those particles don't fall far away from us, that, they come, that they're kept very close to us so that we don't infect other people. I, I, think that, um, I think a more reasonable approach would be to set this, and I would be willing, I, personally I thought we should go for uh, a year, but I'd be willing to set it for four months. Please, please do not interrupt. Please, folks, please let's adjudicate Monroe, this issue. Mon I, Monroe County went and put theirs in for a year. I would think four months, excuse me, um, four, four months would be an appropriate, would be an appropriate amount so, uh, of time. We can always rescind. If, if you're interrupting this proceedings and the interruption is deliberate, so I'll be removing you from the, co the commission chambers in just a moment if the interruption continues. If I would rather, I would rather put this in the hands of the EPG if there is an opportunity to, re to rescind this sooner, then, then so be it. But I, I would, I want to, um, to have to go through this every 30 days, I think it is asking a lot. F I mean, and I understand there were a lot of people who would not come here today because it's not healthy. It was not safe for them to come. And I don't think it's right to, um, that we have to ask them again to weigh on, in on this uh, if, in fact, the numbers don't justify it. So I, I would rather that we extend this out in, I think, a four-month period of time. So I'd like to make that amendment. Oh, substitute motion. This is a final substitute motion under the rules. Are you, are you um, mirroring the present substitute motion by Vice Mayor Weinroth with the amendment that it be four months? And, and also that it also includes uh, the requirement, if you're not, not able to socially distance out in public, that you, you are then uh, required to wear a mask. So, um, okay. So those are the two amendments. Those are my two amendments to the substitute motion. There's a second to this substitute substitute motion. Second. There's a second by Commissioner Bernard. Continuing into public comment, Commissioner or a uh, Commissioner comment, Commissioner McKinley, you recognized. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was hoping what we could do is the same way we extend our executive orders and just have the executive policy committee opt to extend that every 30 days. Once we've given that mandate, they, they know what our intent is. So I'm a little hesitant about approving something today for the next four months, um, but that's the motion on the table. I it just can be amended say, by the motion maker. Sorry to interrupt, Commissioner McKinney. Um, just want to say that uh, uh, my office had, a, as of 4 p.m. yesterday, 159 total calls, 143 in favor of masks, 17 opposed to masks. Um, 10, as best we can tell, came from my district. Emails as of 8 a.m. this morning, 1,205. We had. Weekend. I'm sorry. Um, well, I, I'm really tired of these interruptions. You've given you enough warning. Yeah. I, Let, I let's vote on. Let's, yeah. I understand. Let's try to adjudicate this issue, and we'll take a recess. Thank you, because I think we, we were very polite in listening to public comment, and uh, the same respect should be reciprocal. 1,205 total emails, 1,016 in favor of masks, 189 opposed to masks. Um, I want to thank uh, the Florida Legislature and the U.S. Congress for requiring uh, my teenagers to wear a seatbelt in a car. I'd like to thank them for requiring me to put my infants in infant carriers when they were under the age of 12 months. 
I would like to thank them for requiring me to put them in booster seats until they were five years old in the state of Florida. I want to thank them uh, that my kids couldn't buy alcohol until they were 21 years old. I want to thank them that they changed the laws and they can't buy cigarettes or vaping devices now until they're 21 years old. I want to thank them for speed limits so I don't drive like a bat out of hell on I-95. All of those measures that are in place to keep me safe, to keep my family safe. Um, I also really want to thank them. God brought me into this world. Uh, we, we speak of a lot of religion today, but God brought me into this world naked. And I'd like to thank the, the lawmakers of this country for requiring me to wear clothes in public. And I think you'll all agree that you're thankful for that. Um, so th this idea that we are somehow trampling the US Constitution doesn't resonate with me. What we're, we're obligated, both at the federal, the state, and the local level, to implement measures to protect the health and safety and welfare of the public. And I'm sorry that we disagree with a small minority of you on how to handle that. We have listened. We have listened. And yes, like many topics that come before this board, um, you know, some that I've worked with on people in this audience, you should know before I walk into this chamber that if there's an issue related to human trafficking and protecting victims, I'm going to support it. You should know that walking in, if there's an effort to provide substance abuse treatment in this county, I'm going to support it. You should know that if there's an issue that provides services to victims of sexual assault, I'm going to support it. If it's affordable housing, I'm likely to support it. You know, I was very clear coming into this that I support a mask measure. You know, the comments that are provided in a public setting like this are to change my mind. And I listened very quietly without opinion to every single one of your comments today. And unfortunately, you have not changed my mind. I'm not completely in favor of a four month uh, review, but that's the motion on the table and I will be supporting it today. Thank you, Thank Commissioner you. McKinley. Commissioner Weiss, did you want to make any mo amendments to your motion? No. Okay. Commissioner Valache, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to point out, you know, we've talked about a recurrence of this in the fall, and if we go out four months, that takes us to the end of October. The flu season starts about the end of October, the beginning of November. So, you know, we might have to impose it again. And I, I just, you know, that in effect, you know, four months is getting very close to being a, a one-year mandate um, if, if things come to that. I don't think we can predict how the virus is going to behave over the, neck, over the summer. Um, we might see, with mask wearing, a, a big diminution of cases, um, say, by the end of July. And yet we're stuck with uh, a mask mandate for an additional three months when it's not necessary. So although I'd like to support uh, wearing masks and, and a mandate, I'm prepared to do that. I'm not prepared to um, go out four months. I think Commissioner McKinley maybe should have followed through with her idea that the EOs can be extended uh, by the EPG. Um, or, but I, I really seriously don't think we should be putting a, a, a term that long on this without knowing, with, with no knowledge, um, and the virus is unpredictable, with no knowledge of what the situation is going to be like that, be like two or three months from now. Um, you know, I, I think it should just be an EO then, like the other ones, and we have the ability to come back and uh, terminate it when we feel it's appropriate. Commissioner Valachie, I think Commissioner Weiss um, may, may have some amendments, and uh, just to clarify, it would not be. Um, the potential amendment wouldn't reference EPG, it would be, it would house the authority directly in the county administrator. And, and bear in mind that any member of this Board of County Commissioners can at any time in public hearing um, make a motion to repeal the, uh, the, this through direction to the county administrator. Commissioner Weiss, you're, re you're recognized, unless Commissioner Valachie had any other comments. Uh, go ahead. 
Commissioner Weiss, you recognized. Yeah, so I, I would, I would uh, go ahead and amend my motion to allow this to be uh, vested in, in the administrator. And as you said, it could be brought back uh, if need be. Very good. Board could bring it back. Very good. So the amendment to the substitute substitute motion re re repeals the four month time uh, constraint and houses that authority directly in the county administrator subject to go. county commission review at any time. Commissioner McKinley, you're recognized. Thank you. I had one request, uh, Mayor Kerner and Ms. Baker. Uh, I want um, any interaction, first interaction with law enforcement on this to be a positive one. So can we please prioritize the distribution of masks to law enforcement officers so that they have an envelope of masks in their car and can offer one to somebody they see in that one? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Bernard, you're recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I just want to be real quick. Um, looking at the numbers for today, we have over 11,180 of our residents in the county that's tested positive. Uh, the number of fatalities are 476, and I think that's an increase of eight additional fatalities. And the number of hospitalizations are at 1591. And uh, we have to do our everything that we can to slow this spread. And what we're doing today in terms of the mandatory mask is doing that. Uh, I remember you know, a month and a half ago when we decided that we were going to ask the governor to go into phase one. Uh, we have so many of our residents that's been unemployed. And um, you know, I, I, last week, the, um, the unemployment rate for the state of Florida is 14.3%, and for Palm Beach County for May, it's at 14.1%, which is a little bit better than April, which is at 14.2%. And But just go back to May of 2019, our unemployment rate was at 3.1%. And some of the residents who were here, they were here a couple months ago just asking us to open up the businesses. And we've asked the governor to go into phase two, uh, to go into phase two, but, the, but because of the fact that the numbers are going up, we're not able to go into phase two. So what we're hoping to do is to slow the spread so that way we can open up more businesses in the future for the county. And so in that way we can reduce the unemployment rate in this county. So uh, because of the fact that we as elected officials, we are responsible for the health, safety, and the welfare of over 1.5 million residents that lives in this county. So for these reasons, we have to do this and vote on this today. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bernard. That concludes comments by the members of the Board of County Commissioners. As for my position, uh, I appreciate the robust dialogue we had today and the respect that was given to all participants. Uh, the public health will always prevail. All in favor of the motion? Say aye. 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 All opposed? That motion passes 7-0. The Board of County Commissioners will be in recess for 10 minutes and we will reconvene at 1.02. Thank you, everybody.
today, we gave our residents an opportunity to be heard, and I think we, uh, we did an able job. I'm going to ask that you receive and file a, uh, a memorandum that I have for guidance for the use of face coverings that was issued by the State of California Health and Human Services Agency, which uh, gives the guidance, at least in California, for wearing face masks, which is pretty detailed, and then a number of exemptions, which I think would be uh, appropriate to incorporate in the order that's going to be uh, drafted. So I'm going to ask that you t accept this and uh, reference it as you and the uh, county administrator draft the emergency order. Very good. And the county administrator will be drafting that order and bringing it back to us. It will be self-executing upon her signature, but we will be able to view it just like any member of the public. No. Ma'am, you, you are recognized. We'll process it as we've done all the other EOs and put it on our website. But it'll be, ex it'll be effective as law upon your Once signature. Once I sign it, yes. And we will have an opportunity to review it, but the input and direction's already been given. That is uh, absolutely And please, right. without objection, receive and file this under agenda item 3A1. I'll turn it into the clerk, and then the county administrator can uh, review it at her pleasure. Thank you, Mayor. Um. Yes, thank you, Mayor Kerner. And again, I want to thank you for running a tight meeting and giving everybody an opportunity to speak. Um, I, I hate to do this. Uh, I have to uh, leave, and I will miss our workshop items this afternoon. Uh, I have a last-minute appointment that I need to take care of. Uh, I just want to thank Clinton, and I want to thank Todd and the rest of the Palm Chan team for what you've been able to accomplish in the glades and the flexibility to provide the best service possible. I know I've got uh, Mayor Wilson is here and I believe South Bay Mayor uh, Joe Kyles is also here and wanna thank them for their support in educating the community about this new service. Uh, I know there have been some requests to tweak it a little bit and you'll continue to explore opportunities to make the service the most affordable it can be. Uh, but as you have presented your agenda item today, I wanted to let you know that I support what you're presenting. Mm -hmm. I also uh, want to, since I've got to leave, I don't want any delays to be made on decisions regarding um, strategic plans, uh, facility planning for the Western County Government Operations Center. I have had an extensive briefing from staff about uh, how they're proposing to move forward on that. And just want to say on the record, as you consider that decision later on today, that I am very supportive of what they are proposing in that part of the county. And thank you, Ms. Baker, and thank you to Ms. Wolf um, for, for everything that they've done. I also want to give a shout out real quick to Tammy Jackson Moore for being here today and for being such a fabulous community leader and for her service on the Palm Tram Board. So thank you, and my apologies for having to leave. Thank you, Commissioner McKinley, for your input. Uh, Mr. Bodenlaren, you recognize, sir. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, this is a uh, Palm Tran Go Glades pilot project update that we come to you today. Uh, we are uh, speaking in response to some of the COVID-19 pandemic issues uh, and our transit in the Glades region. Uh, Palm Tran had a modified four Go Glades flex uh, route system and a dial-a-ride, and we've converted that to a full uh, dial-a-ride service for the entire Glades region to promote some of the social distancing. Uh, that we've been under. We're gonna give you a quick update. We have a very brief PowerPoint presentation that Mr. Forbes is gonna take you through uh, to lead to the continued recommendation of continuing the dial-a-ride service uh, through April of uh, 2021. Mr. Forbes. Thank you, Mr. Bonlaire and Mr. Mayor, commissioners. Uh, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to present the Go Glades Flex and Dial-a-Ride pilot update. And we'll, we know you have a, a very aggressive agenda. We will go quickly through this. Um, on, this is our agenda of discussion. Again, just really an update on our service transition as a result of COVID-19. Our presentation will culminate uh, with uh, seeking direction uh, on our recommendations. Uh, Pre-COVID, this was the pilot, um, and the service design for the pilot, which really was a circulator system that was stratified throughout the entire Glades region in all three cities, and there were four circulators. Uh, the one component of this is that the circulator could deviate uh, within three quarter miles upon request uh, to a person's uh, origination point or destination. 
Um, it also had a small component of dial-a-ride service, uh, which was on-demand direct service uh, of, that could be delivered upon request. This service uses smaller vehicles similar to a Palm Tran connection. Uh, we won't go through this timeline. I just want to uh, point your attention uh, to two bullets. Uh, July 2019, you may recall call, we had held a BCC workshop on Go Glaze Pilot to review performance metrics and service options during the first six months of service. And at that workshop, the board asked to extend the pilot for one year uh, <laughs> to collect more information and out of the concern that school was starting. And so we extended the pilot for, for one year. And of course, as a result of COVID, uh, Palm Tran expanded the dollar ride feature to the entire region and suspended the flex route. Um, this is just some metrics information. We don't have to go through this in detail, but we, we just wanted to show you uh, before we uh, transition to the dollar ride service, uh, this are some of the metrics uh, statistics for the uh, GoGlade Flex. Our primary performance metric used in evaluation of the GoGlade service was productivity. Uh, with a goal of four passengers per hour. That's we, what we uh, decided on, four passengers per hour. And productivity essentially is um, how many passengers are riding your system for the expense, for the cost. And so we decided on four, and that's a really an industry standard. As you can see in the top box where there's a yellow row, uh, that was a, time, a snapshot of time from the pilot inception to the workshop. Uh, you could see that two routes were doing fairly well, GG2 and GG4, and uh, two routes were lagging in performance based on our goals, GG1 and GG3. Um, if you look at the lower, if you look at the lower box with the green column, this is uh, from post-workshop up until the COVID-19 modification. As you can see, uh, the GG2 and GG4, the performance met the goal, actually exceeded it. But GG1 and GG3 continue to lag in performance. So we wanted to share that with you. We also looked at customer service, safety, uh, and on-time performance. On slide six, um, again, we've had to really reimagine how we deliver public transit service in Palm Beach County as a result of COVID-19. And so we temporarily transitioned from the flex model uh, in April 2020 after consulting the executive policy group and the in incident commander. Uh, and we did this to promote social distancing. These vehicles are smaller, a capacity of about six to 12 people, um, and the vehicles were full. So uh, we switched to an all on, on, on demand dollar ride service where customers will call and we will actually pick them up and we won't uh, have a capacity more than two or three people in a vehicle. And so we switched to the dollar ride service, again, to support uh, social distancing uh, uh, as a result of COVID-19. And here are just some features of the dollar ride. You can read them, but at the, at the bottom, more importantly, is how this service fits to the supply and the demand, which actually could create some savings. Chad, you just want to touch on this point really yeah, quickly? Yeah, I'll just touch on that real quick. So uh, we had some some service at early, early on the fixed routes in the on the flex routes that were not really used in the hours early morning and, and late evenings. And so we were only putting out four vehicles during that time. Now we're putting out eight vehicles and we're matching that to the peak, which really happens probably about eight o'clock in the morning through 11. And then once again, at two to five o'clock in the afternoon. So we actually match the vehicles to the number of hours and the, the request for the demand of service. So we were able to eliminate those you know, having those vehicles out late night and early morning. Thanks, Chad. And again, here, uh, just a slide on the funding. Uh, we're very thankful to the Florida Department of Transportation. Uh, this, this service has been uh, fully funded uh, through using state dollars during the pilot period. Uh, and as you can see, we have an allocation of dollars from the CARES Act uh, through the state of $1.1 .1 million to continue until next year. Um, again, operating and capital expenses uh, from the state amount to more than $3.8 million. And to our, our last two slides, we're going right to the recommendations. So uh, one of our recommendations is to approve the continuation of the dollar ride service model implemented in response to COVID-19 through June 2021. So like Ms. Baker, we don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> and so we, we really don't know uh, when this thing is gonna end. But what we do know is that 
uh, based on the guidance of the CDC and Dr. Alonzo, you know, practices such as social distancing and wearing our masks, those have been mitigating this, the transfer of this disease. So we want to continue the dollar ride because again, this measure was put in place to address uh, social distancing on our, on our uh, system. Uh, so we want to continue that into June 2021. The second request uh, is to bring back the service delivery model options that you asked for us to bring back uh, last year. And that we, we were slated to bring those back March, and we know it happened in March and April. So we would like to bring those back April of 2021. And we probably need to put an asterisk there as well. Uh, but uh, we'd like to bring those back in 2021. And those models essentially will be uh, the, 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 uh, the pilot, uh, the Gold Glades pilot as originally designed with the four routes. Uh, the second model would be looking at the two product, pro, productive routes, uh, GG2 and GG4, and maybe doing something a little different with uh, the lagging routes. And the third model will be the mobility on demand model that we're doing in response to COVID-19. So those are the three options we'd like to bring back to you. In addition to the options that we'll share with you, we'll also share fiscal information on you know, how much this service is costing to contract out, and this was uh, the board's request, and how much this service would cost to insource. And so that's the information we plan to bring back uh, if you would allow in April 2021. The last point uh, and uh, direction, uh, information that we'd like to share with you and maybe get some direction is our FAIR recommendation. And um, uh, we, working with the incident commander and the executive policy group, uh, we have uh, made a decision to reinstate, reestablish Palm Trans FAIRs on all modes effective July 12th. Um, we will have our operator office doors, the barriers that separate the operators from the customers, um, installed by the end of this month. And uh, we have made a decision to reestablish fares by July 12th. Uh, with that, um, currently all of our modes are, are fare free. Um, with that, on October 16, 2018, the Board of County Commissioners established the pilot fares for the Bell Glade Flex and Dollar Ride service. Uh, so this was approved by the board. We are recommending that we continue with the fares that you approved uh, back in 2018 for the dollar ride service. So when we are reestablish fares, the fares for the dollar ride, uh, our response to COVID will be $2 as you uh, established in 2018. Um, I will tell you, we have been in close communication uh, with the leadership in the Glades region. Uh, and uh, two, two of the mayors are here and they do have a concern about the, about the fares that you might hear uh, as, a, as a part of public comment. Um, so that's um, uh, our recommendation and uh, we are prepared to uh, discuss and answer any questions uh, that you might have. Very good, thank you Clinton. Commissioner Weiss, you recognized. Thank you, uh, thank you for the, the, the brief but thorough uh, presentation, appreciate that. A um, couple of things, um, you know, noticing looking at your, from the inception um, productivity until where, uh, to the, what happens during COVID, um, that's, uh, I mean, we're looking at a, uh, with a GG1, what about a 25% increase in ridership and on GG3, 67%, so that's, and I'm wondering if, if that is, is that indicative of the fact that it's the dial, dial a ride or if it is related to, you know, the impact of what COVID had in transportation out in, in the western part of the county? Can you, do you have any thoughts on that? Are you referring to the, the bottom box uh, with the green column, uh, Commissioner GG? Yeah, GG, uh, yeah, GG they, one they and GG three. Yeah, they went up I mean, they, those, I mean, everything went up obviously substantially, but you know, those were really lagging and they, you know, they, they saw nice increases as well. So I just wondered what was, yeah, and, and maybe it's more generic. Yeah, we, we have had some growth uh, in GG1 and GG3, um, not, still not anywhere near our, um, our goal of four passengers per hour. The, the deviation is not included in this number. Okay. But I will tell you that, uh, and we didn't, again, we didn't want to really belabor the issue or spend too much time the, the deviations picked up tremendously. 
Good. And we, we do have some information, if you'd like to share as backup slides, to share you with you on the deviations, but they tri picked up tremendously. Good. And then uh, where are we at with the touchless fare, interoperable fare system? How's that, how's that coming along? That's come along pretty well. Of course, um, there, there was a delay as a result of COVID. There were uh, no fly orders all around the country. Um, but we were able to do a lot of production work. And so we only slipped maybe one month. And so we, we're looking to begin uh, shipment, uh, I think, October, November. Mm -hmm. We'll be getting our new fare boxes, getting them installed, training the operators. Um, the public outreach is going to be tricky. Uh, so we, we're looking at how we are going to do that and training our customers, et cetera. Uh, but it's still on, pretty much on schedule. Okay, good. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Weiss. Commissioner Bernard, you recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Clinton, thanks for the presentation, and Todd for being here and the whole team. Um, just two questions. I know last week we had voted on the CARES dollars that you had received. Are you able to use some of those CARES dollars for some of the go glades of what's going on out there? I know yeah. you had mentioned the two million. Right. Is that the is that from the ones that is that from what we approved last week? Yes, yes, actually, uh, you just recently approved this, these dollars, the $1.1 million of CARES Act. Uh, and again, this, this money from CARES is, can only be used in rural areas, and is funneled through the Florida Department of Transportation, mm -hmm. and this was a, a perfect application to use those funds. Um, so yes, we are using some of the CARES Act dollars. Per se for Are we able to use additional CARES Act dollars? I know we had to approve $50 million. Can we use a little bit more to help with some of the, you know, that, you know, the fare, the fees? Are we able to do that or no? That, the, as uh, Ms. Baker mentioned, the, the, our CARES Act funding is pretty flexible, uh, and we can look at that, but it will be a board direction. Okay. Um, so... Is that from that 50 million? Is that correct or no? Right. So from the 50 million, we presented to the board a program of projects, mm -hmm. which included COVID-related expenses, PPE, you know, operating expenses. We also included 4.7 million dollars of lost revenue uh, in that program of projects, and that's what we anticipate, uh, you know, losing in fair revenue. Uh, and so uh, that was already approved by the board. Uh, as a part of the program of projects. The question is, uh, is there additional money? Uh, <laughs> potentially. And, and w like how much do you think it would cost for us to, you know, at least help subsidize some of that cost? Like <coughs> just a ballpark. So <clears throat> the, the um, Gold Glades, do you have that, that cost, the, the fair? It's, it's Ten thousand a month. The fare box loss on the Go Glaze is like ten thousand dollars a month. Okay, so in so in like twelve months, it'd be like one hundred. That with the flex, that's with the flex and, and not with the dollar ID. That's with the dollar. That, that includes the dollar ID piece in it. You'd have to. I want to. Okay. Yeah. Commissioner, we'd have to go back and, and look at that for you, just because th those are the dollars on the fare box with the flex route right. and the die ride component. The, the, the model that we're in right now is just a pure uh, dial a ride mm -hmm. component. So it, it probably would be greater than that number. We'd have to kind of dig in there a little bit more to just do some modeling on that for you. Okay. All right. I know for me, I would support it, you know, whatever, you know, f funds that you can find. Ms. Baker, you have any money? <laughs> uh, what we will, what I will tell you is that I'll work with uh, Mr. Von Lauren and uh, Mr. Forbes, uh, look at the dollars if they have not already been allocated and accounted for, and try and uh, adjust okay. these numbers if we possibly can. Okay, thank you very much. And one la one last question in regards to the dollar ride, um, if someone. I guess if they're traveling, you know, from the Glades to, let's say, West Palm Beach, do we, how do we, how does that work? Do so that's a great distinction. The dial -a ride service will be only for the footprint of the Glades region. Okay. So for actually for $2, someone could travel 
from the northern city to the southern city, uh, one, one seat ride. Okay. If you were coming from West Palm to the Glades, you would use our traditional fixed route system, uh, Route 40. Uh, uh, you can connect from Wellington or uh, the intermodal, and you can get to the Glades uh, using it. Uh, and we also have, continue to have paratransit service uh, that uh, transport our elderly and disabled from the eastern to the western communities. Now, does the dollar ride take you from, let's say you're in um, uh, Canal Point to one of the stations to get you to the east? Is that how that, how that work? Or, yes. And would you have to pay a fee to go from, let's say, Canal Point to that station, that $2 fee? The $2 fee, I, I should mention, and I didn't mention it earlier in my presentation, is we looked at the data, um, the fare collection data for the flex system, and we found that 42% uh, of the riders have some type of fare reciprocity. For example, um, if you have a fixed route pass, monthly or daily, you can transfer to through each system without a cost. Okay. So you can write the fixed route or the dollar ride without a cost. If you are an ADA pass holder, uh, you ride this service f free. And so 42% uh, of that. But if you don't, if you're cash paying, you will have to pay $2 to transfer to okay. the next system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Bernard. We'll return to Commissioner Weiss. Oh, and Ms. Baker, were you finished with your comments? Very good, we'll go now to public comment. Commissioner Bernard. Mr. Mayor, we have Dwight Mattingly, followed by Mayor Joe Kyles, and followed by Mayor Stephen Wilson. Mr. Mattingly, you're recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners, and thanks, Mr. Forbes, for a great presentation. Uh, I just want to comment to say that it was an excellent transition to the dollar ride, and that uh, in speaking with the operators that are there, the only um, the positive feedback from, from the riders is this, that they're wanting to get from Pahokee, which is, if you look at the stats, the smallest number of riders, to the Bell Glade area because that is where uh, there's more services and there's more services for social services available to them. And so that's their concern if we ever go back to the model that we have that that Pahokee uh, route uh, extends to the Bell Glade area, which it doesn't currently. So I think that is a positive uh, way that we can look at this dollar ride, because as the dollar ride is set up, uh, they are able to go anywhere in the Western community. So if they're in Canal Point and wanna go to South Bay, they can do that in this dollar ride service. And uh, keep in mind, though, that these numbers uh, Commissioner Weiss brought up uh, may have increased as a result of it being a free service now. And uh, the, uh, the operators wanted to point that out. My last concern is that as we move forward into fair collection, uh, even though the operator doors on the fixed route buses will be in place, I still have a great concern how that the interaction with wheelchair passengers and things of that nature are going to affect our operators. And it's, I, I really appreciate the vote that was taken this morning and hopefully we can continue on progressing to uh, enforce the required mask on the buses. Thank you for your time. Very good, Dwight. I don't see any inquiries from members of the board, but let me take a moment to thank um, our county employees and your members of ATU, the bus operators, for their incredible work on the front lines. We deeply appreciate their public service. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mayor, you're recognized. We have Mayor Mr. Joe Kyles. One second, Mayor. And followed by Mayor Stephen Wilson, and the last person will be Tammy Jackson Moore. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe you're saying good morning and good afternoon to each and every one of you all. I know you had a busy schedule this morning. We're sitting here, and I applaud you all for the wonderful work that you're doing here for the county. On behalf of the city of South Bay, we would like to say thank you. Thank you for running this service out in the Glaze area, especially the Go, Go Glaze. As Mr. Clinton have talked to us about the wonderful service that have been rendered in the Glaze area, I hear the, the residents of the city of South Bay 
come to me telling me how glad that service had been rendered there because we have our seniors that live in the Glaze area there that do not have transportation. They depend on that particular service there. And as those individuals have been picked up each and every morning there, they are very proud of this particular service here. And I just want to say to you all, as I visit the site out in the city of South Bay there, where they have moved the station from the city of Belgrade to South Bay there, I have a, the golden opportunity to speak to the management at that particular site. They say they are very pleased with the way things are, are handled, the way things are going, and also the staff is very pleased as well. And I want to say to each and every one of the commissioners that sit here today how pleased that I am for the residents, not only in the city of South Bay, but in the Glaze as a whole. And I hope today that you will just accept that recommendation to make sure that service continue within the Glaze area. Again, thank you, and may God continue to bless each and every one of you all. Thank you, Mayor. I don't see any inquiries from the members of the board, but please keep uh, Sergeant Johnny Ortiz in line out there, okay? I definitely will, <laughs> thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Mayor? We have Mayor Steve Wilson, followed by Timmy Jackson-Moore. Good afternoon. Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, and to all the commissioners who I certainly call my friends in the political arena, which are public servants, to our county administrator, Ms. Baker, and to her staff, um, I will tell you this. Um, I just have to pause for a moment to let you guys know how appreciative we are for what you do and the things that you've done and what you will continue to do for Palm Beach County, one of the fastest growing county in the state, if not the country. What I witnessed today, that you guys are stand up individuals to do what's right for mankind. Now on the business note today, uh, we certainly support the recommendation by your CEO, Mr. Clinton Ford with Palm Train. I will tell you, you guys scored big on getting him and allowing him to put his team together and an awesome job that they do. Now, I'm not trying to bother you up. I'm telling you <laughs> what we feel from the Glades. As my colleague, Mayor Kyle's, the folks in the Glades are very appreciative, Ms. Baker, for what you guys do for the folks in the Glades. Now, the recommendation, we support. Um, obviously, there's always a concern about the fare. And so um, it's not fair to you guys that we come to the last minute and let you know that it's a concern of ours. So I would like to sit down at some point with our county administrator and follow up with this. Um, the services in the Glades, we're not hearing the complaints. We come a long way. We don't have the, the tri-rail over here, but every aspect of transportation for the Glades folks, they appreciate it. Thank you guys for what you do. God bless you all. Thank you, Mayor, and we appreciate the Tri-City Mayor leadership and, and the councils out there. I, would, I think it's advisable that the County Administrator and Commissioner McKinley continue to work with the leadership and uh, Mr. Forbes on, on the recommendations and the, particularly the fair issues. Ma'am, you are our last public speaker, and you have three minutes. I won't take three minutes, but thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to address you this afternoon. Um, I just want to thank you for allowing me to, number one, serve on your Palm Tree and Service Board and have an opportunity to work with your fabulous staff. Thank you also for allowing um, Mr. Forbes the autonomy to be a true leader in the, in the aspect of public service and public transportation. Um, as you see, the numbers have increased for our Go Glaze um, ridership, and that's because he has done a great due diligence in making certain that we get it right. So for whatever the reason that the numbers have grown, I will tell you that the residents in the Glades community are explicitly excited about Go Glades. I see the buses passing all the time. The buses are um, primarily full, as, as full as they can be right now under the um, pandemic that we're in. And people are talking about Go Glades, and they're excited about um, Go Glades. So this um, smaller bus transportation piece that you have allowed to come into our community is exactly Exactly what our community needs. Um, we enjoy Palm Tran, but this works for our small community. So we thank you for that. And again, thank you so much for allowing Mr. Forbes the, and his staff the autonomy for doing what they are doing in our community. Thank you, ma'am. We have one uh, inquiry by Commissioner Bernard. Just real quick, Tammy, I want to thank you for your work on the Palm Tran Service Board, but also I want to thank you for your work as a board member of the Palm Beach County Healthcare District. Um, you know, Darcy Davis is the CEO of the Healthcare District. She's done a phenomenal job. And I want to thank your full board because a lot of things that we've done 
fighting this COVID is thanks to the work of the healthcare district. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, and, and on behalf of the board, we deeply appreciate your public service and Palm Trans Service Board. You are the compass and foundation of that public service, and without the input of our citizens like yourself, uh, the service certainly would not be as productive and efficient, so thank you. Thank you so much. Very good, that concludes public comment. Uh, is there any other direction that uh, Mr. Forbes needs beside the, that given by the board already, or uh, the county administrator, rather? Very good. Again, I continued, or I would encourage the continued dialogue with the county administrator and, and Commissioner McKinley. Um, well, you, that concludes the workshop on agenda item 4A, Go Glades Pilot Project. We'll take a quick pivot to go back on the agenda, to a regular agenda on page two. Agenda item three, if I can have a motion on agenda item three, B1, to receive and file the warrant list for clerk. Motion by Commissioner Berger, seconded by Commissioner Weiss. No public comment. All in favor? All opposed? That item passes five to zero with Commissioners Valachay and McKinley absent. <clears throat> is, there a, is there a motion on agenda item 3B2, motion to approve the contracts as uh, stated in 3B2? Motion by Vice Mayor Weinroth, seconded by Commissioner Berger, no public comment. All in favor, all opposed, 3B2 passes six to zero with Commissioner McKinley absent. We'll move now into the second workshop, which is agenda item 4B, Property Assess Clean Energy Program Update. If you have not submitted a public comment card and would like to speak on this item, please do so now. Rudder, you are recognized. Uh, good afternoon. This is your second workshop. Second workshop of the day. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. Um, it's regarding PACE update based on uh, previous board direction and discussions we've had with the board over about the past year or so. And just give you a quick framework for how we are looking to proceed. You get a quick presentation from staff. Um, your tax collector, Ann Gannon, has a presentation. And then finally, the PACE providers, uh, we're going to present a, provide a uh, consolidated presentation as well. I believe Mr. Schiller is going to take on that task. With me this afternoon is a very pregnant Megan Houston, <laughs> who's we're happy to have her here. And, and keep her here until about half a day before her due date. <laughs> uh, Caitlin Cucinata from the Office of Resilience, Bob Banks from the County Attorney's Office. So, very quickly, what brings us here today, I think the board will recall we had a number of uh, various PACE items through the past couple years, be it receive and file items or others uh, regarding indemnification changes, things like that with contractors. And it brought them, the board has expressed concerns and had questions a number of times, uh, essentially led to back in um, September, had an item, September of 2019, and the board had a uh, item before them, requested that we provide an update in a workshop. We were prepared to do that. Not long after there was legislation filed, board directed us to pause the workshop that we're doing today until we had completed the legislative session. Session did complete. There were one, two, three, four, five bills that um, none were adopted, didn't make it out of committee, I think, in most cases. Came back to the board in April, sought direction uh, to come back with this workshop, and here we are presenting you uh, just a quick overview on PACE, and we'll touch on any direction points the board might have for us when we reach our conclusion. And with that, I will ask Megan to provide you a quick walkthrough of what PACE is and some basic background points. commercial and residential property owners pay for specific clean energy improvements and 
pay for those investments through their tax bill. Jurisdictions have to pass legislation to allow this to happen, to operate in their community. So far, 37 states have done so. However, only 22 states have active PACE programs, with most of them focused on commercial PACE. Residential PACE is only active in three states, including Florida. And while there's been about $800 million in commercial PACE projects, there have been about $5 billion in residential PACE projects just in those three states. Five you, billion? Five billion with a B, yes. So you can see it's a little bit more popular within the residential sector. In Florida, Florida passed its statute to allow this to happen in 2010. Over 210 municipalities within Florida have enacted local ordinances to allow PACE programs to exist. And in Florida, PACE can only be used to finance three things, which are energy conservation and efficiency projects, renewable energy projects, and wind-resistant measure projects. In Palm Beach County specifically, the board asked um, staff to create the PACE ordinance, and the county passed this in 2017. Um, we've mentioned that uh, states and municipalities have to enact legislation for this to happen, but the PACE program is carried out through PACE districts. We have four PACE districts in, in Florida that operate, and those are the same that operate within Palm Beach County, which you can see listed on the right side. And within each PACE district, they help, the people who carry out their work are the PACE um, third-party administrators who we refer to as providers. The PACE providers are the ones who are dealing um, with more of the on-the-ground operations of PACE financing and working with contractors and running due diligence. And you can see on the right in those um, graphics are how the districts and the providers are grouped together. So for instance, Florida Resiliency and Energy District is the, um, is the district, and then Renovate America is the third party administrator for that specific district. The county's PACE program here applies to unincorporated Palm Beach County as well as within all municipalities that haven't, op that haven't passed their own PACE program. It also applies to PACE municipalities, or to Palm Beach County municipalities that have their own PACE program, but who still want to participate in Palm Beach County's countywide program. Only four cities within our, or um, local jurisdictions within our county have their own specific PACE program where we don't, um, provide any kind of oversight, or we don't provide um, PACE enforcement there. So um, PACE financing, it's not free money, it's an investment, it's a, it's a financing deal. So there's a term, there's interest rates, there's annual payments, those can be significant costs, as well as there's a bill tied to someone's property, which means there is a, a risk of foreclosure. With all these risks and potential costs, the board has, um, when it enacted the PACE ordinance, put forth consumer protection within that ordinance to make sure that the financing is operating um, with, with these key protections. Some of those protections are things like disclosing, requiring disclosure of these financial essential terms, similar to what you might see when you are buying a house. We also have quarterly reporting that we require that we can use to demonstrate compliance with the ordinance and with the interlocal agreements and those operating documents. And then the PACE deal itself has to meet basic eligibility requirements like the property owner is current on their tax bills and their mortgage and that the cost of the PACE project is reasonable compared to the fair market value of that property. Since the Office of Resilience was created in 2018, we've spent a significant amount of time and um, have prioritized making sure that we're performing quality assurance and quality control over the PACE program. It does fall within our, our duties to, to work on that. We worked to develop this, um, to streamline the systems for these quarterly re um, compliance reporting, for these annual re reporting, procedures, we've created 
Um, with the county's attorney's office, we've created a consumer disclosure notice that the PACE administrators now use when they are including that packet of information um, when they're giving that to those property owners. Um, we also audit the PACE projects to ensure compliance, and we, main con we maintain continuous um, communication with the districts and the providers to make sure that everyone's on the same page about what Palm Beach County requires and, and what these deals require. We also work with our local and regional partners in the area to discuss best practices for PACE, hear what's happening on the ground, and we work with our consumer affairs and contractors certification division here within the county to make sure that, again, we all are aware of any kind of um, consumer complaints that might arise. With that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Caitlin Cuginata, who has, um, when I say perform QA and QC, it's really her job. Who's been, she's been a great asset for the county to um, be carrying out these um, enforcement procedures. And she's going to talk about PACE statistics and show where these PACE projects are happening within our community. Thank you, Megan. Here you can see that according to reports, over $86 million in projects were financed through PACE in Palm Beach County between 2018 and 2019. As shown in the chart to the right, the majority of reported projects have been wind resistance related, followed by energy efficiency upgrades and finally solar projects. According to reports, this equates to roughly six, 67 million kilowatt hours in energy saved, 53 million kilowatt hours in energy produced, and over 1,560 jobs. Next, we'll see a few maps based on reported PACE projects within the county. So the first map here just shows all the reported projects um, in point form throughout the county between 2018 and 2019. The next map is a density map showing from north to south and east to west where the majority of PACE projects have been. Um, higher, more dense areas are shown in red and less dense areas are shown in yellow. This is a zoomed in version of that same map. Um, we'll see northern Palm Beach County here and municipalities are labeled in white. Central Palm Beach County, southern, and you can see in those, um, a lot of the concentration is along the coast and the municipal areas, um, you know, where our more, more dense communities are. And then here is the Western Palm Beach County density map showing um, relatively few PACE financing projects in those areas. Thank you, Caitlin. So with all the projects that we're seeing in Palm Beach County, and you can see you know, those dots represent actual deals on the ground in commercial and residential, we, um, we have heard some concerns, some consumer concerns that are national and um, local. We've listed them here. Things like people are sometimes uncomfortable with the door-to-door -door salesperson approach of, of people knocking on your door and talking about a new program, and we get a lot of calls from our consumers to verify whether those are real, um, real programs. Um, it's complicated some of the, for some you know, people who aren't used to dealing with finance um, terms. It can be confusing and overwhelming. Um, it's also, there's also a practice to use iPads or some sort of tablet and do digital contracts. So same day kind of um, sign here and follow up with the hard copy, but some people are confused about that of what did I sign and where is my copy and where do I find that thing to read through on my own time when I'm home alone. Um, and then there's also a risk, as we mentioned, of foreclosure, where somebody could lose their home for this, um, for this $20,000 project. We have not heard of a foreclosure case in Palm Beach County yet, and I don't think we've heard of one in Florida, but it's, it's a risk and it's something that we're, we're mindful of. Even with the amount of deals that we've had and these consumer concerns, the complaints that we've heard about have been relatively low compared to the number of deals. We ask PACE providers to self-report within those quarterly reports of how many complaints they receive. So about 80, um, <coughs> out of 4,000 or so, which is a little over 2%, have 
have listed complaints associated with those deals. In our own county operations, we work with consumer affairs when they have a complaint that comes to them, specific um, called out to PACE, they let us know, and we've, we've heard about it, seven of those, which is um, less than half a percent of the projects. I think it's 0.02 percent. Excuse me? Is that math right? 80 divided by 3902. Oh, decimal's in the wrong spot, maybe? We lose the decimal. 80 divided by 3902. We're going to have my the math now. fact checker. I think it's 0 0.02 percent. You are correct. Okay. So relatively low, even lower. Thank you. So with the, um, you know, given that there have been these consumer concerns, um, not that, and there are things we can do to improve the program now that we're a couple of years in, things like reviewing the ordinance to increase consumer protection, there's, there are always things that we could do to make sure it's a more comfortable process for consumers. If we wanted to open that back up, we could also, because of the significant um, uh, time and commitment that it takes for the resilience office to ensure compliance, we could look at having an administration fee to help fund this enforcement and this administration. And then we could also look at additional funding options for the county that are that offer comparable um, uh, tools for homeowners in particular. That might be more that might be suitable as an alternative. With that, I'll turn it back over to Patrick Rudder to finish up. And very briefly, uh, before Ms. Gannon uh, gives her presentation, just wanted to draw the board's attention to board direction and what we're seeking. We've been had the discussion in spades, if you will, a number of times, and would love to get direction today on whether it's some of the points that Megan touched on, whether it's to go back and work with industry and some find some points to bring back a refined ordinance, if you will. Could it, would it include a fee? Continue as is, continue as is for a period of time, something to that effect. So a lot of different points. We don't need to hammer the specifics per se out, but would really like to know from the board's perspective how they would like us to proceed. So with that, Very Ms. Good. Gannon. Uh, Ms. Uh, to the tax collector, we're excited to have your presentation. And while she comes to the podium, Patrick, when, uh, when a consumer goes and obtains a home equity line of credit, uh, and I'd, I've never done it before, but I assume that there's a, a process that goes through closing, kind of like obtaining an original mortgage that, that provides an opportunity or a cooling period for the consumer to uh, sort of renege on, on any agreement um, um, of, prior to closing. Is, is there a model anywhere in the United States where there's a mandatory cooling period um, between presentation yeah, of a good faith estimate under the PACE program? versus when they can legally mm -hmm. sign and execute that agreement? I believe within Palm Beach County for PACE, there is a three-day right to cancel. So from that day where they first have that interaction with somebody and they might sign something, they do have that three-day right. So we do have that <coughs> cooling off period. Um, it, the, uh, with the digital format, it's sometimes hard for people to remember or find the number to call to cancel. What is the process to cancel? I believe you call the provide the each provider lists their phone number and contact information on that initial signature, and so you call that provider and you cancel. So it might be the contractor who meets with you at the door, but you um, you can call that provider. And I'll let Caitlin correct me if I'm. Well, the providers are here. A few uh, representatives are here, and they can talk more about their process. But I they can also mail a physical letter to the provider. Um, and I think an email would suffice as well, just based on policies I've seen in their um, documentation. Well, we'll look forward to hearing from industry on that point. Uh, Madam Tax Collector, you're recognized. Uh, good afternoon, and I'm glad you're excited to see me. Most people aren't, um, <laughs> to be really honest. <laughs> um, I actually brought, I think there are six different examples, and you might recognize the market value of the property because each of you um, represent it in some case. Um, it is your property. Um, and, and really what I, what I want to convey to you is that this 
This loan becomes a first lien on property. It means that the tax collector is below the first lien when we go to collect on this. They come first, so that taxes collected come second. We currently have one piece of property with a TDA, which means they have unpaid taxes in 2017, 18, and 19, and it's out for foreclosure right now. And I should have checked the property to see what the market value was, um, to see what the loan is on the property versus what the taxes are, and if it goes to foreclosure, what in fact um, the county would collect in taxes after this foreclosure proceeded and what the tax uh, payer would collect the difference between the loan and the value of the property. We have one item that's delinquent from 2018. We had 61 items we sold this year in tax certificate sales. So that means we have 61 property owners who, if they continue the march to the TDA, could potentially lose their homes um, because you can um, not pay your taxes this year and next year and the third year it goes to TDA where it could be foreclosed on. And when you get to the second year of tax or to the third year, the TDA, you have to pay all the taxes to redeem it, not just one year. With interest? Uh, with interest, yes, with us, interest and penalties. So what I really tried to do, the problem with this is the state statute. It's not the county ordinance. Um, and <clears throat> it is the way this is set up. You take the market value of a property and the cap on actually getting a loan on your property is 20%. It could be anywhere from 20% down. What we put together is a pro forma, in, um, a pro forma invoice that looks at the finance fee, which is 2.5% at closing, the administrative assessment fee, which is another 1%. And so the principal to finance, you would take the initial cost of the loan and add it to those other two fees and the possible interest rate, which could be three, four, five, or six percent, and that's what you see across. And then you would get your annual assessment, the, the total cost in assessment, and then the annual assessment for 20 years. Um, and you add it to your proposed taxes and the payment with 4% discount. And what you see is a new payment with energy assessment. If you get a 20% loan, it doubles your taxes. And so a person who would get a loan, potentially, if it's 20% of the market value, their taxes are doubled each year for 20 years, or it could be 10 years or whatever, um, to repay this loan. And the second part of this would be the initial cost at 50% of the max. And the max would be 50% of the market value of the property. So if you play this out, and I know everyone says, well, someone is signing this loan. Let me explain to you. Most people who sign this loan do not understand how it works. Um, and I can tell you there are realtors who don't understand it. There are realtors that don't explain to their clients that if you buy your house in June and you are paid the taxes between January and June, then what you have is a credit on the property when you buy it, and people think they're getting extra money. We've had people come in where their property has been sold in our next tax sale and say that we made a mistake because they don't understand how the financing will work. Is that my problem? Probably not, but it becomes your problem when you don't collect the taxes because this is a first lien on property. And you have people that are potentially going to lose their home over these loans. And I'm not arguing with the, the reason for the program because I understand it. But the problems you have are the state statute and it's the companies who are financing this who are making money off the backs of your, your constituents. So you have to look really closely at this. And I know I have a lot of friends who represent these companies that think I'm a bad person because I stand up and say this, but frankly, I don't wanna see 
anybody lose their home over a loan like this when potentially they also could go to a bank and get a much lower interest rate and because someone knocks on your door it's an easy way to do this and they probably never thought about it and they need to upgrade their windows or put solar stuff on their house but I, I would caution you when I say I don't think your ordinance is the problem I think the state statute is the problem and there needs to be a way to work with this so that our constituents are not paying 20 years of interest of double taxes which when they get the tax bill I can tell you I've talked to some of them they're shocked and they have no way to fund some of this and so what you're beginning to see because this program is what five years old here and you're beginning to see now people who can't pay this um, double taxes or it could be 25 percent more in taxes and they live <clears throat> in some of the houses we we've had these loans that we've looked them up in our office they're on manufactured housing um, and I mean I have to ask that question what are we doing with manufactured housing giving a loan like this with someone who's who's probably living marginally as it is but as I said that's not my problem that's your policy issue and and it's not um, while I know the PACE providers will go to the legislature and lobby against whatever you want to do to help your constituents and it's going to be a tough fight we're beginning to hear this from all the tax collectors of the issues with PACE loans throughout the state because we're the first people that see what's really going on in, uh, on these loans so I would be glad to answer any questions um, but down the line I think you should and, and I can go back and look at this TDA and see what the value of the loan is and what it's done to the taxes over this period um, and what it may potentially reduce the county's ability to collect those taxes and I'd be glad to furnish that information to you Thank you, Madam Tax Collector. Commissioner Bernard, you recognized. Uh, and just one quick question. Like, if someone, um, I guess if they're delinquent on their tax for, let's say, 2018, right. um, when they're, um, I guess, when, they, when they're ready to pay it, they would pay both the, the PACE and the regular tax that's owed, that's am correct. I correct? Uh, what happens if it's in a fork in a in a TDA like if it's a tax deed do they have to pay just the pace amount that's to pay all of it so the full it's the full three full years three years yes and typically um, if they're in a TDA it's very unusual um, for people uh, that have TDA um, to, to come in and pay all three years they it usually goes to foreclosure when the, when the clerk the clerk actually does the foreclosures we so, don't do those no I know but like so I'm just trying to understand so if they let's say they owe eight 17 18 right and 19 so if it's going into a TDA mm -hmm. I know you've got the taxes for 17 18 and then 19 correct but does that mean that they would also have to in the tax deed sell they would have to also pay the full 20 years owed is that what you're saying or no or just no, the taxes just owed those three on? years okay yes okay thank you thank you're you welcome. Commissioner Bernard uh, Madam Tax Collector from your perspective what is the utility of the 3.5 percent fee assessed at closing and admin assessment fee I'm sorry but where is that on um, let me put my glasses on first are you talking about the uh, finance fee at closing? Yes, ma'am. It's uh, divided into two fees, 2.5 and then 1%. Yes, that's the finance fee that the PACE uh, company gets. And the, the administrative and the assessment fee they also receive. Do um, you have any knowledge as to why those fees are assessed, or are they just pure profit? They want to make more money. I, I, I'm not going to. I don't know. I would say that that's part of their profit in servicing the loan. Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor Weinroth, you recognized. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, can you just clarify for me sure. um, from what Commissioner Bernard was just saying? Is there an acceleration on the payment of that loan if they haven't paid in three years? Are you talking about the PACE loan? Yes. Uh, I'm not sure. You asked me that question, Dave, uh, Commissioner. I'm not really sure about that. 
I believe that the whole thing would have to be paid at that time. The whole the loan would yes. come due because they basically had uh, defaulted on the loan, not paying. Now, is the county making the payment during the foreclosure uh, during the three years that payments no. aren't made? You're not delivering money to Pace. No. So, in essence, they're in default on their That's loan correct. to Pace. And the ta and the county taxes and in the, the county city taxes. or whatever. And just for my own information, the mortgage comes below us or ahead of us also? Uh, below. Okay, so below PACE us. has a priority to, yes. the, to the county, but then the first mortgage and, and a second mortgage holder is junior to the county? Yes. Okay. So Thank it you. would be the PACE, then it would be their taxes, then it would be the mortgage company. Okay, but again, back to Commissioner Bernard's comments, there is a potential that yes. the PACE loan would have been come due and they would have to pay the entire amount at that point because they had defaulted on the terms of that loan, which is separate and a part of what you're doing, bill collecting for PACE. Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Weinroth. I think we'll turn now to representatives of the industry as I don't see any other inquiries from members of the board. Mr. Schiller, you're recognized. Thank you uh, so much. As we get the presentation uh, loaded up, uh, good afternoon. I hope everybody can hear me through my mask. Oh, thank you, sir. Actually, this could go to Kate. Uh, good evening, or good evening. It feels like the evening. I'm sure it feels like tomorrow for you guys. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Neil Schiller. I'm an attorney with Saul Ewing, Arnstein and Lair, uh, located at 515 North Flagler Drive, Suite 1400 here in West Palm Beach. I'm here today representing Renew Financial as part of the industry presentation. Uh, with me is uh, Kate Wesner from Y Green. She is our industry expert and will be leading you through the presentation. And then to close our presentation is uh, former state Senator Ellen Bogdanoff, who is uh, also representing Y Green today. I just wanna remind you, uh, as some of you may know, I've been involved in this PACE process in Palm Beach County since 2016, uh, when I was representing Y Green. And it was understood since uh, 2016 that we were providing an extra tool for property owners in Palm Beach County to make improvements to their property in those three areas that you saw. You know, uh, with all due respect to um, tax collector Ann Gannon, she talked a lot about some foreclosures, 51 foreclosures, or on the way, or on the road to foreclosure, one that is almost out. Yet, it isn't clear uh, whether or not all those properties had PACE assessments attached to them, but more importantly, it isn't clear as to where, they, where those people or property owners have found themselves in the financial position that they're in. There are so many variables. You can't attribute PACE to foreclosures. It's not that simple, and it's not that easy. I'd like to point out the complaint rate. Uh, Mr. Mayor, they say lawyers are not good mathematicians, and I would uh, point to you as evidence that, that they are wrong. But 0.25 or 0.025% uh, is a pretty staggering number, What's minuscule. Even worse is the, are the complaints that were affirmed to your consumer affairs division, which were 0.18%. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Kate. She will get through our presentation. We are here to answer any questions. We wanna make this program work. One person going into foreclosure isn't acceptable to the industry. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kate. Thank you, Neil. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioner, staff. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Uh, Kate Wessner with Y Green Energy Fund. I'm representing the PACE industry. I'm also a resident of Palm Beach County and a property owner here. Thank you for your partnership over the last three years uh, with this program in Palm Beach County. Uh, to date, the industry has completed approximately 4,000 projects in Palm Beach County and 50,000 projects statewide. So we've invested almost $1 billion in the state of Florida. I'd like to just go over some of the, the concerns that staff had listed. Oh, excuse me, Pat, there's 
one for each of you. They have names inside. <laughs> uh, and, and some of the concerns that um, uh, Representative Gannon also mentioned. So um, with regard to the complaints, I think that the staff made the important distinction that the 81 complaints, uh, these are inquiries that the industry receives, not your county staff, that they are not spending time and resources necessarily on answering these calls or having to determine uh, you know, how to resolve that. The PACE administrators, which there are a number of them, as you saw on their slides, like we have trained staff, customer service staff, contractor management staff, resolution staff for you know, all of these different things that come up with consumers. So I think that is important to note that uh, as Mayor um, uh, Kerner noted that it's 0.02% is the actual number of questions that have been routed to your consumer affairs department. Uh, and we would welcome the opportunity to partner with your staff on how to resolve some of these. So, you know, we, we welcome, you know, discussions on how we could move forward to, to improve that process with you all. Uh, with regard to the door-to-door -door sales concerns, you know, we understand that that can make customers um, a little intimidated by, by someone coming to their door. Uh, what we would note is that PACE providers are our companies, we do not market door to door. These are contractors that already exist in your communities today. They use other types of financing. PACE is just one of the options they offer. And quite frankly, we're usually the last option they what offer. What are the other options? They will want cash first, right? Cash is king. Uh, and then they will say, well, what about a credit card? I've got my own credit card. You know, Kate Westner's financing, my in-house financing. And so they'll go through that. PACE will usually be the last thing they offer. And, and more explicitly, the reasons why is we hold them to a higher standard. We won't pay them until they finish that project and you as the homeowner sign a certificate of completion. So they put all of their money up front in materials and labor and we won't pay them until that project is done. And so for that reason, we hold them you know, to training and, and compliance and they have to submit a lot of paperwork to us and it's, it's you know, quite a process. So uh, it is you know, some of the, the more well-known and reputable contractors that will partner with us on that. Um, but many contractors will and we'll do this, and, and if you all have codes or you know ordinances that require them to um, register, you know, to get a permit to solicit door to door, we fully support you enforcing that. And if we're made aware of circumstances where contractors associated with PACE may not have followed that to the letter of the law, we will investigate and take proper action internally. Uh, the next one was the lack of knowledge of finance options and the more favorable rates and complicated terms. And I think, you know, Ms. Scannon had said this and, and your staff as well. I think what's important to note is all PACE customers have to be homeowners. You can't, you can't use this, this program if you're a renter. You have to own your home. If you've bought a home, that is a very complex transaction. As a, as a realtor in your community, I will tell you that is, it is, it is, is I'm sorry, I'm not even moving. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I'm just talking, talking. <laughs> All right, we're still, we're only on this slide, I think. <laughs> we're only on slide three. Uh, okay, so lack of knowledge, other financing options. So uh, the, the customers that, that use PACE have to own their home. They have to most likely had at least one mortgage uh, over time. Uh, and, you know, that is a very complex and expensive transaction and probably the biggest investment that they'll make. Uh, the average PACE assessment is about $20,000. I apologize, this text is a little small on the big screen. It looks okay on the laptop. Uh, but so the, the average PACE assessment is $20,000. The average mortgage is about $200,000. That is a lot different. These are home improvement financings that are being compared to mortgages. Okay, so I just want to keep that in perspective. And homeowners, you know, have typically had banking relationships, you know, with whether they took out, you know, home equity loans before or refinanced their home. So they have, they have undertaken complex financial documentation and decisions uh, prior to, to doing PACE. Uh, and they're likely to have, you know, read through, you know, credit cards, car loans, and then had those same kind of questions as they would for a, a home improvement financing. Uh, we provide transparent disclosures. Uh, in one of our pages, it says that under the rights and responsibilities, that you should look into other financing options. We don't claim to be your only finance option. We claim to be a good one. 
okay? Uh, and then we conduct a call with the property owner. After they complete their disclosures with us, we do about a 15-minute comprehensive call with a live person that we record, and we ask you, you know, uh, Mr. Mr. Weinroth, did you, did you have a chance to look at your documents? Did you receive your disclosures? And if you say, I don't know where it is, I don't have a copy of it, we will make sure you get a copy before we will authorize you to proceed on that contract, on, on that project. So there was a lot of controls in place so that if a homeowner didn't quite understand or maybe forgot where they put something, uh, can't find it in their email if they signed up digitally, we will work with them to make sure they have the opportunity to review it before they can proceed. And I would also, um, I think it's important to know that we do this in English, Spanish, and Creole, and we will send the documents to them in all three languages. If they have other language services that they would request, we will get a translator for them. What's the significance when you say that PACE customers are far less likely than homeowners overall to be in foreclosure okay. or foreclosed upon. Sure, so I, I'm, I, can I wait till I get to the foreclosure? Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, so when a property owner signs up with us, they have the option to select if they want it digitally or in print. If they choose they want it digitally, we will still mail them a printed copy so that they have that for their records. But initially, they, they, they decide what they want to do and what language they want it in. Uh, and then after the project closes, we'll send them another entire set of documents. So there'll be multiple opportunities to receive printed copies. Um, and then to your question, uh, Mayor uh, Kerner, about uh, the PACE customers are far less likely. So they have to have a minimum, uh, they have to have been current on their property taxes for three years. They cannot be in, in bankruptcy. Uh, they have to have at least 10% equity in their home. There's a number of qualifying standards, right? Just They're on good the- debtors. I'm sorry? They're good debtors. They have good credit score. They're not in foreclosure. So when you say this provides access to um, other people that wouldn't be able to access a home equity line of credit, th then... That, I never claimed that. that. That was one of the selling points, at least when it was brought to the Board of County it's, Commissioners. I think it's an option for property owners. Uh, I, I think there's lots of good reasons why I, I would consider it. I have decent credit score, but you know, when I bought my home in, in Jupiter, I had put all, all my cash down on my closing cost. My AC broke that weekend in August, and I thought, what am I supposed to do at this point? You know, I'm gonna put it on a credit card and pay an exorbitant amount of interest. And I asked my contractor, do you offer PACE? No, he offered six other types of financing, but not PACE. And for me, it was the cash up front. I don't wanna give $5,000 to a contractor when he could walk away. To know that the contractor wouldn't get paid until he finished that job and I signed off, I, that gave me an extra, sense of security, that my money was, was not being doled out until I was ready uh, to say that that project had actually been installed and was working properly. So to me, that's a personal decision of why I think it's a better option. And in terms of the financial aspects, I'll have some slides later, but to be able to pay it um, you know, in, in smaller increments, right? So instead of paying $5,000 in one year, which is one of the credit options I was offered, was if you could pay it off in one year, no interest. I thought, that's attractive. But if you waited till after day 365, my interest went up to 30%. That's pretty scary. So for me, PACE was a better option. You can decide, I can pay, you know, I can pay $1,000 a year for five years, or you could extend it to 10, and maybe I pay $500 a year. How did you end up resolving your air conditioning situation? <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry to get into the personal example, but I think it's important to know that this is why people choose it, right? And I, I did, I chose, I chose to, to to, at the time, since we didn't have PACE in Palm Beach County at the moment, I, I did pay it on credit card, and I had to pay it off very quickly. So, you know, middle class uh, American, that's what I chose. Okay, uh, and so back to the, the potential for foreclosure. So this was the last uh, concern that I know Ms. Gannon had mentioned. Uh, and, and so the average PACE customer is, you know, a 15-year-old, uh, I'm sorry, 52-year-old property owner whose median home value is three, oh, next slide, thank you. <laughs> oh, did, oh, no, no, we're not there yet. This was on your slide. Uh, is a um, property owner whose median home value is 323,000 with a 700 credit score and they stay in their homes longer than the typical property owner. So, you know, they're not necessarily moving, you know, in five years. Um, but if they do move, they could pay it off. There's no prepayment penalty. So there's nothing, you know, preventing them from paying that off. Okay. Um, you know, most property owners who choose to use PACE will save money, right? Your AC may have been $300 before you replace your HVAC. 
but after that, it may drop $100 a month. And we've got some good case studies here to show you that. And that's just on ACs. You know, when you do things that are windstorm improvements, your windstorm insurance uh, drops dramatically. Uh, you know, um, Senator Bogdanoff here has got her own personal example of that. And I think that's important that when you're able to do those hurricane protection improvements, protect your property so that you can stay in your home during the next storm and receive savings on your insurance. I think that's what this program was designed to do. Okay, so this was the public purpose uh, of the program. So it was for energy efficiency, renewable energy, and hurricane protection. The University of Southern Florida and the University of, of California, or Southern California, I believe, uh, each did studies on the benefits of pay, specifically for Florida. And they said that it is, that it is succeeding, that it is a successful program. Okay, and so here's the positive impacts of PACE in Palm Beach County. Uh, and this just shows you for every hurricane mitigation project completed, the annual savings, property damage avoided, uh, you know, PACE is resulting in positive environmental, economic, and local job creation outcomes. And we believe, you know, PACE is essential public policy today. You know, we're in hurricane season, the credit markets are tightening, and so these finance options are really critical for property owners today. Okay, now here's the, the typical profile of a PACE project, PACE customer, and PACE outcome. So the median home value, as I said, 323,000. Uh, average property owner age 52, weighted average FICO score 701. That is considered very good credit score. Uh, typical PACE project, $20,000. Average residential interest rate, about 7%. Monthly equivalent, under $200. PACE to loan value, 7.8%. And I think this is a key, because Ms. Gannon had referred to if you borrow the maximum allowed, most people don't do that. Most people are borrowing about a third of what she estimated in your property taxes. So this would be the 7.8% is what property owners on average are doing, and it's about $20,000. And the typical PACE outcome, 97.7% of property owners are very satisfied with this program. Okay, and this is more background on the complaints because I know that some of the concerns the staff mentioned. And so of those complaints or inquiries that we receive, some of them are basic requests for, can I get a copy of my documents? Uh, my contractor is you know, supposed to come and install this window that cracked in the order. It's on back order. I haven't heard from him. Can you help me? Right, so they range the gamut of, of the inquiries we get from from customers so you know we broke it down what are contractor only what are contractor and pace and what are pace only and then the open ones are you know punch list items typically in, in our reports there are people that have said you know we're still waiting for the contractor to come clean all his materials out of the front yard right and so until that's done the homeowner can withhold payment they can you know keep that certificate of completion until they're ready to sign and so all of these requests are handled, I'm sorry, inquiries are requests by the PACE providers. So we've got dedicated staff that do this seven days a week in multiple languages. Okay, here's a comparison of the consumer protections for the different types of home improvement financing. And I think what's important to know is the majority of you know, the, the typical consumer protections that, you know, traditional lenders, you know, provide the, you know, credit check, all, you know, all these other things. PACE goes above and beyond. You know, we require that we do, um, uh, um, the c customer must sign off before we will authorize payment to the contractor. We require that the customer do this phone call with us where we confirm the terms of the financing before we issue that authorization to proceed. Uh, and we make sure that, you know, that they've got some equity in the property. These are all things that aren't offered in other types of financing. So I think you know, our interest rates are fixed. Um, the other you know, types of financing aren't fixed. We'll get into the price comparisons later, but you know, we've, we've got a lot of benefits for PACE, for PACE financing that isn't offered in other traditional financing. Okay, so here, here's a cost comparison. So we've summarized some of the, the different types that people typically use, home equity loan, unsecured home improvement loan, credit card, and pay assessment, all with the same amount of principal being borrowed. Interest rates are based on about a 799 credit score, and the term is the max term offered per those, those lending products. So this shows you the monthly payments, and we think you know, this is clear that you know, PACE is allowing you know, property owner to have lower payments, which makes it more affordable. 
So if you borrow $20,000 for a PACE at a 7.99 interest rate for 20 years, you'd pay approximately $167 a month. And this slide is on the communicating the repayment process to customers. I know there were some questions about this. Uh, you know, we send property owners multiple uh, reminders about that this assessment will be on their tax bill. So initially, we disclose this in our paperwork. We go over this with them in the call that we conduct with them, that this is a tax assessment. It will be on their bill. Uh, and then we will remind them after they finish their project, please contact your lender. Let them know that they need to increase uh, your escrow amount, uh, and then we'll remind them three more times before the tax bill comes out, and we send it in English and Spanish, August, September, October. Uh, what I would tell you is that by Florida law, we require to notice your lien holder, so your mortgage company, so we send a letter to Wells Fargo or whomever you have your mortgage with, so they are made aware to do, you know, that the homeowner is placing this assessment and to potentially increase the escrow amount. Okay, customer satisfaction. So this is called the NPS score. This is like a scoring method that's used in a lot of customer satisfaction, consumer service industries. And, and so why green is scored you know, fairly high. We are second to, 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 to the top right there. So USAA was the, the, the leading uh, you know, net promoter score and why green is right below them at world class. So you know, we're very proud of our score here. We work with customers uh, after they do a project to evaluate us, to evaluate their contractor, and how likely they are to recommend us. And so you know, we're, you know, this, is, this, is, this is top of the top. OK. So here's some customers in their own words. Uh, this property owner did a number of improvements. He did his roof, um, his windows, Sorry, doors. Ma'am, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I am. Commissioner Weiss, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, on the disclosure, do you are is the borrower made aware of these administrative the administrative and finance fees? Yes. And how does that appear? Uh, they get a financing disclosure and estimates. And when that when that when that's in there, it, so this is it's a percentage, right? It's not a flat fee. I would say that the example that Ms. Gannon used is not not current or I don't believe is accurate to how it's all calculated. That may have been an old example from years ago. I'm, I, I, I can't speak to her example, but I could speak to, I have one in ours. I, I used an actual property okay. that was done in Palm Beach County. If I could skip to that slide for you. Thank you. Okay, here you go. So this is market value 338,000 uh, and how it's all broken down. So when you, when you, like when you do a mortgage, and all the fees are added, all the fees are added in, that's calculated, you know, into your final closing statement and, in, and into your overall interest rate when, you know, you're paying points on the loan and stuff on, and things like that, right? So uh, we have financing disclosures and estimates that tell them what they're paying. It is very thorough. It's the first few pages. Additionally, the county has their own disclosure, which kind of summarizes what we have in our 20 pages of financing estimates and disclosures. And are those... With are, all of these fees, all of these are disclosed. So all those fees are disclosed. How? What's the total of, of the fees on that? Can you? Total I don't program have, fees a thousand eighty six dollars sixty eight cents. I mean, do you have it. The and total. And that is for bar. That is for borrowing fifty thousand dollars. So they would. It would. They would pay a thousand to borrow fifty, and then what's the. Uh, all right, and then. Um, is there, on the digital, is there any reason why they don't print them, why they just don't carry a portable printer and print out, print it out? You know, we just offer the financing. Contractors may choose to do different things. They have their own contracts with homeowners, right, that they sign up. So they may offer them in print. They may offer them digitally. I think that's, it's, you know, up to, up to them individually. I can't speak to them. Sir, I'm sorry. I, I could try to get more information from for I mean portable printers are easy there I mean I've I've had people come into my house they bring in their little printer with them they enter the information print it out give it give it to me sure I mean I think that's the customer's choice if they choose to ask for that I mean well it wouldn't seems like something reasonable that could be included too wouldn't it be so that everybody is clear on what they're doing um, and then uh, and I don't know if you can answer this question, but if you default on a home equity uh, line of credit, uh, wouldn't you be subject to foreclosure? Yes. So this is no different than pledging your property 
uh, for repayment. It's only what's past due. It's only the current year's amount. So, you know, if your assessment was $1,000 a year for PACE, in addition to your ad valorem taxes, PACE comes after your ad, ad valorem. We are non-ad valorem. We don't come in front of the local county taxes. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay. Let me go back. Okay, so these are some customers that, you know, we thought were good examples of how PACE is working. So this property owner has saved $3,700 a year on his insurance from doing windows, doors, roof replacement. Additionally, he's saving $100 a month on his electric bill from his new HVAC system. And this property owner is saving $7,000 on their property insurance and $3,000 a month on their electric bill. Now, you know, they included, you know, er almost everything, right, except for solar panels. But, you know, this is a good example of how PACE is working for property owners. Uh, and I included another slide of a number of property owners whose pictures we don't have or we're not authorized to use. But, you know, these are their statements from your constituents here about how PACE is working for them. Does that conclude your presentation? Yes. As you can see, you know, the homeowners have shared their experience. We believe PACE is working. It is protecting homeowners. It is saving them money on their property insurance and energy bills and improving their quality of life. Uh, you know, we think that's clear from the data we've presented that this program is working, and we would request that you keep the program as is. We thank you for your partnership and opportunity to present today. Very good. Before we turn to the senator, let me uh, recognize Commissioner Bernard. Hey, Kate. I have, I have several questions. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, the first question is, um, you had mentioned, I know that, you know, this is an option, but would the contractors before PACE, they weren't going door to door, were they going door to door to people's house before PACE? I, I believe so, Commissioner. I believe oh. contractors have always gone door to door. I, I know there's some cities and municipalities that have code requirements for that, and, you know, I. I would encourage you and support you all to take whatever action necessary. And if there's somebody that's, you know, working with us, we'll take appropriate action as well. Okay. Um, I had to ask uh, Ms. Gannon a question in regards to the f a foreclosure. So if there's a TDA, a tax deed sale, would you just have to pay just the amount that's owed during those three years, let's say, or so a property owner would have to get current on the oldest year. So in your example, that was 17, 17? 18, and 19. They would have to pay 2017. Okay. Then they wouldn't be in jeopardy of losing their house. They'd have about another 10 months to get current. Okay. Another question is you had mentioned um, you had the lenders send uh, letters to, to the bank. Um, like, how does that work? Just explain that to me so a little bit. So when a property owner applies... We ask for your authorization. Let's we, we, we run a credit report. We do all those things. So we will see that who's a lien on that property. And by law, we are required to send that. So we say the maximum will out uh, just to notify the bank. So you may not borrow the sixty or $50,000 in that example. You may only borrow $20,000. But we tell them this is a maximum allowed. And then we'll send them an amended one once you finish the project and we know how much the actual cost was. So some of the local community banks and credit unions, they do take the initiative to try to work with a homeowner to increase it immediately. Some of the larger banks uh, aren't as proactive. And so if they're not proactive, does that kind, can that potentially put that borrower in a difficult situation? Not necessarily, not necessarily. So we tell the property owner multiple times they need to increase their escrow. Uh, when you receive your property taxes in, in the fall, your bank will pay them for you at that time. The bank will then say there's an escrow adjustment. They will ask you to pay an additional $167 a month uh, to get current. And, and then that's typically how that works. Sometimes they'll ask for more up front because they'll need to pay for what was from last year. Um, but they'll give you time to catch up. Your lenders aren't going to foreclose on you right away if you don't have that amount of money. Now, they'll work with you as long as you're willing to work with them. Okay. And one last question. Uh, from If someone is selling a property that's got a PACE loan, uh, what's the, um, do they have to pay that full assessment or do they have to, I just, I'm, I'm not sure how does that work. No, very good question, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, Florida realtors have a disclosure that it needs to be disclosed to prospective buyers. Uh, that is between the buyer and the seller and how they want to work that out. 
Uh, if the buyer does not want to take on the PACE assessment, the seller can pay that assessment off at the closing uh, uh, or, or prior, and there's no prepayment penalty for paying it off. Okay, and that's disclosed to the buyer at the time that they're... Correct, it, okay. yes. It would be in, when you put in your offer, you'd get the disclosure back from the seller. Uh, I think the other thing to note is that it's on title. Because it is a, a lien in nature, it would show up in a title report also. Okay. And it's, it's in the clerk of courts. I mean, you could okay. look it up today. Yeah. So, so the obligation runs with the land. So a potential buyer um, takes on that obligation, Potentially, obviously. potentially. You know, just like in any other real estate transaction, it's everything's negotiable. Well, not, not potentially. Unless that obligation is paid off, it runs with the land and the new buyer yes. is obligated to pay that. Can that serve in any way as a barrier of alienation of that property? I'm sorry, could you? Uh, That's just a fancy word for the ability to sell your property. Could, does, could it affect um, other financers uh, or banks that want to provide a mortgage to the buyer? That's why we offered the, the payoff with no prepayment penalty. In, in, the, in the context In the where event that, that somebody did not want to take on that assessment. I understand, but the question is when it's not paid off and it runs with the land, can that affect the ability of the buyer to obtain financing? No, the buyers have multiple choices. There's a number of lenders that will because that, that take was that one of on. the points that the, the study that you brought up from USF that criticized the program because it can act as a barrier to being able to sell your property. There is a number of different lenders that they can choose from, and so some of them may not want to take that on, but there is lenders who will. Some of them do. They'll need to shop around. I, I think being candid about that's an important point, much like the comparison that you put forward to us today lists a 7.99 APR on a PACE loan, right? Mm -hmm. And then listed a 7.0 APR for a HELOC, whereas the average rate in Florida right now is 4.32. Give me one second, Mayor, I'm sorry. I just wanna make sure I respond accurately. I, I don't know that any responses. Then the rate, is it fair to say the rate then? into the principal so the so th let's just do the rate the rate the average rate is 4.32 for a, a line of credit right now in Florida and if you click back on your presentation you okay. listed 7.0 oh to the right okay 7.7 uh, Okay, so we cited these. We, we use these from bankrate.com, loan calculator, home equity loan assumes, assumes a 699 FICO score. And I'm saying you should use what the market average is before you present this to the public. Sure, so we were trying to give you an accurate representation with all, with all things equal, what it would be. If everybody borrowed $20,000 for the maximum allowed, what would the interest rate be? With great credit, by the way. So I'm just saying you should probably use what a market rate is available on the home equity line of credit market. My last question is on door-to-door -door sales, uh, you've indicated that they probably did exist prior to the invention of PACE financing. Did any other options for financing include the ability to foreclose on a home in a door-to-door -door sale? Absolutely. Like what? Second mortgages, home equity lines of credit. So are, are banks now going around selling door-to-door -door HELOCs? I don't know how they market their, their financial products. Do you I mean, think they are? I mean, they market quite they market quite a bit. I don't know how they do it. Uh, I mean. Very good. Okay. Any other questions? Senator? Thank you, Mayor, and thank you all very much for your time. I just want to clarify a couple of points because I think you brought up a couple of um, very good points. In terms of the a barrier to sale for the house, when they do the wind mitigation, it usually increases the value of the home. If it's in perhaps maybe a new air conditioning unit or they put on shutters, it increases the value of the home. And like any particular lien that you might have, you might have to pay it off, but it doesn't exceed the value of the home. Therefore, it would be easy to pay it off and move on. So it wouldn't necessarily be a barrier. It would just be an additional amount you might want to pay off before you sell your home. Um, in terms of the door-to-door -door sales, I can just tell you as someone who was 16 years in the insurance business and someone who served in the legislature, assignment of benefits has been a huge issue and after hurricanes we have had significant problems with contractors knocking on doors, taking people's money and never doing the work. Michael, it was horrific. We just brought on 
a young man who worked in the Office of Insurance Regulation, and that was one of the biggest things they were dealing with, is the contractor saying, give us a deposit, secure your line so we can repair your roof, taking $5,000 and then disappearing. So it was, it, was, it was a huge problem. It continues to be a problem. Assignment of benefits is a huge dogfight up in Tallahassee almost every year. Senator, what's the relevance <laughs> of, of a assignment of benefits in a first party insurance contract versus a PACE loan? I mean, you're beaten up, and I, I agree there's probably some consumer protections that need to be put in place with assignment of benefits, but how does that prop up the veracity of, of the PACE program? Because what happens a lot of times is people are signing, their contractors are going. What I'm trying to explain to you is that if there are predatory practices, they're happening at the contractor level. We have Great. a zero tolerance for predatory practices, and we will cancel a contractor if that happens. So what happens is they go to the door, they either take the cash and run with the money, not all of them, keep me wrong, there are a lot of reputable contractors out there, but this is part of the door-to-door -door sales concern, or what they're doing is getting them to sign an assignment of benefits. The insurance companies are being forced to pay the contractors directly and the work is not being completed. The advantage you have with a PACE loan is that particular homeowner is not signing off until they say the work was done and it was done to my satisfaction. So if they had a PACE loan instead of an assignment of benefits on insurance claim or they didn't pay cash, they'd be in a much better position. Maybe the remedy is to ban door-to-door -door sales both in the AOB and the PACE context. You know, um, that's a possibility, and that is a policy decision for Tallahassee or for local ordinance. A lot of local communities do have prohibitions on solicitation of contractors. I don't know if Palm Beach County does, but if you don't, it's certainly something you may want to consider. I don't know. That, that would be up to you as policymakers. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt. Vice Mayor Weinroth, you recognize, sir. <clears throat> Senator, I'm interested to understand this, this relationship. Do you, are you saying that someone who's going to get a PACE loan would not be required to put down a deposit uh, prior to the PACE loan stepping in? Correct. So that there would be no cash exchanged from a, 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 a homeowner who's going to have a new roof or going to have storm windows, and the only way they're going to get paid is through PACE? Correct. And the reason a lot of the contractors will utilize PACE is because they know they're going to be guaranteed payment. Um, you know, we have issues on both sides of the fence. Somebody decides, well, I don't like the work that you did, therefore I'm not going to give you the remaining 30 percent. So it, it's, you know, it's a kind of a double-edged sword. It goes back and forth, but at the end of the day, they know that if they do a good job and they're a quality contractor, they're going to get paid 100 percent of their money, and nobody's going to be able to withhold anything if they complete the job. The contractor is prohibited from taking a down payment? Correct. Thank you. Why would there be a down payment when the, the whole value of PACE from your perspective is 100% financing? What, what, what he was asking a specific question that I gave him an answer to. I think he was asking whether or not there was a down payment. We are financing 100%. That's why we pay 100% at the back end. It seems like the utility of PACE, if there is a utility, and I think that there is, is that you can access credit without having to have any cash on hand. That's the only distinction I see between a line of credit and PACE is that if you don't have any cash, you can still access 100% of the financing. Correct. And there will be a lot of stories, and one legislator in particular who said he needed to uh, have windows, hurricane windows placed in his home. He didn't have any cash. He certainly could pay the monthly, did not have any cash, and he was able to take out a pay, pay loan and do it successfully. See value in that. And I will tell you a personal experience. Um, I, I just closed on a townhouse, and I got a $3,800 quote on my windstorm insurance, and I did a wind mitigation report, which are many of the things that we finance on the PACE loans, and my premium went from $3,800 down to $800. So it is a significant savings in insurance, and quite frankly, being in the insurance industry, you know, it's, you know, the shoemaker who never has shoes, I don't like paying insurance premiums either. Um, and at the, to save $3,000 because of wind mitigation, it's well worth it if people can go ahead and do that, and they might not be able to get financing any other way, or they just simply choose PACE because it's their preferred method of, of financing. Um, and the, I guess the last thing I wanted to uh, mention is that, um, just to kind of remind you all, that we do have a 97% satisfaction rate. And I know that the staff had put forward several suggestions of what you could do, and we personally like the as-is suggestion. Um, so um, if, if there are issues or concerns in the future, I mean, we can always come back and do another workshop, but, but with a 97 percent, you know, satisfaction rate, you know, no system is perfect, but we're pretty darn close. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Mr. Schiller, do you have any comments? Yeah, I just want to say, Thanks. Yeah, oh, sorry, Commissioner Weiss. I got to put my oh. computer down. Hold on one second, yeah. Commissioner Weiss. Thank you. Um, just one other question. Do you, um, 
Do, do the contractors, do they receive a fee for underwriting a PACE loan back from you? No. Okay, because I, I, I know uh, with home improvement, um, some of the home improvement companies, they do receive money back from the lenders uh, for, for you using their services. And we go through a pretty rigorous process in okay. terms of bringing on contractors. And quite frankly, we're, we're pretty aggressive. If there are any consumer complaints, we immediately investigate. And we will not hesitate to terminate a contractor. And we've done it more than once. All right. I think that concludes um, the industry's presentation. We'll move now to public comment. I think there was just one representative, Joe Gibbons, mm -hmm. my former colleague from the Florida House of Representatives back row bench. <laughs> Senator doesn't know about that. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor, <laughs> Vice Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, you know, the PACE program is an interesting program, and, and the goals are laudable, but there are a lot of problems with the program. The, program's been, the, the problems have been around for a long time. In fact, uh, Senator Rubio and Senator Cotton from Arkansas, uh, they really tried to put forth some federal legislation to kind of rein this thing in. In fact, uh, Senator Cotton put out a statement that said that called the, called the residential PACE program uh, loans a scam that targets low-income elderly Americans with predatory home loans. Now, if Senator Cotton says that, you need to really take a look at it. Um, the program, the, the goals are laudable. The program was initially done to help people basically with uh, solar panels in California. That's why it started, because the, the amount outstanding, solar panels were expensive back then. And the amount outstanding, so you had a 30% investment tax credit, which reduced the price of the, of the solar panels. And you had other programs and incentives to reduce the price of solar panels so that the amount, the dollar amount would be small and, it, and the, the entry of financing with PACE would, would make it very attractive. This thing has morphed into something totally different. In fact, in this past year's legislation, they tried to pass a bill where they wanted to include septic tanks in one of the products that you could put in it. So what I'm, saying, what I'm saying is that the fact that the no money down, it makes it attractive maybe for someone who can get over their head very easily because they don't have to put any money out of their pockets. And when you have somebody coming and knocking on your door uh, and, and, and you have a, a, a home that, that needs some improvement, you can't afford it, this becomes attractive because you, you don't have to pull any money out of your pocket. I heard some uh, comments about uh, sophistication of homeowners. Well, you know, I, I would like to disagree with some of those com comments because some homeowners inherit their homes that have been in their families for years that need some repair. Somebody comes and knocks on their door and, 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 and offers them the opportunity to, to bring that home up to a code or to, to improve it. Uh, it's very attractive for them to get in easily over their homes, over their heads. So, Megan, you did a good job of, of, of mentioning some of the problems that have been there. And I say that this commission really needs to take a hard look at those, the protections because, and again, the fees. I mean, typical fees are an application fee, a processing and underwriting fee, which I didn't hear, uh, record and disbursement fees, closing fees, prepayment waiver fees, uh, and most of them, but not less, least of all, is a lien against your property. You, can't, you cannot sell that property with a lien outstanding. I, don't, I, don't, I mean, you know, I bought a home here in uh, Wellington, and they had, there was a lien on the property for solar panels, of all things. Uh, and I, you know, that lien had to be cleared up because I got the house from the bank. The lien had to be cleared before I could buy it out. I mean, it's plain and simple. And I heard that dance around, but that's a fact. That is a fact. And the bankers in Florida really hate this program because they are now put in third place. Pace comes first, then comes the county, then comes the original mortgage holder. And they tried to pass legislation this past year to try to say, hey, wait a minute, first in is first paid. In other words, they, they had the mortgage first, they want to be paid first, they shouldn't be paid third. They're the, they're the last in line. So the, you know, these are concerns that I think you really need to take a look at. And again, my big concern is that homes that have been in certain communities for families for a long time, where people are not that sophisticated on these financial instruments, they can easily get themselves in over their heads on promises made by somebody knocking on your door. So I think you really need to take a hard look at this because again, um, we really want to protect our consumers. Everybody's not as sophisticated as, as some of us are on financial instruments. And, and you know, all that glitters ain't gold. If it sounds too good to be true, it is. And I say we need to drill down into this to make sure, because I was in the legislature when this whole thing came up in 2010. And it, it was confusing then, 
And it's confusing now to, to, to the average citizen. They don't know what we're doing, Tallahassee. They don't understand this stuff. And so I think that, first of all, let me commend you on the questions you've been asking, because you're really hitting the, the ball right on the head. Uh, Mayor and, 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 and uh, Christian Bernard, you guys have really been asking the really good questions. And I'd like to uh, uh, comment on, on uh, property praise again, and she's really telling it like it is. So, uh, you know, hey, the, the program has laudable goals, and, and I admire them, but we have to be careful about people getting hurt unintentionally. They may, they, and I'm not calling anybody greedy or anything like that, or I'm not care, you know, this is America, you're allowed to make profit, but you wanna make profit on people who understand what they're, what they're getting themselves into, and we don't want anybody being taken advantage of. Thank you. Well said, Representative. Commissioner Bernard, you recognize. Ms. Scannon. You know, there's, we're looking at, I'm looking at page 18 and 19, and I know when you, when you spoke, you said, you know, some of the things that we can do is, you know, it, it's more like Tallahassee. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So, like, some of the opportunities, one of the things that I thought, that I saw that, you know, that it says potential ordinance amendments to increase consumer protection. Um, do you see if there's anything that we can do to increase consumer protection, or should we just keep it as is? Well, I'd be interested in knowing what their protections they're proposing are. Okay. Because that's kind of a blanket statement. It doesn't really tell me what the proposals are. Okay. And then the other opportunity says implement PACE administration fee to fund administration. Can you explain that to us if you can? The only, I guess the reason why I'm asking this question is, you know, if we, inc if there's a fee, that means that it's gonna be passed down to the consumer. So that means that, you know, we're gonna eventually be hurting our taxpayers. So can you explain that to me so in that way we can, you know, explain that and, please. And in that spirit, not just will be passed down to the consumer, but it'll be capitalized into the loan. Mm -hmm. And then that $150 fee will end up being thousand dollars over the course of 20 years absolutely and understand that and that would not be the concept of an amount anywhere near that we're just looking at a fee uh, with regard to the cost that we put into it and the balance of the taxpayers in the county paying for the three or four thousand uh, pace loans that we have out there that we're responsible for monitoring the ordinance administering it regulating it caitlin's time it grows every day megan engages more i'm engaging more so you know gathering that time plus these aren't going away. We're still tracking them. And then every year with more and more, it builds. It was not uh, the basic concept is a fee that is not significant, very, very large, but a measure of cost recovery towards the time we put into it. And then board direction, it says work with interested parties on modifications of PACE ordinance. Uh, can you explain that to us or no? If that was the board direction to engage with industry, we've developed some ideas ourselves as we began this journey about a year ago in September uh, when we received the initial direction. And the first bill that was filed was a significant overhaul of PACE in general. It probably had some points in there that we would move forward if we had that direction. But I think it would be beneficial if we get the direction to sit down with industry and go over points and thoughts that we have that might be able to strengthen the ordinance, other thoughts that industry might have that they would be able to come to the table with as well. Uh, if the board wanted, we could come back and bring that information or we could almost proceed to go and, and uh, you know, prepare amendments to the ordinance over a period of time. But I think it'd be better to work you know, collaboratively with industry. Certainly we reach a point where we had ideas and they didn't agree, we would, certainly be more than willing to tell the board we are, why we feel strongly about certain points. Commissioner Weiss. Going back to the administrative fee, uh, and I guess, you know, I, I have mixed feelings about it. One is if we're gonna, if we're getting involved in, if they were getting a bank loan, we, we wouldn't be involved in it and it would, and so there'd be no cost to the county. In this case, it, it, we're being brought into it, and so is it fair for the other taxpayers to pay the cost of this? Uh, but I do, I do get concerned when it just gets added on to the cost alone, and they're gonna be financing it over you know, 20 years and paying interest on that, so that, 
but on the other hand, if they don't have if they don't have money um, to you know pay it, it's on the it precludes them from being able to access financing to get the work done on their homes. It, a couple different points, Commissioner. One, there are on the loans itself, and, and again, I hate to overgeneralize on an amount because we haven't done the math. We're just looking to a point where we can roughly estimate the amount of staff time we put into it and, and, and receive it back. Uh, we've got 3,500, 3,000, something like that, Caitlin, of them out there. Uh, you know, we're probably estimating five, ten dollars per year. Somewhere, it would be really broad, but in that neighborhood. We also put a lot of time into when you see, you know, the board is, uh, questioned at times when we received the, the uh, receive and file items and we brought them back on the indemnification. And there's a lot of staff time that's put into processing those as well. So I think just identifying where our costs are and working with industry and having those discussions and helping them understand where we put a significant amount of time from our end into preparing these items and bringing it back. And one, yeah. may I add on to that one real quick? So the, the fee, there are two options that we were blanketing in that fee. One is by project, so the the homeowner or property owner project fee, but then the indemnification or interlocal agreements when a provider or a third party administrator is coming into Palm Beach County. We, there's a lot of, um, there's coordination that Patrick was mentioning there. So it would be a separate, that's one option mm -hmm. where, the, where the fee could um, come from for the right to do business in Palm Beach County. That wouldn't be a homeowner specific fee. That's probably an interesting option. Mm -hmm. uh, Madam uh, Tax Collector, did you have any closing comments? No, I'm, I actually wanted to make a comment to um, my colleague, um, Mr. Schiller, um, when he spoke about not knowing if the issues, the tax certificates and the TDAs were all PACE loans. They are all PACE loans. They would not be here. Um, so, and the other issue I would suggest that the board go look at a court case called the Florida Bankers versus the State of Florida. Um, what, there what was, what, do you have a citation or? Um, no, but I can get it for you. What was the name of it? Florida Bankers versus the State of Florida to try and straighten out the whole discussion is about whether this is a first lien. The legislature said it was a, um, uh, that they tried to get around um, the, the financing part by saying it was um, a special assessment, which it's not, it's a loan. And so this court case actually talk, that talks about it, um, and it is a loan, which, um, and it is a first lien, um, and the bankers will tell you that also. All right. So, you know, my main concern is that my colleague, Commissioner Bernard's concerns are rectified. And so, you know, we've had some fine companies and fine representatives of those companies here today, and they've made representations both here publicly and to me privately uh, as they've worked behind the scenes, which is certainly um, proper and lawful. I I'd be excited to see what industry does to self-police itself in working with our, our administration and staff to put some consumer protections forward and see what this dialogue brings back. I think we have a much more hospitable forum here than the legislature and each community has its own unique issues. I find value in accessing capital without having to have cash on hand. Uh, but there are some red flags that I think concern everybody on this board. And so I'd like to see what industry and administration bring back. Is that fair direction? Yeah. Understood. Um, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, uh, again, Neil Schiller uh, with Renew Financial. I'll take the liberty to speak for the industry. Our goal is to make this uh, program successful. Um, we're more than willing to work with your staff. We've always been willing to work with your staff to make this project better and program better. Um, we will continue to work with your staff, uh, whomever may be there, uh, with a lucky maternity leave. But um, uh, we, we'd like to, uh, and I recognize this, recognize that your tax collector said that a lot of these problems really do stem from the legislature, which is not something that we can fix. But we will definitely put on our thinking caps and uh, use some sweat equity to try to bring something back to you. I will have a, a 100 uh, percent open and honest communication with your staff, as we already have, and uh, we'll work, look forward to working with them. 
I have no doubts that you will until we're fully preempted by the legislature. Let's see if we can't do some good public service. <laughs> All right, with that, I think that concludes the workshop on agenda item 4B. We'll move now into agenda item 4C. Uh, we've allotted 30 minutes for C and D, and I hope we can get through these issues quickly. One of them pertains directly to the West County, and so, you know, without our resident commissioner here, I would continue, continue dialogue with her on 4D. But let's see what the South County Administrative Complex Master Plan looks like. Thank you to staff and members of the industry for your time today. I hate to say this, but I can't hear you with your mask. <laughs> Does that mean you I, I don't. I defer to the South yeah. County commissioners on that. We don't need a PowerPoint. We value efficiency in, towards the end of the day. In the beginning of the day, we value robust discussion. I think we vetoed the PowerPoint. now there we go again good afternoon mayor vice mayor and commissioners uh, Eric McClellan director of FDNO strategic planning uh, I'll be presenting the uh, encore of this workshop today uh, over the next 10 minutes or so and joining me at the table is also uh, FDNO director Audrey Wolf uh, the purpose of this workshop again is fourfold one to provide an overview of the county's South County administrative complex in the city of Delray Beach two to present an updated conceptual master plan for the property Three, address the future site development related to that master plan. And four, to confirm use of infra infrastructure surtax or IST proceeds uh, allocated towards renewal and replacement projects at the complex. Uh, next slide. Uh, that is the West County. Uh, as you'll recall, the complex is located on the east side of Congress Avenue, approximately 1,000 feet south of West Atlantic Avenue. Uh, the co complex has frontage on uh, Congress Avenue uh, and also abuts the FDOT-owned rail corridor adjacent to I-95, and there are privately owned properties uh, abutting to the north, northeast, and south, as well as on the opposite side of Congress Avenue. Next slide. Uh, the complex is entirely county-owned, and that reflects the historic assemblage of adjacent properties since the, since the 1960s. Today, the site is just over 28 acres and is improved with over 112,500 square feet of buildings, more than 800 parking spaces, and various ancillary structures and facilities. The complex not only supports the direct delivery of services, but also uh, functions and infrastructure that realize our level of service to the public, although these uses are typically forgotten or taken for granted. Next slide. This slide uh, presents the inventory of existing buildings and uses on the property, and in the interest of time, I'm not gonna repeat those, uh, but did wanna mention that we did have outreach to constitutional officers as well as some private entities in preparation uh, for this workshop item. Uh, next slide. Uh, looking at some of the past planning efforts, uh, in 2006, the county and the city uh, jointly commissioned a redevelopment study of the property. 
The objective of that study was to develop a design and funding strategy for the phased redevelopment of the government buildings and supportive parking while sustaining county service delivery and operations throughout the course of redevelopment. The construction cost for replacement facilities was then estimated at approximately $50 million, and up to eight to 10 acres of land was concluded to be made available for sale with a projected return of eight and a half to $16 million, which left a funding gap in excess of $32 million under the best of circumstances. From a tax revenue standpoint, the tax roll benefit was calculated at close to $300,000 annually for the city and roughly half that for the county. The city and county also partnered in devising land development regulations for site development and along the corridor. The conclusion was, and to this day does still remain, a commercial mixed use, future land use, and a mixed residential, office, and commercial, or MROC, zoning designation. Permissible building height could reach 85 feet under those regulations, though in reality, a lesser height would be necessary on this particular property so as not to interfere with the communication paths associated with the county's uh, tower on this site. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, despite that planning effort, the recession, as we know, did take hold. The county had to reduce expenses by deferring capital and R&R &R projects, and our private partners were unable to secure financing. During that same time, the state uh, reassigned almost all responsibility for licensing uh, from the DMV to the local tax collectors. And in response, we relocated the property appraiser offsite to serve uh, the additional demands of the uh, expanded operations of the tax collector. We provided additional parking on site, and we also delivered the driver's course. The land resources required for the tax collector's office were not accounted for uh, or contemplated at the time of the past planning study. Next slide. Um, as the recession ended, the city assembled a Congress Avenue task force to re-envision, uh, to reestablish a vision for the corridor, and FDNO was actively involved throughout that process. Some of the key objectives, uh, next slide. Some of the key objectives resulting uh, from that uh, effort are shown on this slide, and they have uh, greatly influenced our proposed site master plan. The focus of the workshop being the future, I would now like to identify some of the opportunities and constraints for redevelopment of this property. Next slide. Okay. Uh, for one, uh, we obviously have a very good track record in our business dealings with the city of Delray Beach. We often cite the South County Courthouse and Parking Garage on Atlantic Avenue, which were critical components in re revitalization of Atlantic Avenue west of Swinton. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we were also invited and actively participated on the city's task force. So we're confident that the city will support a plan uh, that assists in accomplishing the corridor objectives, but that also remains favorable for public service delivery while we're in control of our own destiny as far as declaring county real property a surplus. There is no rush to dispose where land is scarce, yet key to our mission and service delivery well into the future. Our neighbor to the northeast uh, has long been an industrial property supporting warehouse uses. Uh, the city has approved an eight-story residential project on that particular property, which does demonstrate the investment potential in this area, and it also supports staff's recommendation that the immediately adjacent county property um, come to support a residential use in the future, after that particular property has supported construction staging and other temporary needs for our own redevelopment and to provide a buffer against construction activity from that approaching residential project. Uh, once again, the tax collector's needs have grown on account of assuming additional duties and functions. So accommodating uh, the expansion of countywide services in this very desirable location is also a key consideration and is supported by the tax collector's office. Unknown in 2006, the building division is seeing a high volume of service demands in strong economic times, and this is due to population increases as well as existing building improvements countywide now aging. A satellite service center in South County, either at this complex or at a nearby six-acre civic site, is of interest to relieve demands upon Vista Center operations and for the convenience of those located in the southern area of the county. And although the existing administration building is no doubt dated, the building exterior remains structurally sound and is um, favorably situated upon the property as well. So reuse of the building exterior with a complete renovation of the interior would yield a savings of roughly $100 per square foot uh, as compared to new construction. And it would also help us in remaining operational throughout redevelopment. So that too is incorporated into our proposed and recommended plan. Next slide. 
Uh, but those opportunities are also met with some challenges, of course. Uh, for one, construction phasing, as opposed to a complete site redevelopment all at once, is going to be essential to the continuous operations and services, as well as financial planning. So time and patience will be needed to realize completion of any master plan scenario. And with such a prime piece of real estate, there will inevitably be pressure to either accelerate work or sell property for private development. But county needs and facilities into the future must be kept at the top priority to avoid unintended consequences of either a deficient land area, higher development cost, or reduced programming. And since the previous workshop in October of last year, our office has again shared workshop materials and held conversations with private parties uh, that are interested in land acquisition. And upon review of the financial and operational logic behind the phased approach to redevelopment, the nature of certain operations on the site, and the projection of facility needs into the future, those conversations concluded with a mutual understanding of staff's long-term planning recommendation and the potential surplus property opportunities that could result. Some existing improvements on site uh, still remain in an optimal location from the standpoint of service delivery, operational reasons, replacement cost, or other practical uh, purposes. Some examples include the communication tower, the fueling facilities and intermodal center at the rear of the complex, portions of the existing administrative building, the health clinic, the park maintenance compound, and the tax collector. Operations require um, ve vehicular mobility, uh, rather maneuverability, uh, in the case of buses and fuel vehicles, overhead height with the park's maintenance facility, and other reasons that, uh, for not consolidating into a multi-tenant building or parking structure. A constraint that might not be so obvious is stormwater management. Uh, redevelopment under current regulations will require an estimated 10 to 20 percent of the site surface area to collect and drain stormwater. This has been accounted for in our proposed master plan, and it also relates directly to the phasing sequence that we're recommending. Beyond all things unknown uh, is also those that are unknown at the present date. So some thought needs to be given uh, and some flexibility preserved in any planning product to account for future uncertainty. Next slide, please. Um, yep. Um, this slide shows uh, the supply of land in the area, uh, which is also key. Uh, you might recall this graphic from the last workshop, which shows that from Lantana Road to the north, the county line to the south, the ocean to the east, and Florida's turnpike to the west, this complex is the only county-owned real property with any potential for development or redevelopment. We've excluded parklands and natural areas or other county ownership with restrictions against government use for obvious reasons. The county will be taking title to a 6.28 acre civic site within the Atlantic Commons or Tuscany development at the northeast corner of Atlantic uh, Avenue and Florida's Turnpike, and that site is identified on this graphic in yellow. That will provide potential for relocating and expanding some of the uses that otherwise might not be best suited for this particular complex. So this land supply constraint is certainly a key uh, for consideration in any master planning of the complex. Next slide. Uh, these, uh, this slide presents operations and uses that we do know or that we can reasonably forecast to be needed uh, into the future. Of course, we have the existing uh, health clinic to remain. They've already taken some space inside the administration building, so we're expecting their future need to reach 40,000 square feet. The tax collector has confirmed need for about 24,000 square feet, and that's based upon recently constructed facilities and one already in the permitting process. Our planning, zoning, and building department, as I indicated, has indicated interest in up to 10,000 square feet, as could the property appraiser if relocated from their current uh, location, uh, sharing a facility with PBSO. Uh, we have other facilities that aggregate to 16,000 square feet, uh, and we also have need for um, fuel uh, management division uh, and facility needs that aggregate to about 18,000 square feet. Next slide. Um, as I indicated, Parks Maintenance and PBSO Motor Pool, they're both going to need new buildings, uh, similar to the scale of what already exists today. The Intermodal Center is expected to remain a key transit hub serving the region, uh, and then the existing communication tower would remain as well. The RTA has long planned for additional transit-oriented uses uh, to the complex, as well as other improvements which improve access to transit. And while naturally they would like to see that happen sooner, they do support the updated master plan and it being a handy tool to evaluate currently unforecasted opportunities. Next slide. Uh, so with all of that taking into account, this is the updated conceptual master plan. Uh, remind you here that uh, north is oriented to the left so that you have Congress Avenue on the bottom of the graphic and the rail corridor and I-95 to the east being located at the top of the graphic. 
Starting at the north end or left uh, is the existing health center to remain. We would add additional parking to support their demands. Uh, and we would also reconfigure the vehicular access aisle uh, connecting to Atlantic Avenue for improved functionality and safety to tie into the future site development and to include a secondary connection for the new residential neighbor to our northeast that I previously mentioned. Moving to the heart of the property is where you see the first phase of the actual redevelopment taking place. And this is the building footprint depicted in green, which is approximately 44,000 square foot and would be an expansion eastward from the existing administration building footprint. Uh, that expansion towards Congress Avenue would be consistent with the city's vision for the corridor. Uh, also consistent with that vision would be an adjacent pedestrian plaza on the north side of the building for both public em and employee enjoyment, as well as possibly hosting organized community events outside of normal business hours. And once this area is complete, uh, we can then move to uh, phase two of the redevelopment, uh, which is the area that's identified in yellow. Um, and this would include demolition of the two eastern wings of the administration building. They're not shown on this drawing since we are showing only the outcome of the redevelopment and the build out, so that's important to keep in mind. Uh, that would also allow us to complete renovation of the remaining two wings that are shown in gray and also connected to phase one. And there would also be a parking structure to support those improvements, the site and the other site activities. Upon completion, we anticipate phase two can support the space and parking needs of the tax collector. So for that reason, the driver's course is also a component of phase two. Next is phase three. It's presented in orange uh, on the top right corner of the graphic. This is the intermodal center, which would be reoriented along uh, adjacent to the railroad track rather than intruding into the interior of the site. It would provide improved bus circulation and mobility as well as the major share of supportive parking. This also includes most of the parking spaces um, that are obligated to tri-rail under a historic agreement. And if tri-rail were interested in a triple P uh, in this particular phase, that would be the correct earliest time to explore opportunities without presenting any risk to the county's needs or disrupting the strategic planning sequence of delivering this particular plan. Next, we have phase four in red, and this is the demolition of the existing tax collector facility to make way for the replacement parks compound, a stormwater management feature to serve the entire complex, and also leaving approximately one and three quarters acres that's identified in blue for interim construction staging, future county needs, or future disposal as surplus property. Together with the approximately 2.3 acres uh, that I mentioned earlier for uh, potential residential use, that leaves a total of four acres for future um, private uh, disposition or surplusing uh, in the future. The existing tower, fueling improvements, and other site infrastructure would remain in the rear of the facility closest to the rail corridor. Uh, very importantly, an underlying strategy of this plan is to accommodate all redevelopment with no or very little interruption to existing operations. And this is possible only through phasing. The specific placement of improvements is shown on this plan and the retention of ownership throughout the course of redevelopment. In this manner, the sequence of redevelopment as presented is very deliberate and key. Next slide. Uh, very quickly, this is just some of the component costs associated with redevelopment. Uh, overall, you can see the total comes to uh, approximately $52 million on the subject site. And since not all of the existing and forecasted programming can be accommodated on this complex alone, the balance would logically be delivered upon the 6.28 acre civic parcel I mentioned that is coming due. Uh, you can also see some component costs of that on this slide. And that particular site development um, has a relative order magnitude of cost of about $25 million. So combine these two sites uh, come to account for all cast forecasted South County future needs. Next slide. Uh, staff is recommending that this new master plan be approved as a planning document that guides the county's actions until the redevelopment effort commences. The redevelopment sequence and the ultimate sale of any surplus property are key to this plan's physical and financial success and the county's needs uh, for this plan into the future. This plan can also be used as a resource, um, as a guide against which pop-up opportunities can be compared uh, for partial redevelopment or disposal of surplus land into the future. Uh, we must also bear in mind that in the current capital improvement plan, we do not have funding for the redevelopment or uh, the new development on the civic site. Um, and even if funding were immediately available, the design permitting and phase construction to implement those plans could re require anything from five to 10 years. 
the renewal replacement uh, has already been deferred upward of 20 years at this complex, uh, and we do not recommend that be further deferred. Rather, we recommend use of the existing $6 million in IST funds to address uh, those needs that are immediate in order to preserve health, safety, and welfare of the occupants and uh, the visitors to the complex. And the final slide. So with all that, uh, staff is hoping to conclude this workshop with BCC approval of the following. One, the updated conceptual master plan as a guiding document, vision and planning tool for budget, regional service delivery, and real estate decision making into the future. And two, confirmation that only r and projects essential to safety, health, and continuous operations be undertaken with no more than the $6 million in IST proceeds currently allocated. Uh, that concludes our presentation, and we're happy to answer your questions at this time. Not be recognized. Thank you. A um, couple of questions. This is the first I heard that there was a constraint on height based upon the communications. Is, is there some way of getting around that? Could that tower be reconfigured or made higher so that we didn't have that constraint and we would be able to go higher? I can speak to that. Uh, there's actually not. Uh, it has to do with the height of the equipment and how that height uh, equipment communicates with other communication towers. So in fact, it's aligned to send signals to other towers re uh, located remote from this. So even if a tower was placed, let's say, on top of a building, you're still going to have to position that equipment at a height to maintain the path of communication. Okay. Uh, one of the things about that site that's always intrigued me is the fact that it's so set up for workforce housing. We have the SFRTA station right there. We have so much available for housing. We have talked about it until we're blue in the face. And I hate to hear us talking about five to ten, ten years out before we're going to be able to make that site available. I know you've spoken, Audrey, about using that as a staging area on the Northeast. Is there any way that we can reorient ourselves as far as a staging area so we could open up the redevelopment of the residential a little sooner? Hello? Okay, that's better. <laughs> um, the first preference would be obviously to use it for staging because that goes to the cost of our redevelopment and also the amount of time it takes to do the redevelopment. Um, it is possible to, uh, depending on what transaction we do, to make up for those financial losses, but it would have to be very um, transaction specific because I don't think staff's in a position where we think that we should recommend disposal of property um, where there's an additional cost to the county. So if some deal were to come along where we would be made financially whole for um, the cost that we would incur, then we may be able to work out a transaction. Would we be talking about disposal or land lease? Would that be a potential? Um, either way, it's not being used for county purpose, so whether it's actually disposed of, conveyed, or leased. In the case of residential property, we would probably, I would say 99% sure, we would recommend a disposal so we're not in the chain of ownership of the land. So we would probably recommend uh, disposal conveyance and then with a reverter or deed restrictions as appropriate, but not stay in um, a land lease situation. All right, I just, I just hope that the administration will just see if there's any way that there's possible to, again, accelerate the timeline on that on the housing. I, I see it as a critical need in that corridor, and if there's any way that we can put part of that up earlier, I think it would be uh, certainly to the benefit of our stakeholders. And another option that could make it go um, faster is if we were to um, enter into some kind of an agreement with the adjacent property owner where ultimately our property would be developed as a phase two, um, that would relieve the other property owner of having all the separations, which would maximize our yield and the amount of units that we got and the cost of our units, but then they just wait till a certain point, and that way either we don't have to incur the additional cost or they don't have to pay the additional cost associated with acceleration. So depending on when that proposal actually comes forward compared to where we are with the redevelopment, there are some options, but um, we have to stick with the underlying premise that um, we can't recommend something that's going to end up increasing our costs. Understood. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Commissioner Vallis, are you recognized? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I just wanted to uh, be certain that Commissioner Abrams is getting a chance to 
weigh in on all of this. He's very interested in the development around the tri-rail station there. So um, he's, you're in contact with him. Um, yes, yeah. um, he's been always very communicative about this property and this has always been his vision. I, he sent you all um, a letter and um, I'm sure he would love to see this sooner okay. than later. Great, so. thank you. Communicative, is that a euphemism for something? <laughs> I don't know, I think I made it up, but I don't know. <laughs> He's very um, passionate, I guess. Um, That's a good one. All right, I don't want to butcher the city of Delray's representative's name, so if I could just ask you to come to the microphone and um, inform us how to pronounce your name correctly, and then we'll hear from Mr. Schiller as well, who is already filling out a comment card, and I appreciate that. Good afternoon, Anthea Gignotis, Development Services Director for the city of Delray Beach. Hello. Um, this is an exciting project for us because your complex is loaded, located on our uh, next great street, is what we call Congress Avenue, and adjacent to our only commuter rail station. So um, we're very um, excited to see reinvestment on the site happen, um, and as you move forward, uh, you know, it's been 14 years, I guess, since the master planning effort. Uh, some new faces in the room would love the opportunity to coordinate a little bit about the long-term conceptual uh, layout of the site, um, especially how it's relating to maybe adjacent private interests that are already in for us. Um, but we're um, just generally here to be supportive of the investment. It's a job center for us and all of those things, and um, just looking for the opportunity to coordinate moving forward. Thank well, you. We appreciate that collaboration. Any questions or concerns? Ms. Baker, you're recognized. I, no, I just want to make sure that uh, we are clear because we've been working, you're right, with the city. It's been a very, very long time, and I'm anxious to get that workforce housing and affordable housing built on that site. But this is the plan that we're moving forward with, so there is no other long term so we need to make sure we're on the same page mm -hmm. now as opposed to later once we start to redevelop okay that comment just no I, there's just a lot of asphalt on the on the site and it's just mm -hmm. interesting if the links to the new de development to the north and things like that can be slightly adjusted it's not that we're suggesting any wholesale shift in the plan and we are certainly excited for the prospect of workforce housing to come in along that in the long-term phase that is music to our ears so I'm glad to hear that is still the plan and we want to make it walkable so I think that we'll, we'll on we're on the same page absolutely right. and we're on that on talking. that note unfortunately the master plan is such a high level view of what's right. going on it doesn't get into the design details but so many of those design details we've worked out with the city to accomplish what you want to Great. which is the pedestrian in is the public plaza, you know, the face, all those public amenities that will make the corridor whole that maybe private sector isn't as interested in doing. Exactly. So we're just here to help move those things forward and the next 10 years unravel for this uh, site or unfold, I suppose is what I meant. Freudian slip. Anyway, unravel, thank you all so much. Unfold. I know you've had a really long day and I do appreciate that, that, that you ran through the PowerPoint anyway for us. So I appreciate that. And can I just say one more thing about Delray? Please. Um, I just want to do a big shout out for Delray because 30 years I've been doing this, and one of the very first things that I did was South County Courthouse, and without fail, there has never been a blip. The city and the county has always been on the same page when it came to county facilities, and it is unwavered, and we haven't had that relationship with any other city, so big shout out to Delray. I'm sure it's not gonna end now. No, absolutely not. We're here to help you move forward as quickly as possible. Thank you so much. We all look forward to a day where we have those types of municipal relationships with all our partners in the county. Mr. Schiller, you're recognized for three minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I'm not going to take my three minutes. Again, Neil Schiller uh, with Saul Ewing, Arnstein and Lair, 515 North Flagler Drive, um, West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, I've been, we've been watching this site. I've had a number of developers approach me about this site and uh, identify different opportunities. I recognize that the county is moving forward with their master plan and I wholly endorse that and applaud them for all the work that they've put into this site. I would like to say at some point there may be an unsolicited uh, proposal that this board may receive that maybe uh, insert some new ideas into this site. Um, and I would hope that this board uh, will, or, and the staff would be willing to look at that idea 
uh, or look at this proposed redevelopment that hits on a number of things like workforce housing and, and maintains county facilities. Uh, nothing is imminent, so uh, I would not ask you to hold anything, but I would just say that there is a lot of interest in the community about this particular site, especially with regards to housing, workforce, and affordable. And as you've seen through the market studies, as Anthea just uh, had to listen to me last week in Delray Beach, the residential component of the market is still very strong in Palm Beach County, whereas the office markets and the re retail food and beverage markets are uh, becoming very, uh, becoming weaker with vacancy rates uh, hitting highs. So with that being said, uh, I, I uh, just wanted to put this little plug in there for something that may be coming up uh, uh, later on in the year. And uh, I look forward to seeing this come to fruition. Very good. Uh, we, Neil, we always appreciate your unsolicited development ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Bernard, you recognized. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I support uh, what staff has done uh, by presenting this to us. I know that they've worked really hard on this and working with the city. Uh, just want to add, so Audrey, you said you've been working on this or with the city for 30 years, so you'll have another 20 years to do this. <laughs> um. No, working with the city on <laughs> county projects, not on this particular one. This one's only been going on for like 15. <laughs> Uh, Commissioner Berger, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Audrey, I just would like to, first of all, this is a great plan. Second of all, I'd appreciate if we can to come into my office, if we could have a meeting, because my, I have more concerns about the uh, Atlantic Avenue, Florida Turnpike interchange there. So I'd like to sit down and have a discussion about that. Thank you. Very good. Well, that concludes uh, Commissioner comments and public comments on this agenda item. We thank you for the update. Is there any direction needed uh, beyond what has been given? Very good. Well, then that will conclude agenda item 4C, and we'll go to our last agenda item 4D, the West County Governmental Center Master Plan Redevelopment. Yes, I, I, I uh, understand the, um, the oddity of having this update without the resident commissioner here. Please. <laughs> she, uh, she is in support. Staff spent a lot of time with her on this particular uh, item, and uh, the last thing she said was that she was in support of it. Very good. And we she did didn't want to hold Deus. it up. Do any of my colleagues have any particular questions on the West County Redevelopment Project? Well, then, uh, is there any public comment? No, Mr. Mayor. Well, then we find ourselves at the conclusion of the June 23rd, 2020 Board of County Commissioners meeting. I'd like to remind the public and my colleagues that the board will convene on Thursday, 0625 uh, at 9.30 a.m. for a zoning meeting. Yep, we still have to do zoning. Uh, we'll do quick uh, comments from our county administrator, our county attorney, Mr. Balachet. I know. Vice Mayor Weinroth. None. Commissioner Weiss. None. Commissioner Berger. And Commissioner Bernard. None, Mr. Mayor. I would like just to take a moment to thank the staff and my colleagues on this board for the very difficult but important conversation we had today. I'd like to commend my colleague, Commissioner Weiss, um, for his leadership on this issue and advocating it through a process of evaluating metrics and data and for the cohesive and unified vision in voting unanimously for the mandatory mask policy. With that said, we'll see you on Thursday, and the Board of County Commissioners is adjourned. Thank you.